A web developer is a skilled professional responsible for building websites and web applications. They are expert in languages like HTML, CSS and JavaScript using tools like React, Angular or Vue.js to build websites and apps to work efficiently. For example, when you click on a button to buy something online, a web developer is behind in making sure that the button does its job correctly. They collaborate with designers and clients to bring ideas to life, ensuring websites are not just functional but also visually appealing. From creating responsive layouts to implementing interactive features, web developers make sure our online experiences are smooth and secure. On that note, hello everyone and welcome to this video on the Web Developer Full Course by Edureka. Before we get started, let's outline the agenda for today's session. First, we'll introduce web development covering the basics and why it is important. Next, we'll dive into HTML, the language used to structure the web pages. Then, we'll explore CSS which styles and designs those pages and make them visually appealing. After that, we'll move on to the JavaScript, the dynamic language that adds interactivity to websites. We'll then touch jQuery, a library that simplifies JavaScript coding and DOM manipulation. Moving forward, we'll dive into Angular, a powerful framework for building dynamic web applications. Then, we'll introduce React, under the popular framework known for its component-based approach to web development. As you progress through the course, we'll cover Node.js, a runtime environment that allows JavaScript to run on the server side. We'll also discuss career opportunities in web development and how to kickstart your journey in this field. Finally, we'll wrap up with a discussion on web development interview questions to help you prepare for job interviews and land your dream job in the web development. But before we begin, Please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated on the latest tech content from Edureka. Also, visit the Edureka website for full stack developers master training, the link to which is in the description box below. What is web development actually? So web development is the task that is associated with developing websites for hosting via intranet or the internet. Now the web development process involves web design, web content development, client side or server side scripting and network security configuration. So a website can either be a simple one page site or it could be an incredibly complex web application. So when you view your website on the web in a browser, it is because of all the processes involved in web development. So now that you've understood what is web development, let's move on and discuss about who is actually a web developer. Now a web developer is actually a programmer who specializes in the development of the World Wide Web applications using a client server model. Now they're also responsible for designing, coding and modifying websites from layout to function and according to a client's specifications. So web developers usually just focus on a few languages. So you can either focus on the front end programming of a website using the HTML, CSS and JavaScript or on the server side programmings like the PHP, Java, Ruby and .NET. Now there are different job profiles of a web developer as well. So talking about the different roles, we have the front end developer role. Now front end development is known as client side development. So it mostly involves programming all the public facing visuals and elements as part of a website's design. So front end developers often have to collaborate with web designers. Also, they must have strong programming skills such as HTML, CSS and JavaScript as they work with elements that are visible to the users. Now this was about the front end developers. Apart from that, there is another role known as the backend developer. Now, backend refers to the hidden layer that the users can't see when they visit a website. So, they must have strong programming skills because the backend layer forms a dynamic connection between the front end and the database. Now, to get this layer working, it's important to know at least one of the programming languages such as Python, Java, PHP, SQL, C Sharp, Ruby, etc. And also you need the knowledge of server side frameworks such as Node.js. And finally, we have a full stack developer. Now you can either work with the front end or the back end, or you can also work with both of these together, which is full stack web development. 
Now a full stack web developer is someone who has a good understanding of how the web works at each and every level. So including setting up and configuring Linux or Windows servers, coding server side APIs, running the client side of the application by using the JavaScript, operating and querying databases, and structuring and designing the web page with CSS, HTML and JavaScript. So these were the different works of a front end, back end or a full stack web developer. And combining all of these, this was the task of a web developer. So now that you have understood who is a web developer, let's move on and see who is a web designer. Now web designers create layouts that are visually pleasing for visitors. So the work of a web designer is critical in making sure that visitors spend more time on a website. They analyze the latest trends in web design, respect design principles and norms, follow what the users expect when visiting a website. Not just that, web designers also focus on adding branding elements on a website without making them too abrupt compared to the rest of the design. Since web design covers a lot of responsibilities, web designers can specialize in specific areas of the website. Now there are different job profiles for a web designer as well. Now talking about the roles, the first one is the UI designers. So the user interface designers, that is the UI designers, are the ones who deal with user interaction. They make sure that users are able to interact with the elements that are present on the website. The user interface is everything that a visitor sees when they access a website and it needs to be designed in a manner so that it fits the user's expected workflow. Now, apart from UI designers, there's another role called as the UX designers. Mostly you have seen the roles to be UI UX designers, so you can either specialize as a UI designer or a UX designer. Now, the user experience designers, that is the UX designers, make sure that your website is able to keep the visitors engaged. Now, they analyze data before finalizing any design on the website. Also, the UX designers run complex tests and restructure the websites when needed to keep the user experience optimal. Now, apart from the UI UX designers, we have visual designers as well. Now, when we combine the duties of a UI and UX designer, it creates a separate profile called the visual designer. Now, visual designing refers to creating interfaces that are both visually pleasing and convenient to use. Also, they must respect the voice of a brand. So visual design skills involve both creativity and programming. So these were the different roles of a web designer. Firstly, to start off why you need to become a web developer, there are several reasons. Let's speak of the job opportunities. Now, in India, there are up to 20,000 vacant jobs, which includes experienced and freshers, while in US, you have up to 47,000 vacant jobs. Now, this is based on data available on LinkedIn and Indeed. The next thing that you need to see is how is the job opportunity in Silicon Hubs? India's Silicon Hub Bangalore alone has around 4,000 vacant jobs while that of World Silicon Valley, California has around 7,000 vacant jobs. Now the next point that you have to consider in order to become a web developer is salary. We have covered that as well as in India, an average salary comes up to 10 lakh per year, while in US comes up to $77,000 per year. Again, this data is based on LinkedIn and Glassdoor. The next aspect is the companies that you're looking for. Now, when it comes to web development, there are two types of companies that need a web developer, service-based and product-based. When it comes to service-based, there are high-end companies such as IBM, Deloitte, Cognizant, Wipro, Capgemini, amongst many others that are looking for a well-skilled web developer. There are also product-based companies such as Flipkart, Amazon, Google, amongst many others, which are looking for a web developer. That said, your next aspect must be who exactly is a web developer? Now to answer that question, we need to understand what exactly is web development. 
Now web development in layman terms is basically a work involved in developing a website for internet or even an intranet. It can range up to developing simple static web pages to high-end applications. Now that I understood, let's see who is a web developer in common. A web developer or a programmer or even a coder is specifically a person who engages in worldwide web application developments. Now this can include both client side and server side models. So what exactly does web design or web development includes? Basically a web design deals with both front end as well as back end looks and appearance or even working of a particular web page. A web developer in general is someone who manages, maintains, updates or even troubleshooting of the web page is also done by a web developer whenever needed. He is also responsible for handling technical aspects from performance to capacity which includes the speed and also trafficking of the website. Web developer can also be a person who works only for front-end or only for back-end. He can also be a full-stake developer which includes both front-end and back-end. Now in modern jobs basically they're looking for a full-stake web developer which means he should be eligible to handle both front-end and back-end code. That's it. Let's move on and understand how to become a web developer. The core question here is itself that. To understand that, we need to see certain job descriptions. Here, I've considered a popular job description from popular companies. First off, we have Boeing, which is an airline company. Here, they're looking for a basic level web developer. Now, he should be well versed in data structure, OOPs, concepts, Java or .NET. Here, mind you, Java is a basic language that most of the web development or web developer jobs vacancies will be looked upon. Along with that, it is an added advantage if you know .NET or Ruby or any specific language. But knowing core Java or even basic concepts of Java is an added advantage to you. Now, adding on, we have web development fundamentals along with relational database. Now, object orientation is an added advantage. In some companies, they will be looking for your knowledge on DevOps tools. Here, they are looking for Jenkins, Ansible, Docker, amongst others. To sum it up, we can say Java, .NET, DevOps, and database is the skills that they are looking for in this particular company. Let's go ahead and see one more company. Here, I've considered Wipro. We all dream to work in one such company. Again, here, they are looking for Java. Now, based on the companies, they look for the level of your advancement of Java. The next thing that they're looking for here is JavaScript technologies. Now, these JavaScript technologies might include React.js or Angular or any particular thing based on your skill set. The next thing is API knowledge, MongoDB, of course, that comes into database and testing. Now, speaking of testing, as a web developer, you need to know basic level of testing. Manual testing is something that is to be needed as a developer or a web developer. Of course, you don't have to have a core knowledge like Selenium or any tool based testing, but manual testing is something that is needed as a web developer. Again, to sum it up here, Java, JavaScript, React or Node.js, MongoDB and testing are something that we can understand from this job description. To close up, we'll see one more job description. Here I've considered Walmart Labs. Here again, they're looking for Java, Spring Boot, microservices, and web-based technologies such as JavaScript, TypeScript, CSS, and ReactJS. Sum it up, we have Java again, JavaScript again, TypeScript to add on here. Now, mind you, TypeScript is asked when you're not a entry level, but experienced for a little bit. Here, they're looking for two to six years experience design development web developer. Now, along with that, HTML, CSS, a basic web developer skills is needed along with React. Now, again, like I mentioned earlier, instead of React, it could be Angular or any other such framework based technologies. Now, from this, we understand the skills one needs to become a web developer. That said, let's go ahead and see what are the skills in general. So as a web developer in general, there are two kinds of skills you need to know front end skill and back-end skill. 
Speaking of front-end skills, you need to know HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and some of the JavaScript frameworks such as Flutter, React, Angular, and any other of your comfort or whichever you are looking for in your jobs. Along with that, Bootstrap is an added advantage if you know Bootstrap. Now, speaking of backend skills, you need to know Java. Core concept of Java is all they need to know. If you have advanced Java knowledge, that is an added advantage again. Along with that, language of your comfort, such as PHP, Ruby, Perl, is an added advantage. Now, in some cases, Java might be replaced with .NET or C Sharp. This is very rare or even in most cases, but choose your job properly and based on your job, you can look for your comfort language and become thorough with it. Now, NoSQL database is highly popular as a web developer. So you need to know any of the NoSQL database, at least basic knowledge of database is an added advantage. SQL is a must. With that, let's go ahead and see the roles and responsibilities of a web developer. Now, here are the day-to-day -day tasks. Again, these tasks might depend on your particular industry or your position or even a project that you are assigned to. But again, you need to know certain tasks that you have to do on a regular basis, irrespective of your position, project or industry. Those are creating, debugging and testing your application. Now, these could be the online already built websites or you developing and creating new websites which you have to create or debug or even test. The next thing that you need to do as a web developer is to present design specification. Of course, we all know that any website or web application needs to be enhanced and recharged in time. So it is important for you to present any new design and specification as a web developer. Along with that, maintaining, updating, and troubleshooting website problems along with monitoring the website trafficking is an important job that you will do as a web developer. Finally, you need to stay updated on all the trending technology. Not just as a web developer, if you are in any stream, it is important for you to know the latest trending technologies to be on the top of the game. So in order to stay updated, it is important for you to know and learn all the new trending technologies. That said, Let's see how you can get started. Now, if you say I have zero knowledge on web development, I have no clue how to get started. Worry not because we've got you covered. First things first, if you have zero knowledge, you are here and this itself is a beginning. Along with that, you can go ahead and watch many more such videos on Edureka YouTube channel. It has every basic thing as simple as what is web development to a tutorial based video as well. Now, if you have good time in hand and you're much of a reader, I recommend you go ahead and look at the blogs. You can find the links to every video and also the blogs in the description. Now, if you think that these are things that you will not understand and you would need an instructor and professional help, worry not because we have a course which is on full stake development. Now, all your queries will be solved along with professional help. All the experts here are with a 10 years experience in the web development. Now you will have lifetime resource to this web development course also. So without further ado, go ahead and register for full stake development course. So the idea behind HTML was a modest one. When Tim Berners-Lee was putting together his first elementary browsing and authoring system for the web, he created a quick little hypertext language that would serve his purposes. He imagined dozens or even hundreds of hypertext formats in the future and smart clients that could easily negotiate and translate documents from servers all across the internet. Now HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language and it is a standard markup language for creating web pages and web applications. It is used to describe the structure of the web pages using a process called markup. Now, HTML mostly constitutes of elements and these elements are the building blocks of any HTML page and are represented by tags. Now, let me just give you a brief introduction to the structure of HTML. Now, this is also called an HTML boilerplate. So firstly, an HTML boilerplate begins with the HTML tags, which tells the browser that this is an HTML page and this is where it begins from. 
Next comes the head tag, which contains most of the meta information about the document. The head tag normally also contains the link to the styling sheets, the fonts that you might be using on your web page, and even the JavaScript that you might be using. Now, the head tag also has the title element, which specifies the title for the document and can be seen as a text on the tab that you open on a browser. Now, next comes the body tag, which mostly contains the content that is visible to the viewer of your page. And these contains elements like H1 tags or paragraph tags, which are known by P tags, and they make up the mass of your content. Now, to create an HTML page, there are a few steps. So firstly, you need to open any sort of text editor. It could be Notepad++, Notepad, Sublime Text, or even Visual Studio Code. You have the freedom to use whatever text editor you want. Next, you have to write up some HTML code that you want to show on your web page, and then you just save your file as a .html. And to open the file, all you have to do is just view it on your browser. Now, let me just give you a quick demonstration on how that is actually done, if you've still not understood that. So let us create a folder first. So let's call this folder HTML demo. And now we're just gonna use Sublime Text because that's my favorite text editor. Out here, all you have to do is create a new file and I'm gonna be saying that it's a HTML type. Then you just fit in your HTML boilerplate. I'm gonna tell my title is gonna be my first web page. And that is the title of our web page. Now let's put in some content into this. So it's gonna have an H1 which says, this is just some text. Let's save this. This is gonna be saved into our HTML demo. So yes, let's open it, let's save it as index.html. Now, once you've saved it, all you have to do to view it is go into your folder and just open it on your browser. So as you guys can see, the title is written out here on the tab and this is our H1 that we just created. Okay, so that's how you basically create an HTML page. So let's move on. Now, there are some elements that I want to tell you all about, which is very important. So first is the doc type element. So the doc type declaration represents that the file you're working is a document type and helps the browser to display web pages correctly. And it only appears once at the top of the page before any HTML tag. And the doc type declaration is not case sensitive. Okay, so this is what HTML actually looks like. Now before we move further with some HTML coding, I want to make you all aware that a web page is fundamentally made up of three constituents. The first is HTML, the second is CSS or cascading style sheets, and the third is JavaScript. Now HTML will only give the structure of the web page. It has nothing to do with the styling, while CSS is completely responsible for how beautiful your web page looks, what colors you're using as the background, how your images are actually lined up, and all those sorts of things. To learn more about CSS, you can always refer to our CSS tutorial on the same page of EdureCup. And thirdly, JavaScript is for making your page much more dynamic. If you're clicking on a button, your posts are being actually submitted. That's all being done by JavaScript. And if you all want to learn about JavaScript, we also have tutorials for that and you can surely check them out. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create some elements and see how they look like on an HTML page. So let's go back to our HTML page. So this is what an H1 looks like. So let me just copy this down now. And let me show you all the types of headings that HTML provides us. It's actually H1 through H6, so H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Let's also change them here. H6, H5, H4, H3, 2. Now let's save it. Let's go ahead and reload our page. So this is how the different types of headings look like. This is H1 being the biggest and H6 being the smallest. Okay, so that was about headings. Now we have some other tags also that I want to make you all aware of. So there's a P tag first. So P normally stands for paragraph. Now paragraph is basically what it looks like and it normally contains random text or paragraphs of your web page. And this is what they look like. So this is what a paragraph looks like. Okay, so that was all about adding a paragraph. So how do you add images? So you can simply add image with the image tag and all you have to say is a source. Now I already have a beautiful picture of a Pokemon that I really loved as a kid. So let me just copy that down into the folder. Okay, so now that we've copied down our image into our folder, all you have to do is give the source. 
Now this can be nine tails dot png. That's the name of our image. Let's go back to our page. Let's reload it. Okay. Now you can also put in attributes like height and you could say the height is going to be seven or 500 pixels and then you can also put in an attribute called width and say that's also going to be 500 pixels yeah so that changes the height and width of your image you can also make it smaller by saying something like 100 pixels so let me just show you that save it let's reload it and yeah now we have a much smaller nine tails out there now suppose you don't have a picture you can also put an alt tag so this will say there was supposed to be an image here so let's save that now you will not be able to see the alt tag because our image is working but suppose I misspelled the name of my image and now you'll see something like that out there so there was supposed to be an image out here so it's showing the alternate thing right we can also have line breaks in our HTML so you do that simply by saying slash br and then there will be a line break between this word Alamco and Laboris. So let's save that. Let's cancel this out. Okay, so now Alamco and Laboris are on different lines. We can also make stuff bold. So suppose you want to make this first word bold. So you can go B slash B and that'll make it bold. Yep, now lorem is bold. You can also, for making things bold, you can use a strong tag. And now let's say this is also bold. And now this is also bold comes up right there. Then you can change the size of text. So let's just create some other text. So it not, so that it doesn't get cluttered up. So we have tags like big, and we also have tags like small. So let me just show you the difference. This text is big. Well, this is small. Let's do that. So this text is big. Well, this is small. So let me just put a line break here. Save that. Let's also put a line break here. And now let's put back our image. Yeah, this text is big. Well, this is small. Now you can also put in horizontal lines inside your HTML. All I have to say is HR and that'll put a horizontal line out there right like that you can also put the width and height out here so width there's no reason to put a height because it's not there and width is going to be something like 70 percent you could say 70 percent and you have a line that goes 70 percent through the screen next we can also put in links into our html so suppose you want to go to a site so let's say you want to go to edureka now we can put some text like say this is a link to a website let's save that let's put it here and now this will take us to edureka.co yep so that's how it works you can also put links on images so suppose we were to remove this text out here copy this image from here and just put it out here now if we were to click on the image it'll take us to edureka.co Okay, you can also add lists into your HTML page. So there are two types of lists. One is an ordered list. So ordered lists are numbered lists and you can put in list items like this. So let's put in a bunch of list items. Okay, so let's type in some text. So this is a random list. So list items are actually going to be the things that you're going to list out. So these could be anything that you're listing out. You could list out your favorite dogs. You could list out your favorite chocolates or anything like that. Let me just show you what that looks like. Let's go back to our page. And this is what it looks like. So as you guys can see, we have a list out here which says this is a random list. This is a random list. And just to make it a little more creative, let's go and put in some stuff like that. So firstly, let's put an H2 out here these are some of my favorite dogs uh, let's say I love Samoeds I also love corgis I love huskies and I also love golden retrievers so now we'll have an actually good list out here so these are some of my favorite dogs now if I were to just make this an unordered list so we could also have unordered list so this is how you create an unordered list you just go UL and then you put in your list items so I'm gonna say 
So let's put an H2 again and these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. So list item this is gonna be let's see I really love playing Shadow Fiend. Then let's put in some other heroes like Storm Spirit, Invoker and let's say Templar Assassin. Let's save that and let's see. So these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. Now if you see our H2 is kind of indented. That is because we have put it inside our list. Now if you were to just cut it out and put it outside. Let's reinvent my lines and let's see. So now it's properly showing. So these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. You can also put in images in these list items. So suppose we were to put in some images of Shadow Fiend Storm Spirit. You would just put an image out here and you would put the source. Now I don't really have images but you can also put in the URL of images. So let me just show you how to do that. So let's see Shadow Fiend. Let's go into the images. Let's find something small like let's say 300x300. Okay so this looks like a nice cartoonish figure. So we open this image in the new tab and we copy down this link. So you can see the source is this link. Let's save it. Let's see if it shows up. Yep. And now this thing shows up just outside Shadow Fiend. You can also put in some styling or some attributes like you say width is going to be 100 pixels and height is going to be 100 pixels. So let's save that now. And now it's a much smaller image of Shadow Fiend. Now we have other types of tags also. So these are called div tags. So div tag stands for division. So to divide your page into separate parts, you could say this will contain the footer. So footer tags are normally coming in the end. Now you could also have a div tag in the beginning and this could contain the header. So these tags will contain the header. This is so let me just put in some header. So this is the header and this is the footer. So this is the header, headers always come on top and this is the footer. Now you can also create forms using HTML. So let's go ahead and create one. So our form is going to be called a registration form. Okay, so now let's put our form in a div first of all. So let's give our div an ID. So IDs and classes are actually used to select stuff on an HTML page when you're styling. So to understand more about IDs, check out our CSS tutorial. Let's give this ID form or registration form rather. Then let's go into our div and create a form. Our form will always stay inside our form tags. Now that we have done that, let's understand the elements of a form. Firstly, we need an input. So first input will be of type text. Let's say its name is going to be first name and we'll have a placeholder like something like this say aria and we will always be requiring it so if you say required that means somebody will if he's actually inputting stuff into the form this is a mandatory field okay so let's save that and see so now we have a registration form called aria okay so we also need labels so let's go ahead and create one so label so for first name and this is going to say first name and it's going to have a colon so now there's a label called first name now we can do this for last name also so let's control c control v so it's going to be last it's going to be last and this is also going to be last and we want to put a placeholder for paul and this is also a required field so now we have a last name with this placeholder we can submit stuff into that now form also takes in two important attributes I forgot to mention. So one is the action and the other is the method. Now action is something that will happen when you submit this form. So you can run a script, something like script.php. But for now, that's for another session. Okay, now there are other types of inputs. So let's see, let's create another div. Now suppose you want to input the gender also. So let's see, let's first create a label and let's also create an input type. So input will be type of radio and this is going to be called gender male 
and let's also give us a value of choice one save it now you want to label and you want to give it the attribute for and you want to give it the name out here so let's put in that so gender male save that and let's write male out here so let's save that now and let's see what it looks like so now we have this thing called male we can check it and we can uncheck it now let's create for female also and others so let's see let's call this female and this is going to be of type choice 2 now we have male we have female but if you see we can actually select both of them or all of them so that's not something we want right so let's make this choice 3 let's make this other okay now we have a gender submission going on so male or it's female or it's other now we can't really select everything so how do we actually solve that so let's give them all the same name so we can call it gender choice save it now you either go male or you go female or you go other you can't really select the same thing so that's how you make that happen okay now let's look into some other types of input types we can take in so let's create another div suppose you want to take in the email address so let's go ahead and copy that let's put it out here let's say so label for let's see first of all we need to change this type to email and we will also give this a name of email let's put in a placeholder instead of a value and it's going to be something like let's put xyz at the rate email.com okay now we have this thing going on so let's change this label to email and let's change this label to email too now we have this thing going and we can type in our email and we'll also need to type in a password for registrations let's call this password let's also make this password the type is going to be password and let's remove a placeholder because passwords don't really have placeholders save that and now you see when you type in a password you can't really see anything that's how you make a form that inputs a password okay so that was how you take in emails and passwords in a form now there are some other stuff that I want to show you so let's dive right into that so let's create another div okay so first of all we need a select tag so select tags are used for making selections so let me show you how that works so firstly let's give this a name and let's call this birthday or let's call this the month now we'll also need a label for this let's create a label so our label is for month let's call it birthday now our select can have various options so you're basically going to put it in a bunch of options out here let's see option now we need 12 options actually that's 3 that's 6 that's 9 that's 12 delete these out just read in my lines now our options are going to have values so our value will be something like fine so let's say Jan Feb March April May June July August September October November and December and you could say January out here February let me just create this quickly March let's save this now let's see what this looks like so we have this birthday thing and it has all the months in there okay now out here if you see it already comes with the default value of January now you can also mitigate that by putting in another option called default so let's put another option or so now that we have an option let's give this a value 0 and let's say selected disabled now if you reload this there's nothing but you get all these different values now instead of just making it blank 
you could say that this could say month so now this says month and you could create something similar for days also so for days you need to create 30 of these and I hope you get the logic of creating this thing now now our form also needs a button to submit so let's go and create that also let me show you another type of input so let's say input and the type will be check box and the name will be agree and let's put a label for this a for agree and I agree to all the conditions of the form now we will have this thing going and we have a checkbox we could check it we could uncheck it something like that then all we need is an input in order an input we rather need a button say button and you say submit and you also have to give this a type so this is going to be of type submit so once that's done we see this button and we can submit it so if you go and submit you'll see please fill out this field because it's a required field and that's all that is there the forms so that's how you create a form in HTML you can also create tables in HTML so let me show you how to do that let's reload and make this blank save it yeah so our tables are created with table tags your table and tables have table data okay so we can also create tables in HTML for that we need the table tag now table comes with the table header first of all so this will contain all your table headers so suppose you are creating a table for dogs and the breeds so th dog and you can say the dog also has a name and breed so this has created a table header now so let me just show you what that looks like so now we have the dog name and breed now we can just simply go in and put in some table rows so for the row you say tr and in every row you will have to put in some table data so for that you use the table data tag so td so let's say our dog is called so let's make this rather dog owner name right so I had a dog and my dog's name was Stoner let's call him Stoner and Stoner was a street dog so let's just keep the breed as street okay so that was one table data row save it now we'll be needing multiple table rows so let's just copy that paste it multiple times so let's say my friend Shubham he has a dog called Goldie and it's a retriever and then I also have this friend called Ayushman he has a dog called Duke and it's Husky and then there's this guy called Ishan he has a dog called Monster but it's a pug yeah so now we have successfully created a table and you guys, you guys can see dog owners are Arya, Shubham, Ayushman and Ishan their name of their respective dogs is Stoner, Goldie, Duke and Monster and the breeds are street, retriever, husky and pug. So that's how you create a table. Now with CSS you can add a border to this table. So let me just show you how that's done with a little bit of CSS. So let's say style. Let's say text slash CSS. Now out here you could just do some little styling. Let's say let's give our table a border of 1px solid black. Now our table will have a border and we can also give TDs a border and in there are gonna have 1px solid black too so now everything has a border and our table looks much neater yep so that's how you create a table in HTML okay guys so now it's time I actually show you how HTML can be really polished sometimes so let's go ahead and create a blog so for this blog I've already created the CSS out here so I'm not really going to be explaining the styling part but we are going to be creating our blog so let's go ahead and see how that looks like so first of all let's delete everything let's create a page now so let's call this blog now we'll be linking our style sheet out here so for linking our style sheet all you have to say is something like this and then we go ahead and copy my style sheets the desktop we're doing our stuff in HTML demo let's copy this here right 
now our blog.css is going to be here now let's go and start creating our blog so firstly let's put everything inside a div now this is going to have a class called post because I've used the class to actually style some stuff now that's done so let's have another div so this is going to have a class called date and we're going to be putting in the date so let's say our date is going to be October 24th 2018 now let's say we have a heading so let's say Vancouver my favorite city then let's put in some paragraphs because every article needs a paragraph so for paragraphs you're just going to be filling it with some lorem ipsum now our paragraph will have a class called quote okay now let's reload and see what is being made okay so if you guys can see our blog post is coming up now we can also add some images to our blog post so let's say let's add a link first so we link to https www.edureca.co now we are going to use an image for actually making it clickable so we already have an image it's called image1.jpg so that's there let's also put an alt tag out here just in case this doesn't load up so alt and say Vancouver image now let's put in some another paragraphs so not lorem ipsum and some more paragraphs I guess because this is a blog so let's make it look like a blog save that and let's also give it a horizontal line to make it look neat save this let's load it okay so we have this nice looking article and it has this image if we click on this image it will take us to edureka site so we go to edureka if we click that image let's add another article into this just to make it a little longer so let's copy down this div so let's change the date first because let's say we post it on the next day let's change the title so the my second blog post save it let's remove the image from this one to make it a little different yeah so now if you see we have this nice looking blog post going on it has this horizontal line we have some quote out here and that's how you can do stuff with HTML so what exactly is CSS well CSS stands for cascading style sheets and is generally used to control how HTML tags and elements are displayed on your screen so this means basic styling of your web page is controlled by CSS now CSS was actually made to solve problems that were introduced in HTML 3.2 now HTML 3.2 got in some new attributes like font color background color which generally was pertaining to styling of a element on a web page now while this did add some very very needed functionality into HTML 3.2 it cluttered up your code as a developer and made your life pretty miserable so to keep the structure of your web page which is the HTML and to make the styling a different aspect CSS was made by W3C so W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium and CSS till date is still being maintained by the W3C developers okay so that was a general introduction to CSS now let's move ahead so this is the basic syntax of CSS you basically have selectors which selects or targets the place that you want to attach your styling to then you have basic properties and value pairs now you can include your CSS into your HTML with a link tag while putting the href attribute as the file name or you can do some inline CSS but that's not actually recommended because that's the problem that we are actually trying to mitigate by putting CSS as a different file also if you don't want to create another CSS file you can do some internal CSS by putting in some style tags in your head tag and just writing some normal CSS to it okay so now let's see the different type of CSS selectors so these are all the different type of CSS selectors and basically a selector is a way of targeting an element on a web page so the star selector selects all the elements and applies the CSS that you would apply to it and then if you would say div then it would apply your CSS to all the divs now div comma p will apply to all the divs and paragraphs div space p will put your styling to all the paragraphs inside divs 
Now going through all the CSS selectors is a pretty cumbersome job. So I recommend that you go through this page on W3 Schools, which has all the different types of selectors and the different types of pseudo selectors all listed out. So this will very much help you when you're doing your own CSS. So always keep this page open. Now, just for basic sake, let me just tell you about pseudo selectors. So we also have pseudo selectors, which is defined something like this. So pseudo selectors include stuff like hover, active, visited, and stuff like that. Now, suppose you were hovering over an A tag. So you can say there is supposed to be some specific styling when you're hovering over it. So how would you do that? You would just say A colon hover, and then you would actually specify the styling that you want. Now you could also find all these types of pseudo selectors out here and it's all listed out here. So A visited, like select all visited links, something like that. Now I also want to make you all aware of the box model that is very much used in CSS. Now box model has four things, the content, padding, border and margin. So content is the basic content of the web page that you want to show to you, your general audience. Then the padding is the space between your border and the content itself. The border is a line that can be of any size, color and width. And then there's a margin which is the distance from the edge of the screen to the border. Okay. And now the box model looks something like this. So the content comes in between, then comes the padding, which is between the border and the content. And then there's the margin, which is between the screen and the border itself, the screen edge and the border, right? So that's how the box model works. Now the last bit of basics is the CSS units. So there are four kinds of units. Firstly, we have the pixel. So pixel is represents any pixel on a device. So you could say something like font size is equals to 25 pixels. So it'll make it actually 25 pixels. Then there's also points, which is mostly used in print media. And all you need to remember to use points correctly, that 72 points equals one inch. Now the last two types of units are relative units. Now these are relative to your current font size. So one EM or 100% is actually equals to your current font size. So if you want something to be double your font size, all you have to say is two EM. So these are how relative units work in CSS. Okay, so that was all the basics of CSS and how you select stuff and all the units. Now let's get ahead and code some of our own CSS. So for this time, I've actually created a bunch of HTML pages and we're gonna style these HTML pages by adding some CSS into them. And this will stand as good practice for CSS alone. Okay, so for the first page, we have this page called page1.html. And it's a pretty basic page. Let me just open it up and show it to you guys. So this is what it looks like without any sort of CSS being attached to it. Now we're going to create some CSS and we're going to try and practice, first of all, selecting stuff in different ways possible. Okay. So firstly, let's do some very random CSS. Okay. Firstly, let's target all the divs in this HTML. So how would you actually do that? Well, you'd say div by going selectors and let's actually save this as a CSS file first so that our syntax is colored properly. Okay, so that's a div. So that's how you select any element in CSS. Now, suppose we were to say background color or rather just background, it'll be purple and the text or the color of the text will be white. So now everything inside a div will look like that. So now let's just save this as page one. As it's saved as page one dot CSS, let's reload our page. And everything that is inside the div now has a white text and it also has a purple background. Okay. Now let's see how we actually select IDs. So we select IDs with the hash. So we have an ID called quote out here if you go and see. So where is that thing gone? Okay, so this paragraph out here that you see has the ID called quote. So we're gonna select that and put in some of our own CSS. So let's see, now that we've selected our ID, we can say, suppose we want to change the font family. So we could say font family is Verdana and you could also put in alternate font families just in case Verdana doesn't exist in your system like Kilsans. Fine. So that's how you set up your font family. Let's also set the color to be black. Let's see what changes now. So this is the code that I was talking about. So that font should change now. Let's reload. Oh yes, now the font has become Verdana and that's what we exactly wanted. And the text is also black now. Okay, so how do we select classes now? So if you go here and see, we should have a class called movies. Right, 
So all these have a class called movie, all these A tags. So let's select them. So first of all, to select a class, you say dot, and then you say the class name. Now, we could put in some random CSS into this again. So let's make the color. Let's keep it white. And let's make the background steel blue. Let's see. So where are our movies? Let's see where the movies actually exist. Oh yeah, Dota, Splinter Cell, and God of War. These are the movies, so these should now change. Let's save it. And now they have a background color of steel blue and they have a text color of white. And that's exactly what we defined out here. Fine. Now let's try out some other kinds of selectors. So suppose in the span out here, we have this ID called author. So what if we only want to target that? What would we say? So we could say span and hashtag author. Now you could put any type of CSS. So let's say text transform. So this is how you transform any sort of text and you could say uppercase. Now the author will be changed to uppercase out here and this is the author, the Pope Alexander part. Now watch that. Now it's just uppercase and we have selected it with this selector called span and hashtag author. We can also do some other kinds of selecting. Let me just show it to you. So we could select the allies of the unordered list or the ordered list. So our skills is the ID. This is the ID of skills. So let's select them now. So we have skills and we could go the ordered list and then the LI. And what we want to say out here is the color will be purple. We can do the same thing for the unordered list too. Let me just copy that down. Put this here, say unordered list. And let's say we change the text color to white. Save that, let's reload our page. So wait, first of all, let me uncommon this. Now let's save it again, reload our page and see the differences. Now, since we had given it a purple color, it's now all purple and let me just put a background of white so that you can see it. Yeah, now these are purple and these are background white. We can do the same for the unordered list too. Let me just uncommon that. Let me also give it a background of purple or actually let it be like that. Let's just make it blue. Now Sass and Hamel have turned into blue as you see out here. This is the blue thing. Fine. Now that was selectors. Okay, now let's go ahead and select some other stuff. So what if we want to select all the paragraphs that are after the H3 tag? So if you remember, we can do that by saying H3 plus P and let's say we want a background of black and some text color that is white. So color white. Not being very creative with my CSS at this moment because this is just about selecting. So let's see how that reloads. Yep. Now we have a color of white and a background of black. And that only selected the paragraph just after the S3 which is my favorite video games. Okay. We can also select every paragraph that has a class by just saying something like P and class. We don't even need to specify the color or I mean the class name. So you go background, let's say we want to give a gray background. Let's see all the paragraphs of the class. So this is the only paragraph of the class. Now you can do the same thing for IDs. Just say ID out here and let's see all the paragraphs with an ID. So this is the only paragraph with an ID. Okay, so now that we're done with selecting stuff, let's go and actually see how text can be transformed with the use of CSS. Fine. So first of all, I already have a page created for that. So this is going to be our page that we are going to use to see how text is transformed. If you see, I have an ordered list with all the types of text transformations or the text stylings that I want to show. And we also have a paragraph out here which will show the basics box elements like the borders, margins and padding. So I'm going to demonstrate that through this PID out here. Right, so let's get started. First of all, let's create our CSS file and in the CSS file, we're going to save it and we're going to call it page 2.css, right? Then yeah, it's connected as page 2. So let's get started. So first of all, let's target this ID with lorem. So lorem ipsum is just some Latin paragraph that is normally used in web development to fill in spaces with text where you can always come back and delete that text and fill it with something more meaningful. 
So for now, we are going to be using this lorem epsom thing. So it's in a paragraph tag with an ID of lorem. So let's go ahead and select it. So we are going to select it with the help of the ID. Let's call it lorem. Now, first of all, let me just show you what the page looks like without any CSS attached to it. So this is what the page looks like, right? So this is the part that we are going to target right now. First of all, let's give it a background of black. Let's make the color of the text white. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, right? Now let's give it some borders and padding. So first of all, to give a border, we could say we use the border app, uh, property, then we give three parameters. The type of the border, the size of the border, and then the color. And you do it something like this, 3px, solid, red. Now, apart from solid, there are a lot of types of borders, and those include dashed, dotted, rigged and many more these are the ones that are just from the top of my head so you can try out them out and you can find other types of css border just by going to google and saying css border types so these are all the types of borders that you get and you can definitely check them out it's impossible to show everything in one video like that so let me just show you the solid type so let's save it and let's see what kind of border we actually get. Let's close this down. Yeah, now we have this neat little border of three pixels in size and red in color. Now let me just show you how dotted would look like. So this is what dotted looks like. And this is what dashed looks like. Fine. And this is what dashed is. Okay. Now let's also give this thing some padding. Now padding exists between the content and the border. So I just explained the box model when we were discussing the basics of CSS. So I hope you remember that. So for padding, there are four parameters actually. The right, top, left, and bottom. So you can define your padding something like this. You can go 13 pixels, 13 pixels, 13 pixels, and 20 pixels. Now these are just very arbitrary numbers. But what I want to explain is that this first part will mean that there's 13 pixels of padding from the top and then we move via in a clockwise fashion. So this is on the right, this is in the bottom, so 13 pixels of padding in the bottom and 20 pixels of padding on the left. Now you could also say this really easily if you want to give equal amounts of padding suppose. Now this means that there will be 13 pixels of padding on the top and bottom. And this second part would mean that there's 13 pixels of padding on the left and the right. And if you just put one digit, that means there's 13 pixels of padding all around it. Now let's go and put these different paddings around lorem ipsum. Now it looks much neater. We can also put a margin. So let's put a margin. And the margin also works in the same way. So suppose you were to say 5 pixels. That means it would give a 5 pixel margin all around your content. If you were to put say 10 pixels and 20 pixels. This means that 10 pixels of margin on the top and bottom. And 20 pixels of margin on the left and right. And there's also another keyword that I want to make you aware of. And that is auto. So what auto does is it gives equal amounts of margin however you specify it. So out here it'll give 10 pixels of margin on the top and bottom and equal amounts of margin on the left and right. So let's see how that works. Yep, so that's how it changed it. Now that was all about the box modeling. So let me just remove this part from the HTML and let's remove this part from the CSS. Now as you guys can see, I have this ordered list out here. First of all, let me reload the page. Now I have this ordered list out here, which shows us all the types of styles and weights and sizes that I'm going to be showing right now. And this will include a lot of the units that we discussed, like M's, points, pixels, and percentages. So let's move ahead. So to select these, I'll be using these IDs. So let me just remember the first four IDs. is normal, italic, oblique, and small cap. So let's go ahead and create them. So firstly, let's select our normal ID and say what are we going to try and show here is font style so all you have to say is font style is normal so normal basically means that the font style will be normal instead of something bolded then i think we had italic so you go font style italic then we also had oblique so you go font style oblique and we also had small caps so let me just see that again yep it's small cap so you go small cap and what are we trying to show in small cap is the font variant. So font variant small caps. So let me just reload and see how that changed stuff. 
Okay, so font style normal just stays normal while italic and oblique are almost similar. Then in font variant small caps, this is how it would look like where the first letter has a bigger font size and the rest have a smaller font size but everything is in capital. And next is the font weight. So let's see the IDs. It's normal, bold, bolder. So let's go with that now. So firstly we have normal. So font size is the size or weight? It's weight. So font weight will be normal. Next part is bold, bolder, lighter. Okay. So we select bolder like that. We go font weight is bolder and we can say again, let's first after bolder, it's bold. Okay, we so W bold and you go font weight is bold. Let's see how that changes stuff. So yeah, bold is bold and font weight bolder is slightly more bolder while font weight normal is absolutely normal. Right, time for some more. So the next is the font size which goes from extra large, large, medium, small, extra, extra, small. So let's do that. So first is extra extra large and this is the font size that we're talking about. So it's extra extra large. There's also extra large. So extra extra large looks something like this. While only extra large looks something like this. Fine. Then we also have large. So font size will be large. So that's font size large. Next we have medium small and extra extra small so medium small and extra extra small so this is going to be font size medium this is going to be font size small and this is going to be font size extra extra small so let's see how that changes stuff so this is extra extra small this is small and this is medium now the next thing that we're going to see is how points work so our size is going to be 25 points so instead of just doing that let me just change the extra extra small and let's say it's 25 points you should remember that one point is around two inches so that's how font size extra extra small would look like if it was 25 points then we could also say the font size is 150 percent so that shows us how percentages works where 100 percent means the current font size Look at the change and that's how 150% means. The next thing that we want to show is line height. So let's say, what is the ID? Let me just check the ID. So the line height IDs are line normal, height 25 points. So let's just select one line normal and this is going to have a line height of normal. Let's put a semicolon, save it up. And that's how line height normal is. That is the normal line height. Now you could say your line height is 25 points and that's how it would change. Also you could say your line height is around 25 EM or just 5 EM. Let's say that. And that's how it would change even more with EM with 1 EM being the constant font size that we are using or you could say line height is 200%. So that is basically twice of what our line height or font is. And so that's how it would change, right? So that was all about text styling. Now let's move ahead and see how positioning and stuff takes place in CSS. So for positioning, I have again gone ahead and created this page3.html. So in here we will be including a CSS page called page3.css. So let's go ahead and create that. First of all, we have to set this to CSS. Save it as page3. And let's get started. So first of all, we have three types of positioning in CSS. Absolute, fixed, and relative. So first of all, I'm gonna show absolute positioning to you guys. Now before I show absolute positioning, let me just show you guys how text and stuff can be centered, first of all. So let's start doing some random CSS. So first of all, we are gonna target this ID called container. So let's go hashtag container and let's go to background some random color so for color picker we just go color picker let's give us uh, this background go okay that's the background we chose let's also give it some borders border will be two pixels solid and black we can also set up a border radius 
So border radius gives you a curved border. So you could say border radius is around 5 pixels, let's say. Now let me just open up the HTML file that is concerned at this moment. So this is page 3. Okay, so this is with some CSS. Now let me just uncomment that CSS first. So this is what our page would look like without any sort of CSS. Now this is what it looks like with the CSS that we just included. Now to make you aware of how box radius works, let me just uncomment that first. Let's comment it out so box radius should not work. And we should get, yeah, now if you see, let's zoom in out here. You see that this border is pointed. Suppose we don't want that to happen. Let's remove that first. And let's uncomment this. Save it. Let's reload. And now we have this slight little curved border which looks much neater. Okay. Now we can also center stuff. So a neat way to do that is, let me just show it to you. Let's take this part called centered. Now to center it, let me just give it a first background to make it look different. So this background will be, let's say, 89 CFF0. So that's our color. Let's see what our color looks like. So that is the color that we are going to center. Now let's say our width is going to be, we can set the width of elements like this. So you say width is 50%. And then you go margin is going to be auto. So what does auto do? It'll put an equal margin on all sides. Let's reload our page. Yep, and now it's centered. We can also center without actually centering the element. We can just center the text by just saying text, align, and center. Fine. Now that will remove the background and just keep the text out here. So that's exactly what we wanted. And that's how you align your text. Okay, now let's move ahead with absolute positioning. Now, absolute positioning means positioning based on the document itself, which means this whole web browser. So a browser is basically the document that you are actually manipulating. So it's called document object manipulation, if you've heard of that term. So let's go ahead and let me just show you how absolute positioning works. So first of all, we have this element called top left and we're gonna try and put it on the top left. So let's select that first. So you go top, left, now let's give it a background. Okay, that'll go to be the background. Now let's also give it a border. So let the border be one pixel solid and black. Let's say, now to position something with absolute positioning, all you have to say is position is absolute. Now let's also keep the width around 200 pixels and the height also around 200 pixels. Let's save it. Let's see how stuff changes. Let me just zoom out. Yeah, so that is our element. So this is what top left and bottom right is going to look like. Now we are going to try and select this element and put it in the bottom right of this parent. So let me just show you how that is done. So to select that, I've already created an ID for it and it's called bottom right. Let me give it a background of white. And you say the position is absolute. Now we want to change the position to actually inside the element. So we have to say it's going to be zero pixels from the bottom and also zero pixels from the right. So since it is, has absolute positioning, it's going to position this inside of this. So first of all, let's give it a background of white and also make the color black. Right, and now we have this right where we want it. Now there's also something called the Z index. So Z index is what comes first on your screen, basically. So if you have multiple things that are stacked on top of each other with absolute positioning, the one with the most Z index will be the one that is shown on top. So you can set a Z index like this and say the Z index is five. So anything with a Z index of four will actually come underneath this thing, right? So that was all about absolute positioning. Now let's go ahead and do some fixed positioning. So for fixed positioning, we have this ID called fixed, which contains a paragraph saying I'm staying right here. So let's select that first. Let me just remove all this stuff so that it's not cluttered anymore. Let me reload the page, save it, reload it, and that's how. So I'm staying here. First of all, this is what is going to change. Fixed positioning, right? Is that what we called it? Fixed position, okay. 
now first of all all you have to say is position is going to be fixed now let's make it more prominent by giving it a background of black and a text color of white so let's see this has become black and position is fixed whatever I do if I'm scrolling it just stays there it doesn't really matter what I do to this thing okay so that was all about fixed positioning now the next thing that we're going to see is relative positioning so for that I already have two elements created so let's say these are the divs which says this is going to be relative so relative positioning as I was just saying is positioning based on the relative position of the element so let me just show you so relative one now let's go to background first so let's just select some color let's make this green this green out here okay that's gonna be our color let's give it a border of one pixel solid black and let's say the height is gonna be around 100 pixels now we're gonna select another element and position it relative to this element okay so that is this element uh, right out here is gonna be relative to so to set something with the position of relative all we have to say that the position is relative and the less rest of the CSS is just arbitrary so let's say left not padding left so you want to position it somewhere left of it and the positioning is going to be relative so 20 pixels from the original positions 20 pixels to the left from the original position I mean and you could say from the top it would be around 30 pixels you could also say negative 30 pixels to move it the other way around let's give it a background I'm already given the background okay let's give it a background of yellow so you say background equals yellow and you could also give it a border and say 1px solid blue let's get a blue background okay so this relative layout is going to be positioned relative to this thing fine let's just reload and see yep and that's how relative positioning works now this might just not look neat at this moment but I'm trying to drive a point home fine okay now let me just see uh, if I have dog.jpg okay there's a PNG file called edureka so let me just show you something cool first of all let me just remove everything from here okay so now that our things are less cluttered and let me just rename this now to the image that is already there so edureka.png and edureka.png fine let's save this let's see what our page looks like now so this is what it looks like now you can float stuff like images to the left and right so let's just select the image tag and suppose you say float them to the right these will float everything to the right now that's how you position stuff or images with the float tag so I guess that was all about positioning of stuff now let's move ahead okay so in this part we are going to be learning about overflows so for overflows what we can do let's say let's go back to page 2.html and we have this text out here or this unordered list and this list is pretty big right first of all let's open up a new page or rather let's open up uh, okay wait let me just close these out so let's save this as page 2 dot CSS or rather let's just call it something new. first of all let's set this to CSS right let's save it and let's call it overflow now what I want to show you guys is something really cool so let's select the ordered list so that's what we're gonna select let's say it has width of around 100 pixels it has some padding from the top and right so let's get some padding of 10 pixels and 10 pixels all around rather let's give it a margin of 100 pixels and auto so we'll bring it right to the center let's see so it was page 2 that we're fiddling around with so this is page 2.html now let me just replace this with overflow dot CSS let's see now yeah so this is what it looks like now if you see to scroll through this list is quite cumbersome because you have to actually scroll like this let's give it a background also background is gonna be black as I just love black and the color of our font is gonna be white see how that changed yep so this is what it looks like now what if you do and say max height 
is equals to 500 or rather only 200 pixels yeah so that doesn't really do much so if you say overflow is auto you get a scrolling bar or you could say overflow is scroll let's remove this max height now you see we have these little scroll bars out here and that's what exactly overflow does it's basically shows us the items and you can scroll through them yeah basically like that so if you were to say that the width is only suppose 50 pixels let's say make this even smaller yeah so that's how it, now you have this little scroll bar and let's just scroll through stuff so that's how overflow works okay now let's look at some pseudo selectors or some pseudo classes that we can select and style so first of all let me open up the page that is going to be responsible for that so we have this page out here that i've created now it also has some new tags that you might be seeing these are some html5 tags so header tag nav tags and then the main tag these are just some new tags that you see in html5 and you can also target them through css3 so targeting them is pretty easy but what i want to show is something pretty cool let's save it first let's create a new page let's call it css right so let's save this first as page 5.css okay so now it's time to practice some more css and we'll be doing it on this page that i've created so this page is kind of a big page to be honest it has quite a lot of paragraphs quite a lot of links a few images also i guess and they use a lot of the HTML5 tags that have been newly introduced like the header tag, the nav ID, or the nav tag, the main tag, we have section tags, and a lot of other tags like these. Now these tags can also be selected with the help of let's say CSS3, that's what we are learning. Okay, now let me just remove this part because we won't be needing that. Now let's go ahead and save our content and let me just show you what this actually looks like on the web page. So let's go ahead and open up page 5 and this is what it looks like on a web browser rather without any CSS attached to it. So let's transform this thing with the help of some CSS. So firstly we've created this page called page5.css and we've already attached it to this page out here with the link tag and the href attribute. Now let's get started. So first of all let me just actually make use of some pseudo selectors. So we have already discussed pseudo selectors while going over the basics. Now let me just show you how they work. So a hover is going to target all the a links while we are hovering over them. Now when we are hovering over them we want the background to become black and text to become white. Right so let's save it. Let's reload. Now if we hover over these the background becomes black and the text becomes white. Right now the same thing can be done with a lot of other selectors like this active so when you click on a link that means it's going to turn like that so let's save it let's see let's reload our page first of all now you see when we hover nothing happens but once we click it it becomes that black and white kind of thing right we can also do this for visited and that will actually change the link when once it's been visited so if we go and do this open link in new tab well, it's not working out here, but if there was actually a database connected, you would actually see this to them. Now, suppose we want to select our body. Let's give it a background first of all. Get out the color picker. Let's give it a nice green background. Okay, now that's going to be our background for the body. Now, we also have a div with the ID of wrapper. So, let's go ahead and select that first. So, we say wrapper. Now let's give it some CSS. So we're going to say margin is going to be zero and auto. Now whenever you say zero, you do not need to actually specify the units. So we can just do that. We'll give it a background color of white. Then we'll give it a width of around 800 pixels. We'll give it a height of around 1000 pixels. Okay, now let's save that and let's see what it looks like now. So this is what it has turned to. Now we can also do some more stuff so let's select some HTML5 elements like the header tag and let me just show you that CSS still works as we want it to. So let's give it some simple padding around uh, 0 pixels on the top, 0 pixels on the right and we want to give some 10 pixels on the bottom and 0 pixels on the left too. See what changes. Now we got that little change. We can also select stuff like with the IDs as I just showed you. Now let's select the navigation which has the ID of horse nav. Let me just check if I'm right. 
yep it's called horse nav with the n being capital now we can say stuff like so there's also the display attribute this shows how elements will be displayed now they can be blocked or inline block which means it'll be converted into an inline element now we could say display is blocked and you could just give it some background just to make it more apparent so let's give it a background color of black and make the color white let's see yep that's how it's selected now you can also give a uh, pseudo tags like this one out here like visited to IDs too so let's say once we are hovering over the nav bar we want this to happen so let's save it now if we only hover over it will the change happen so that's how that works now let's go over and see some word spacing now word spacing is used for mostly specifying the words so let me just remove some stuff from here first of all let's remove all this right let's remove the header tags and we just need this part where we have all these paragraphs so I'll be targeting the first paragraph to show you all word spacing so it's gonna be this one out here right here fine let's save it go ahead here reload the page now this is what it looks like let's remove everything that we have already created and let's just select para 1 I hope that's what it was called out here so it is called para 1 indeed now we can go word spacing and just say let's say let's give it 10 pixels between the words right so the spacing between these words in this paragraph should change now now that we've saved it let's go ahead and reload so yeah now you can see that the word spacing for this this out here is much more different now we can also do letter spacing the same way so let's select paragraph 2 for that so for letter spacing all we have to say is letter spacing and then we could say something like 10 pixels now this will specify the letters and how they are spaced now you can see it looks this horrible thing is having 10 pixels of letter spacing it also put some word spacing into this so let's see how that looks like let's put a word spacing of 20 pixels and make this even more ugly yep so that's what it would look like with word spacing and letter spacing so that was just for experimentation purposes and you can use that whenever you feel free to okay so another property that I want to make you all aware of that is in CSS is a clear property so the clear property makes sure that nothing actually appears before it so in this case the footer tag which is right about here which says only the copyright part now it is shown here this is the footer tag that we're talking about so we want to say something like let's say so you can say clear and both so that's how you specify clears okay so let's give it a background color of black let's also say the color of the text will be white just to make it a bit more prominent yeah so nothing actually appears before that so that's how you use clear now so there's also style types also list style types so let me just see we have these lists out here first of all which says random one two three random one two three now let's say first of all let's convert this into an unordered list so find all let's gonna replace that with unordered list right I just want to show it with unordered list first so let's say let's select all the ULs and let's say list style is gonna be none now if you see out here we have these bullet points and now we don't okay so you can also do these with ordered lists so let's go back and let's do control and ul find all let's select them let's make them ols ordered lists let's see now ol doesn't work with list type none if you just realized now we can do something like alpha lower alpha so let's see that how that works okay so for lower alpha we have to say list style type please remember that that was my mistake right now okay if you have to select the ols again now you see that we have these list types that is saying with small caps now there are other stuff like lower latin also lower latin so let me just show you what that looks like save it okay that doesn't really change because i don't think i have latin installed but we can also go greek there's a bunch of stuff that you can do and it's pretty fun so i have greek installed now it goes alpha beta gamma instead of abc and that's how you can change stuff you can also change the position of the list style so list style position you could say outside so let's see what that means and doesn't really change much out here but that's one of the properties that I just wanted to show 
Okay, now you can also place contents before an element. So let me just show you how to do that. Let's clear all of these things now. So let's say we want to select power one and say, so this is going to be a pseudo selector again. So you say after, you say content, and your content is going to be, let's say, at the rate. So all these at the rates are going to be before this little thing out here so let me just show you the change yep so since we said after it has all these attributes after but if we say before this is how it'll change so now it's all before them right okay now let's go ahead and see how we can use the nth child elements so for that we're gonna select our ul again actually let me go ahead and delete everything first of all Okay, so let me create another HTML boilerplate and this is going to be called list. First of all, let's say we have an unordered list with a bunch of list items. So allies all around. Let me just copy that down and paste it a few times. Right, so now we have all these list items here. Let's just fill them up with some random text. Okay, so let's just say something random like cats. So let's save this. Let's go out here. Now we have these things called cats. Okay, so what if we want them to have alternate paragraphs? I mean alternate background colors. So first of all, let's go ahead and select the allies and give them a background. Let's say this gray color that I have selected, F7, F7, F7. Now you see we have, okay, this doesn't seem to be working. Allies. Looks like I've deleted my link tag. That's why the CSS was not working. So let's see. Now we have that. Okay, so first of all, let's go back and change this to F7, 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 right? This will give it this gray color that you see out here. Let's also give it the width of around 360 pixels. So that'll bring it there. Let's also give it a margin of 100 pixels from the top and equal on the side. Let's bring it to the center. Right, now suppose you want to say li nth child and you could say something like do n so this will select all the even childs and you could say they have a background color of white so let's see how that changes things for us now you see that all these things out here have an alternating background color where it's gray white gray white gray white and that's how you select all the even childs now you could also select the first child by saying first child for that we do not really need this two n counter and now only the first is black you could also say last child and now the last will be white and that's how stuff changes with css okay now you can also change the first line so let's go ahead and change our html up a bit so let's create a paragraph and it's gonna have some lorem ipsum in it so let me just show you something really cool let's delete all of this stuff let's select our paragraph and we're gonna say the pseudo selector called first line and let's say text transform uppercase so let's reload that first of all let me just comment this out just to show you what the page looks like without any css so this is our page without any css and let me uncomment this now save it and there you go the first line has been completely made uppercase now instead of first line you could also say last line last line and that will transform the last line to uppercase you could also say something like first letter and okay so just to show you that it does indeed work let me just reload this without any css first okay now you see that the lorem ipsum begins with the lowercase l now let me just uncomb this out save it and now you see that the first thing is a capital you could also change it to say stuff like text size or rather font size and say around 100 pixels now the first letter will be 100 pixel big and that's how you can do stuff like that okay so another thing is you can also change the pointer or the cursor so let's see when you're hovering over a paragraph let's say p and hover first of all we want the background to become black we also want the color to become white and we want the cursor to become a pointer so let's see so when you're hovering over it, it becomes this hand-like thing. And when you go out, it becomes back to normal. So that's how you can change the cursor also.
Now let me show you all something called a box shadow first of all. So let's remove this cursor part. So without the cursor it looks something like this. Let's remove the hover tag. So that's always there. Right. Okay, now let's also change this to that gray color that I really like. And let's also change this to black. So this is what it looks like now. Let's give it a width of around 400 pixels. So this is what it looks like. Now let's also center it so that I can show you some cool stuff. So margin, let's say zero and auto. So this is gonna center it from the top of the screen. Now that it's centered. Okay, so this is what our thing looks like. Now suppose we were to give it a border. So borders are really neat. So 2px solid black. So this is what a border looks like. But there are other stuff also, like a box shadow. So this is how box shadow works takes three parameters so one is z x and y axis and not really in that order it's x y and z axis and then it also takes a color so let me just show you how that happens so suppose we say 0 x 0 y and let's say three pixels on the z axis rather five pixels to make it more prominent and then it takes an rgba of 0 we want to make it really really invisible so 0 0.5 so that gives it a half opacity now you can see this really neat little shadow going all across our content so that is what box shadow does it's a neat little trick for when you don't want to use a border or something like that now other than borders there's also outline let's say an outline is black in color so outline completely negates our box shadow and you could also say outline equals none so let's remove that now because box shadow looks really neat yep okay so now let's talk about text decorations so since we have some text already going up let's decorate it now there are a few kinds of text decoration that I want to show so the text decoration let's say so first say is line through Just so put a line through all of the content so now it's all strike through you can also say something like overline or underline so let's see that underline will underline our text yep and overline as you might have guessed well overline our text now everything has a line on top of it fine now we can also set the visibility of our text or any other tag to be honest visibility so let's check out all the other visibilities that are there so do that always go on Google and type visibility and CSS and let's see the visibility property and how it goes so you must understand that knowing everything in CSS is kind of impossible. So you should always have a go-to or a backup. So my backup is normally W3School and they have everything regarding CSS and its properties. These are all the properties that you want to go through. And I'm mostly going through the most important ones in this tutorial that you may use in your day-to-day -day projects and topics. But sometimes you might need the rare ones like counter reset, empty cells, flex, flex bases and all these stuff. And you can always go back to W3 schools and go through them. Now you can say visibility is visible or something like that. And it should make it visible. Yeah. Right. So that was all about the miscellaneous types of CSS that we were handling. Now let's go ahead and see some gradients and how we can create some beautiful gradients using CSS. Okay. Now before we move on to gradients, let me just show you some white spaces or some more text transformations, right? So I already showed you all these text transformations. There's capitalize, there's lowercase, there's overline, line through, uppercase and underline. Now capitalize will just capitalize it. So I don't think I'm gonna show that to you guys. Now let's close these two pages out here. Let's create our new CSS file. And first of all, let's set this to CSS. Let's save it and let's say it's going to be page6.css. Now out here, if you see, we have a bunch of white spaces, right? Now let's see how you can handle white spaces using CSS. So there is a thing called the ID called white space pre. I think that's exactly what it's called, white space pre. Yep, let's select that. And you could say white space is pre. Let's see how that changes stuff. So first of all, let me load up page 6 for you guys. Right, let's remove the CSS, save it, let's reload it again. And what we are actually targeting is this part. White space will be preserved. Right, so white space will be preserved. Now, go ahead, uncomment that, save it, and let's reload. 
Now see the white spaces that are in the HTML is preserved. Now white spaces can also be handled in other ways. So there are two things that I want to show. So let's select this thing called never wrap. Never wrap, right? And we say that the white space is gonna be no wrap. So let's see how that works. So first of all, this is what we are actually targeting, this Laura Mipson part out here. And it's somewhat like this, and let's see how it changes now. And now you see that it goes completely out to here, so no wrap. It doesn't wrap it around. So you also have pre-wrap. So let me just show you how that works. So I'm gonna be targeting this part out here with these weird kind of fight spacing. So let's see. Preserve wrap. So with preserve wrap, we go pre-wrap out here. And that's the property. So let's see, yep. Lorem Ipsum and the wrap has been preserved. Okay, now you can also set up the direction. So let me just show you how that's done. So we're gonna select these two things out here, left, right, and right, left. So hash, left, right, and also control C, and let's make this right, left. Fine, let's remove all this stuff for now. And let's move everything before right left too. Now that we've removed that, let's remove this. Let's save it, let's see. Okay, so this is what it looks like right now. And all you have to say is direction is L to R. So that means left to right. Now here you say direction is RTL. Let's see how that changes stuff. So I prefer right to left and I prefer left to right. So that's how it's working. Fine. So that was all about white spacing and directions. Now let's move on to gradients and animations. So this is going to be the last part and the most interesting part in my opinion. So gradients are those beautiful backgrounds you see on most websites. And to generate your gradient, you can always use this thing called a gradient generator. So this gradient generator out here is a really nice gradient generator. You have to select the direction and you select the ending colors. So I've already selected a gradient out here. It's gonna create this gradient. Now let's see, go to page seven. Right, now let's select the body tag. Let's close this off, let's close this off. I want to save this and let's create a new page first of all. And this is gonna be our CSS. So we have to save it and say page seven, right. Now we select our body and just paste in. So let me just explain how this happens. So there's a linear gradient and there's also another thing called radial gradient. So I'll just show you that. Now this takes in a few parameters. The first is to the right, that's direction. And this is how the colors will change. So let's just see how that works. So first of all, let me comment this out. Let me just open page seven for you. Now if you see, it's gonna be a blank page. Okay, this is a gradient, I'm sorry. Let me save that. Right, so this is where it looks without a gradient, and you already saw where it looks with a gradient, but let me just show it to you again. This is where it looks with a gradient. Now you can also set the background with other stuff, like a uh, image. So for that, you go URL, and you can paste in the URL. So let's go and search for a beautiful image. I really like Dragon Ball Z, so Goku Super Saiyan 3. So that should be a good image to save as a background. So let's see, this looks like a really nice image. So you go here. Let me just save this image as, so this is going to be Goku, and it's going to be saved in desktop and in CSS tutorial, Goku.jpeg, right, so you could say Goku.jpeg, right, now that's saved, let's go back to our page, and it should have a picture of Goku, okay, so that didn't work, I think I got something wrong, let's go and analyze that, let's open up our CSS tutorial, Okay, so it's a JPG file and not JPEG, so that was our mistake, small mistake nonetheless. And now we have this picture of Goku. Now you can also set the background repeat. Let's close this off, say background repeat, and you could say no repeat, and it will not repeat the background anymore. Or you could say background repeat is gonna be, let's check out all the background repeats that are actually available. Now background, and repeat. So if you go into background repeat and see the properties, you can just try it yourself. So you can repeat it according to the Y axis, you can repeat it according to the X axis. So let's see how that works. So repeat X. 
So if we say that, I think it should repeat it on the x-axis like it was or you could repeat it on the y-axis. I don't think that will show about here but let's see. Yep, it's now repeating on the y-axis. So that's how background repeat also works so we've covered that too. Now we've also covered the gradients. Now it's time we do some radial gradient. Now if you remember, let me just go back to the gradient part. So if you have a radial gradient all you have to say is that it's a radial gradient out here and a radial gradient doesn't really need direction because it's going to be radial save it page and let's reload it okay now we have a gradial radial now you see all these lines going in but if I just zoom out you can see that it starts from the center and spreads out where it's white on the sides and white on the sides so that's how radial gradients work Okay, so now that we've covered the gradients, let's go into animation. So, I think animation is the most interesting thing that you can do with CSS. So, we have selected the div. So, first of all, let's give the div a border. Mm, so, this border is going to be 2 pixels, solid, and black. Now, let's give it a background to begin with. Let's say it's going to be of red. Now this is how you do animations in CSS. Okay, so before animations actually, let me show you how you can move this thing around. Fine, so there's some stuff that I want to show you guys. So let this be. Let me just show you what this looks like. So let me give this a width first. It's going to be four, um, 100 pixels or rather 200 pixels and the height will also be 200 pixels now let's see okay we have this div out here let's make it a little bigger give it 500 and 500 save it yep let's also make this much more prominent let's give it a 10 pixel background I mean a 10 pixel border and now you see we have a really prominent square out there now let's try some really interesting stuff so let's say div and when we hover over the div you want to scale this so scale and let's say you want to scale okay so that's not how you scale first you say transform and how do you want to transform you want to scale it and you want to scale it twice so when we hover over it it should scale twice let's reload and as you see it's scaling twice now we can also transform some other stuff like this so we can rotate so we can say rotate 45 degrees let's see when I hover it's rotating 45 degrees you can also skew it so skewing is how it works let's see you can skew it 20 degrees to the x-axis and 10 degrees to the y-axis save it and this is how it gets skewed this is how skewing works you can also translate stuff so this is let me show you how translation works so translate and let's see you want to translate it 20 pixels and 20 pixels so let's see hover over it and it translates a little it's translated around 120 pixels just to make it more clear 120 and 120 let's save that let's reload this and you see that now it's translating so much right so that's how translate works okay now that I've showed you scale rotation skewing and translate let's see we can also set up the transitions so with transitions you can set up a lot of stuff so now that we're done with transitions, let's go ahead and see some animation. So for animation, I'm going to be actually targeting this div out here. So let's actually style this div. I've given it the width of 100 pixels and a height of 100 pixels, and a background of red and a border of 3 pixels, solid and black, let's say. Right? Let's see what that looks like. Now that's what it looks like. Fine. Let's zoom in a bit. Now, all we need to do is actually set up some keyframes. So we do that by saying keyframes. Now we name our keyframes, let's call it anime. And we have to set up actually what it will look like at different points in time. So we do that by saying 0% and it'll have, let's say, a background color of red and then it'll move no, so we want to move it in the square so let's say it'll be not padding rather there'll be zero pixels from the left and from the top it's gonna be zero pixels let's save that copy that down let's paste that a bunch of times now what I want to say is this is gonna be 25 it's gonna be 50 
it's going to be 75 and this is going to be 100 let's save that let's change their colors so this is going to be yellow first then changes to green some pretty basic colors blue then and in the end we'll change it to red so that brings us back to the original position let's first also move it by 300 pixels then let's move it 300 pixel both ways now it's only going to move 300 pixel this way and in the end it comes back to the original position now to use this keyframes animation we have to give this animation name it's going to be using the animation with the keyframes name anime now we can say the animation delay is going to be 2 seconds you can also say how many times it's going to be iterating so you can say that by 100 let's save that okay so our animation is not working because we haven't set the positioning so now let us just save this and let's say our position is going to be relative let's save that let's uncomment our animation now you see that our animation will work as we intended it to so after two seconds our animation starts working and this will just keep going on and on now if you want to actually repeat that animation there's a way you can do that and that is with the animation iteration count let's say you want to iterate it a hundred times let's reload let's wait for two seconds and voila our animation will keep going on and on and on so that's how you animate stuff with CSS guys So what is JavaScript? Now the first thing that pops into your head is probably it is Java. So guys, let me tell you that JavaScript has absolutely nothing to do with Java. So why was it named JavaScript? Well, it was sort of a marketing strategy. When JavaScript was first released, it was called Mocha. It was later renamed to LiveScript and then to JavaScript when Netscape and Sun did a license agreement. Now let's not get into the details of that. Now what is JavaScript? In simple terms, JavaScript is the language of the web. So basically every browser, PC and mobile phone understands JavaScript. It's like a universal language. So what is JavaScript used for? It is used to make web pages more interactive. Let me tell you that majority of websites use JavaScript and all major web browsers have a JavaScript engine to execute it. Another feature is that it's an interpreted language, which means that it doesn't have to be compiled like languages such as C and Java. This makes it a lot easier for us because we can just run our code and we don't have to run it through a compiler. Now, another important feature of JavaScript is that it is mainly a client-side scripting language. Thanks to JavaScript frameworks, you can now run JavaScript even on the server side. So let me tell you a few more things about JavaScript. So where does JavaScript run? JavaScript runs on a browser. So all you need to do is open up your Google Chrome or your Internet Explorer and start running your JavaScript. All right. So how do these browsers run JavaScript? So these browsers have a JavaScript engine embedded into them. Now this engine will just convert your JavaScript into machine language and then run the code. All right. Moving on. We all know that there are hundreds of programming languages and new languages are being created every single day. And among these, there are very few powerful programming languages that bring about big changes in the market. And let me tell you that JavaScript is definitely one of them. JavaScript has always been in the list of popular programming languages and developers are falling in love with this language. They practically use it everywhere. They use it on the web, mobile servers, applications, and even in IoT. Now, this is probably why it's the most popular language in the world. According to Stack Overflow, for the sixth year in a row, JavaScript has remained the most popular and commonly used programming language. Now let's look at a few common applications of JavaScript. So what can JavaScript do? JavaScript is known mainly for creating beautiful web pages and web applications. An example of this is Google Maps. So if you want to explore a region or a specific area in Google Maps, all you have to do is click and drag with the mouse. And what sort of language could do that? You guessed it, it's JavaScript. Next, JavaScript is also used in smartwatches. An example of this is the popular smartwatch maker called Pebble. Pebble has created Pebble.js, which is a small JavaScript framework which allows a developer to create an application for the Pebble line of watches in JavaScript. So a lot of developers have actually built smartwatch applications, features, and such things using the JavaScript. Up next, we have websites. Now, let me tell you that most of the popular websites like Google, Facebook, Netflix, and Amazon 
make use of JavaScript to build their websites. I think that's enough proof for why you should be learning JavaScript. Now, among other things like mobile applications, digital art, web servers, and server applications, JavaScript is also used to make games. Isn't that amazing? Now, we're all aware that the browser has not been a traditional games platform, but recently it has become a robust host for games. A lot of developers are building small scale games and applications using JavaScript, and I'm sure all of you can do it too. It's quite simple. Now let's talk about some popular JavaScript frameworks, which are the most favored platforms for developers and business in today's time. AngularJS is Google's web development framework that has exploded with popularity in recent years. AngularJS provides a set of modern development and design features for rapid application development. Let me tell you that a lot of developers swear by this framework because it has a rapid development pace. Another top JavaScript framework is a react JS. It stands behind the user interface of Facebook and Instagram showing off its efficiency in maintaining such high traffic applications. Despite the fact that react has a higher learning curve, it makes application development straightforward and easy to understand. It also performs very good in search engine optimization. So guys, by now all of you are aware that JavaScript is used as a universal scripting language in browsers, mainly on the client side. Using it on the back end to save time and build expertise is one of the major ideas behind the Meteor. So finally, front end developers can also work on the back end comfortably with Meteor without switching context between Java, Python, PHP and whatnot. So it basically gives the flexibility to use one language everywhere. I'm sure you all have heard of jQuery before. Whenever someone wants to extend their website or their application and make it more attractive and interactive, they make use of jQuery. Now this library transforms the whole web into an entertaining experience. A fun fact about jQuery is that over 70% of the world's leading websites have something to do with jQuery. Companies like WordPress, Google and IBM rely on jQuery to provide a one of a kind web browsing experience. Now, anybody who's heard of JavaScript knows that it has something to do with HTML and CSS. So what is this relationship between these three? Now, let me put it down to you in simple words. Now, think of HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language, as a skeleton of the web. So basically, HTML is used for displaying the web. Next, CSS is like our clothes. We put on fashionable clothes to look better. Similarly, the web is quite stylish. It uses CSS, which stands for cascading style sheets to look better or for styling purpose. Then there is JavaScript. Now JavaScript puts life into a web page. Just like how kids move around using the skateboard, the web also motions with the help of JavaScript. So JavaScript is basically for interacting with the web. Now before getting into the advantages of JavaScript, let's look at a few common websites that are building the JavaScript and JavaScript frameworks. So we have Amazon, which is an e-commerce website. I'm sure all of you have shopped from here. Then there's PayPal, there is YouTube. We all are addicted to YouTube. There's eBay, Netflix, and Reddit. So guys, this is enough proof that JavaScript is a very important language. When such reputed companies and brands make use of JavaScript, it means that it has something really nice about it or something very advantageous about it. With this in mind, let's look at a few benefits of JavaScript. Now it's quite easy to learn. In fact, it's one of the simplest programming languages. It does not have a strict syntax and it's totally readable. You don't have to be some hardcore programmer to learn JavaScript. Let me tell you that it is a weak type language, unlike the strong type programming languages like Java and C++, which have strict rules for coding. Now the next feature is speed. Guys, it's all about being faster in today's world. And since JavaScript is mainly a client side programming language, it is very fast because any code functions can run immediately instead of having to contact the server, send a request, get an acknowledgement, and then wait for an answer. All right. Now, JavaScript comes with a rich set of frameworks like Node.js, AngularJS, React, and there are hundreds of such frameworks. Earlier in the session, I discussed about how efficiently these frameworks are used to build web applications, server applications, and perform different tasks. JavaScript framework is one of the major reasons behind the popularity of JavaScript. Now, the next advantage is that it makes web pages more interactive. 
So guys, we are all attracted to beautifully designed and interactive websites and JavaScript is the reason behind such attractive websites. Building such interactive websites not only makes the web prettier, it also attracts leads and customers to e-commerce websites. So like I mentioned earlier, JavaScript is an interpreted language that does not require a compiler because the browser interprets the JavaScript. So all you need is a browser to run JavaScript and you can do all sorts of stuff in your browser without the pain of setting up environments, code editors, downloading compilers and then learning how to use them. So instead of all of this, you can just open up your browser and start running JavaScript. So among many other advantages is the fact that JavaScript is platform independent. JavaScript is supported by all browsers like Internet Explorer, Mozilla, Firefox, Google Chrome, Safari, etc. So any JavaScript enabled browser can understand and interpret JavaScript code so you can run it on any platform. All right, so now that you have a good idea about what JavaScript is and how it works, let's get on with the coding part. I'm going to cover a few basic programming concepts of JavaScript and these concepts are quite similar to the C language. So let's get started. So guys, let me tell you that every browser has a JavaScript engine and we can easily write JavaScript code over here without any editors or tools. So this practice is not meant for real world applications, but I'll just quickly show it to you. All right. Open up your browser, Internet Explorer or Google Chrome will also do and right click on the page. Click on inspect. So this will open up the Chrome's developer page. All right. Now go to console. This is basically the JavaScript console. Now let's see how to run JavaScript on the browser itself. So let me just type a statement and then I'll explain what it does. Now, basically, this is a statement in JavaScript. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to log this message. Hello world onto the console. All right, so I'm going to log hello world onto the console. That's what this function does. Okay, now this hello world is enclosed within brackets and within quotation marks. And in JavaScript, we always practice to terminate our statements with a semicolon. Now let's press enter. So here you can see that it's displaying hello world. All right, so this means that JavaScript works on a console. So this is how browsers are embedded with JavaScript engine so that they can run JavaScript code. Now to write JavaScript code, you require a code editor. You can choose from a variety of options like Visual Studio Code, Sublime Text and so on. But for today's demo, I'll be using the Visual Studio Code, but feel free to use whichever editor you want. Visual Studio Code is basically a simple light weighted editor. And guys, I'll leave a link in the description box. If you want to download the Visual Studio Code, you can go ahead and check the description box. All right, so I've already downloaded the Visual Studio Code. Now let's create a folder. Okay, we'll create a new folder to store the code that we'll be executing. So create a new folder. You can name it whatever you like. Now just drag this folder and drop it over here. All right. So here you can see the folders created. Now we've got the folder open. Let's add a new file index.html to this folder. Now you don't need to know HTML to follow this tutorial. I'm just pasting a basic HTML code here. You don't have to care about this code. It's just for creating a simple web page. All right. Now over here, I'm just using a header in order to display JavaScript tutorial. And then within paragraph tags, I'm just displaying with Edureka. All right, you don't need to have a knowledge about HTML for this tutorial. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use this HTML page as a host for our JavaScript code. All right, now make sure to save the changes. Now open up extensions tab over here. This is the extensions tab. Now search for live server. So guys, I've already installed the live server, but make sure you go ahead and install this right away. Live server is basically a lightweight web server that we're going to use to serve our web application. All right, install this and restart your Visual Studio Code. Once you open Visual Studio Code, go to your index.html file. Okay, and right click on this. And now you can see this option open with live server. You're going to get this option only after you install live server. So make sure you do that first. So open with live server. Yeah, you can see this page. The HTML page is over here. Now you can even check the console from here. This is the JavaScript console. All right. So this will just open up uh, your default browser and direct it to this address. 
all right now this address is where our application is served from okay so here you can see the console as well now let's write our first javascript code so go back to visual studio okay now guys let me tell you that there are two ways of adding your javascript code in the html file first of all you need to know that your javascript code is always written in the html file or it is at least linked to the html file okay so like i said there are two ways of adding your javascript code in the html file now the first is to use script tags in the body section and type your javascript code within this script tag so let me show you how that's done now this is the body section the body section starts here and it ends here okay so you have to make sure that your script tags are within the body section now let's open script tags now in the first method you're going to type your entire java script over here so within the script tags you're going to type your entire java script so let's just type a simple line so we executed this earlier let's just do that let's log a message to our console all right so let it be hello we'll see if this works guys don't forget to terminate a statement with a semicolon all right now save the file and open up your browser here you can see that it's displayed hello all right this means it works now let's go and try the second method now in real world application the javascript code will have hundreds and thousands of lines and it is not a good practice to type your entire code over here all right so what we can do is we can open up a new file from the explorer window all right let's go here open up a new file let's name it hello.js all right it's a javascript file now what we'll do is we'll copy this code and let's paste it over here now you have to reference this hello.js file in your html file so how do you do that okay so let's add an attribute over here this attribute is src all right src stands for source now src equal to within the quotation marks we're going to write down the name of the javascript file so hello.js is the name of my javascript file let's close the tags okay wait this is opened up again okay yeah let's close the tags and this is the second way so we're basically referencing hello.js from the html file okay now let's save the changes here and now let's check our browser yeah you can see that it's printing hello so both the methods work so i hope you understood that there are two ways of adding your javascript code to your html file the first way is to write the entire code within script tags and the second way is to reference a javascript file in your html file so guys i hope you have a brief idea about how javascript works and how you can use your browser to run javascript okay so now let's get on with our javascript fundamentals i'm going to discuss variables constants and a few other concepts over here okay so what are variables variable is a name given to a memory location which acts as a container for storing data now what does this mean let's say that i want to define a variable called name and i want to store a name in it let's say the name is edureka okay so i'm going to declare a variable called name and i'm going to store edureka in that variable so name is the name of the variable and edureka is the value of this variable okay so what's happening here is a temporary memory location is assigned to the name variable and this name variable is going to contain a value which is edureka okay now let's perform this practically so that you understand it better which is constants so what are constants constants are fixed values that do not change during execution time now there are times when we don't want the value of a variable to change because it might disrupt the whole workflow in such situations we make use of constants instead of variables okay now here you can see the syntax of constants now in order to declare a constant you use the keyword const all right you use this keyword now let's practically do this and see how it works all right so i'm going to create a new file to do this i'll name it constant okay now let's declare a variable so for declaring a constant variable make sure that you use const keyword okay so i'm declaring a constant variable here now uh, let's say it's pi okay i'm going to assign a value to pi 3.14 now what happens if you try to change the value of a constant variable let's try to do that okay we change the value now let's okay let's log this to the console save the changes 
and make sure you change the path in the HTML file. So here it's still linked to variable.js. Change it to constant.js if you're creating a new file that is. All right. Now since the change is here as well. Now open up your browser. Here you can see type error assignment to constant variable. All right. This error is because we tried to change the value of the constant variable. It was declared as constant using the value 3.14 and then we try to change it to 3.12. That's why we have the error. So guys, you use constant variables only when you want to keep the value of a certain variable fixed. All right, it cannot change. So that's when you use constants. OK, I hope you all are clear. Let's get on with our next topic. OK, primitive data type. Now, guys, there are different types of values that you can assign to a variable. All right. Now in JavaScript, we have two categories of data types. One is primitive data type and the other is reference data types. Now primitive data types include numbers, strings, boolean, null and undefined. Reference data type on the other hand includes objects, arrays and functions. All right. So now let's look at these primitive data types from Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to create a new file again. Give it any name you like. All right. So for this you'll have to define a variable. Now to define a variable you use the let keyword. This is the name of my uh, variable. Now in this I'm going to store the value Harry Potter. All right, terminated with a semicolon. So guys here it's a string because we are using quotation marks. We're enclosing the value within quotation marks. So the computer is going to consider this as a string. So even if I had let's say if I have something like this. What do you think this is? Do you think this is a string or do you think it is a number? OK, let's check. All right. Now let's log this on our console and see. Let's log age as well as. Let's log name. Save the changes. Make sure you change the reference over here. All right, so it's constant. Let's change it to primitive. Save the changes here as well. Open up your browser. So it's displaying the two values. OK, now let's check the type of these variables type of age. It's a string even though it is one over here. It's still a string. Why is that? That is because we enclose this one within quotations. So whatever is enclosed within quotations is going to be considered as a string. All right, so we discussed numbers and strings so far. Let's look at Boolean. Let's define a variable called option. OK. So basically guys a boolean is used whenever uh, there is a logical situation or a logic code that needs to be executed. So if a particular condition is met or if a particular condition is true, then the following code will be executed. In such situations you make use of boolean and boolean can have only two values true or false. So this is a boolean. Now the next type of data type is undefined. Now what is undefined? I'll show you. Let's define a variable height. Now let's log both of these variables and we'll see the type of these variables. OK, so option. Then let's also log height. Save your changes. Open up your browser. Here you can see true and you can see undefined. Instead of printing anything, it says undefined. Why do you think that is? It's because we've defined height without initializing it at all. So we have not set it to any number or any value. That's why it's undefined. So this is an undefined data type. So if you don't initialize a data type, it's called undefined. OK, now the last one is null. Now let me show you an example. All right, so here I'm just uh, defining a variable called eye color and I'm setting it to null. Now we use null whenever we want to explicitly clear the value of a variable. OK, that's when we use null. So I hope you guys are clear with the primitive data types. Now let's move on to our next topic arrays. So what are arrays? Arrays are basically used to store multiple values in a single variable. So if you have a list of items, let's say that you went shopping for some art supplies and you got a paintbrush, you got a canvas, you got some palette, you got pencils and you got spray paint. Now you want to list these down in one variable. Now to understand this better, let's go to Visual Studio Code and let's execute some code. So add a new file called array. I'm going to define an array called shopping. All right. Now in order to define a variable, you'll have to use the let keyword and you'll have to 
use this square brackets over here. This is how you define an array. Okay. Now square brackets are because you have to store multiple values in an array. So an array is basically used to show multiple values of a single variable. Okay. So shopping is a variable. It has multiple values. Now let's define the values in the shopping variable. So the first value, let's say it's paint brush. I'm going to add a comma and add another value. A comma is needed to separate two values. Okay. Let's add color palette. Add canvas. Okay. So we have three items in our shopping list. Now let's just log this on the console. Save your changes. Make sure you change the path in the HTML file array. All right. Save it. Open up your browser. Now here you can see that it's displaying the entire array. Now guys, let me tell you that arrays are numbered from zero. So zero is the first element. One is the second element. Two is the third element. Even though there are three elements in the array, the number of the last element is two. That's because you start numbering an array from zero. Okay. So guys, now how do you access an array element? Let's say you want to access color palette. You want to display color palette. How are you going to do that? Now in order to do that, you are going to write the name of the array and within square brackets, you're going to put the number of the array element. So if you want to display color palette, the number of color palette is one. So you're going to type one over here. Okay. Close the parenthesis semicolon enter. See it displays color palette. So this is how you access array elements. Okay. So if you want to access only one element, then just mention the number of that element and that element will get displayed. Now let's just play a little bit with arrays. Let's define a few other arrays. Let's see what else arrays can do. So let me show you another example. Now I'm defining an array called numbers. So guys, this is how you declare an array. You use the let keyword name of the array equal to square brackets and you terminate it with a semicolon. Okay. Now let's add array elements. So I'm going to randomly add some numbers. All right, these are my array elements. Now let's add two numbers and display them on the console. Okay, so how do you do that? So let's add one. Let's add this element and this element. All right, so how do you access this element? You just have to write the name of the array, open square brackets, and write the number of the array zero plus numbers at position one. So you're basically adding one and three. All right. Save the changes. Go to your browser. Here you can see the answer is four. All right. Now let's try some other thing. Let's try to sort these elements. For that you use a function called sort. Now sort is a predefined function. So this sort function is going to sort this array. All right. Save your changes. Let's look at the log. Yeah. So it's sorting this array in order one, two, three, four, five, seven. Now we know that six is missing here. So let's add an element to the array. So how do you add an element to the array? So first you type the name of the array dot push. All right. A push is a function which pushes an element to the array. All right. Now which element you want to push is going to be written within these parentheses. So six that's push. Okay. Now let's check the array save your changes go to your browser now there are seven elements all right so you can see six over here now guys let me show you another example now with arrays in javascript you can have variables with different data types in one array itself so a single array can have variables with different data types. let me explain this with an example so i'm declaring a array called mix all right now let's list out the elements of mix. So first I'm going to list out a string. Okay. Then a number. Then again a string. Okay. Now let's log this to our console and see what happens. Okay. So this is the mix array. So here you can see that it has four elements. Let's check the type of the first element. How do you do that? So you write the name of the array and you open up brackets and you write the number of the array 
which is zero. So this is a string, correct? Now similarly, let's check the type of the second element. This is a number. So now we know that within an array, we can have variables of different data types. Okay. All right, guys, with this, we are done with arrays. Now let's look at our next topic. Now our next topic is objects. Now what is an object? An object in JavaScript is a lot like an object in real life. For example, let's consider a girl. Okay. Now this girl has a name. She has an age. She has eye color. Let's say her name is Emily. Her age is 15 years old and she has brown eyes. So what did I just do? I basically declared an object, which was a girl and I list down her properties, which is her name, her age and her eye color. So girl is the object name, age, eye color are her property. So this is how an object works. Okay. Now what are objects? Objects are variables too, but they contain many values or many properties. Okay. And each property will have some value. Now let's look at this with an example. So guys, I'm going to create a new file called objects. Now, how do you declare an object? So I'm going to declare an object called pen equal to you're going to use curly brackets to define an object. Okay. As soon as you use these curly brackets, it means that you're creating an object called pen. Okay. And this object can store a lot of properties and each property will have some type. It's like key value pairs where key is a property value is a value of that property. So let's say that this pen has the first property of the pen is a type. Okay, so I'm going to write ballpoint. Now you separate different properties with a comma. Okay, now the second property is probably the color black. All right, now let's define another property called cost. Now know that over here I haven't enclosed 10 in quotation marks because this is a number. It's not a string. Okay guys remember that. So guys also terminate this with a semicolon. Now what did I do here? I created an object called pen. This pen has three properties. Okay. The three properties are type color and cost. Now the property type has the value ballpoint. Similarly the property color has the value black and the cost is 10. Okay. So this is how you define an object. So the object is a pen. It has three properties and values. What if I wanted to display the cost of this pen? I just want the cost of this pen, not the entire object. Okay, so how do you access an object? Now this is the syntax for accessing an object. Object name dot property name. Okay, now there is another way of accessing. This is known as the dot notation. And the other way is like this object name. You use square brackets within which you write the property name. All right, this is the other way. Now I honestly prefer the dot notation because I feel it's simpler. Okay, so now let's try to display the cost of the pen. Okay, so how do you do that? First you write the object name, which is pen dot the property name, which is color. Sorry, then the property name, which is cost. Okay. Now I want to display this. So I'm going to put this in the console dot log function. I'm going to put this in the console dot log statement. All right. Now save the file. Make sure you change the reference in the index or HTML. So change this to objects. Save this. Open up your browser. Here you can see it's displaying 10. Okay. So that's how you access object properties. Okay. Now let me show you another example of objects. Okay. So now let's define an object called Emily. Okay. Now this object has a few properties. So properties and the value of those properties because it's a number. I'm not putting it in quotation marks. Then let's define cool, which is another property. Say she goes to DPS. Then there is class. Let's say 10th standard. All right. Now the next property is subjects. Now I have more than one subject. That means I have more than one value to this variable. Now, how do I store more than one value in this variable? So guys, do you remember I spoke about arrays? Arrays are used to store multiple values of the same variable. So let's define this as an array. So this is how we define an array. Let's add physics. Now add comma after every value. So physics then chemistry. Let's add biology. 
sequence and maths. So don't forget to terminate this over here. Now oh, I've typed out the wrong spelling for physics. Okay. So guys, let's say I want to display chemistry. How would I do that? So how would I do this? So like I said, first you're going to write the object name dot the name of the property. Name of the property is subjects. Now this is an array element. So in subjects, we're going to access the second element. All right, the number of the second element would be one. Okay. Now in order to display this, let's put it in this statement. Now save your file, open up Chrome. All right, there is an error. What exactly is the error? Okay, guys, so the error is over here. I forgot to put a comma. So after every property, you're supposed to put a comma. So I forgot to put a comma here, and that was the error. Now let's save the file and let's open up our Chrome. So here you can see that it's displaying chemistry. Okay, so that's how it works. With this, we're done with the objects. Let's move on to our next topic. Now the next topic is functions. Functions are basic building blocks in JavaScript. It is basically a set of statements that perform some task. Now let's see this with a few examples. Let's go to our Visual Studio code. Now let's add a new file. I'm going to name it function.js. So how do you define or declare a function? So in order to declare a function, you have to use the keyboard function. Space the name of the function. So let's say hello. All right. Now, after this, you need to add parentheses. All right. And then curly braces. And within the curly braces, you're going to define the body of the function. Now, let's just say that this is just logging some message on the console, like hello. All right. Now, I've created a function for this. Now, let's call this function. So, how do you do that? You write the name of the function with the parentheses, and then you end it with a semicolon. Okay. Now save the changes. Make sure you add function over here in the HTML file. Save the changes here as well. Now here on the browser, you can see that it's printed hello. Okay. Now what's the point of this function? Let's do something better. Okay. Let's make a better function. Let's say we'll create a function for uh, multiplying uh, two variables. Okay. So let's say that we'll create a function for finding the product of two numbers. Okay. So for that, you use a keyword function. I'm going to name my function product. Now within these uh, parentheses, I'm going to declare two variables. Okay. Now these variables are called parameters. So I'm going to pass two parameters to my function. Now let me get on with it. You'll understand it better. Now what this function is going to return is the product of A and B. So A star B. All right. Now let's call this function. So how do you call a function name of the function? And over here you're going to pass the value of to these variables. Now these variables have not been given any value here. I just define these variables and they're just known as parameters. These variables are known as parameters. Okay, now let's pass some value to these variables. Let's pass two and six. Okay, and it with a semicolon. Now these values are known as arguments. Okay, so when you call a function, you pass arguments to that function. But when you define a function, you pass parameters to that function. Okay, let's save this and let's open our console. Wait a second. Yeah, I forgot to print it. Now let's store the product in some variable. Let's define a variable. Let's say X. Okay, so I'm storing my product in a variable called X. Now let's log this variable on my console save the changes go to your browser here you can see 12 all right so this is how you pass functions with different parameters okay next we have conditional statements now condition statements are used to perform different actions on different conditions so if is used to execute a block of code only if the condition is true okay so basically, if a condition is met, then the statements within this block will get executed. This is the syntax of the if statement. So basically, if is a keyword and within brackets, you're going to define the condition. Now, if this condition is met, then this statement is executed or a set of statement is executed. Okay, 
So this is how it works in the program and you start the program and when the execution comes to a condition, if the condition is true, the code within the if block gets executed. All right, and it ends there. But if the condition is false, you just exit from the if block. All right, let's look at this practically. So let's create a new file called if. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to define an array. Now let's add numbers into the array. So I'm randomly you want to add some numbers. Now let's add some condition over here. Now if here I'm going to define the condition which is number and zero is equal to equal to number at place two. Then just display some statement. All right. So let's see. Correct. OK, so what is happening here? Now I'm basically defining a condition within the if statement over here. And this is a statement that's going to get executed if this condition is met. So the condition is that the number at location zero, which is this number, if this number is equal to number at location two, which is this number. So if these two numbers are equal, then it's going to print out correct. All right. Now these equal to equal to sign is used for comparison. So it's used to check the value of this variable and value of this variable. If these two values are the same, then the condition is met. All right. Now let's save the changes we made here. Also remember to go to your HTML file, change the reference to if.js. Okay. Save the changes, go to your browser. Here you can see that it's displaying correct. Now this was the if conditional statement. Now where do I use the else statement? Now else is used to execute a block of code if the same condition is false. OK, so this is the syntax of if else. So if there's some condition there, if that condition is met, then this statement is executed. Now if this condition is not met, then if you want to do something else, you use the else statement. So when this is false, this will happen. OK, so instead of exiting, you're going to perform another operation. Let's look at the flow chart. When you're executing the condition and if the condition is true, you're going to execute the block of code within the if block. OK, now if the condition is false, you're not going to exit. Instead, you're going to execute another block of code, which is in the else if block. OK, now let's look at this practically. Now within the same file itself, I'm going to show you how this is done. Now let's define a condition if. Numbers. At this place is equal to equal to. Then it's going to print correct. Otherwise, now if this condition is false, then it's going to print this console dot log wrong. Try again. All right, that's simple. Let's see if this works. OK, save your file. Open up your browser. OK, there is some problem over here. Let's go back to the code. OK, my mistake. Save the file, open the browser, now it should work. Let's just comment this out, otherwise you'll get confused. I'll just write here, this is the if else block. If else example, all right? Let me save it. Open your browser. See, it says wrong, try again. So this is how the else statement works, all right? Now you can even play around with a few other examples. Let, let me show you a few other examples. Okay, now let's give two conditions within the if block. Okay, now let this be the first condition. So, how do you add another condition? You just use the and operator. Okay, let's add another condition over here. Okay, uh, I'm making a mistake here. The array name is numbers. So, I've added two conditions over here. Now, only if both of these conditions are met, this statement is going to be executed. OK. Else we are going to. Now let's save this. OK, we'll just comment this out so that you don't get confused. All right, so save the changes. Open up your console. OK, there is some error. So it's basically something I did while naming. So this is an error because I forgot to add an S everywhere. OK, now I'm saving the changes. This should work. OK, so it says wrong. Try again. Now this is wrong because both of these conditions weren't met. 
I'm using the and operator here. So it's compulsory that this condition is true and this condition is true. OK, so if you use the or operator here instead, this is the or operator. OK, if you use the or operator here instead, this should work. See, it displays correct. OK, or means that one even if one of these statements or one of these conditions is true, then this is correct. OK, so guys with that we are done with if else statements. Now let's move on to loops. So what are loops? Loops are basically used when you want to run the same code over again each time with a different value. So that's when loops are used. Now loops are of three kinds. There is for loop, there is while loop and there is do while loop. OK, now let's look at each loop one by one. So first we have the while loop. Now what happens here is while basically loops through a block of code as long as the specified condition is true. OK. So while this condition is true, this loop code is executed when you execute the condition and if the condition is true, the conditional code will get executed. Otherwise, if the condition is false, you're just going to end or you're going to exit from the loop. OK, now let's look at a practical example of this. So create a new file called while.js. So guys, before moving on to an example, let's discuss the do while loops also. A basically do while is just a variant of the while loop. Now this loop will execute the code block once before checking if the condition is true. Then it will repeat the loop as long as the condition is true. OK, so over here you can see the syntax within the do loop. You have some code. Now this code is executed once and only after that the condition is checked. Now if the condition is true, then you're going to execute it again. But if the condition is false, you're not going to execute it. But this code is definitely executed at least once. OK, that's the difference between do while and while. So the loop code is executed at least once in the do while loop. OK, now let's do this practically. Now let's define a variable i and initialize it to zero. OK, now within my while loop, I'm going to define a condition which is while i is less than five, it has to do this. Now the statement here is. It has to display this the number is and it has to display I OK, so plus I. And let's increment the value of I. OK, now let's save this. Now let's look at the while loop. Now within the while loop, I've defined a condition which says while I is less than five, it has to perform the following code. First, I've set I to zero. So then I is less than five, meaning zero is less than five. Now this is true, so it's going to execute these two statements. So it's just going to print the number is zero and then it's going to increment the value of I. So now I will become one over here. It will go back to this loop and it will check if one is less than five, which is true. So it will execute these two commands. Similarly, it'll keep going till I is equal to four. I is equal to four, it'll execute this. But when I becomes five, five is not less than five. So this will not be executed. OK, now let's just save this and let's change our path in the index.html to while. Save this as well. Open up your browser. See it prints till number four. Zero, one, two, three, four. OK, it is not print number five because five is not less than five. OK, now let's do the same thing using the do while loop. Now for the do while loop, first you're going to define the do block now over here. Let's copy paste this code over here. OK, now after the do loop, you're going to put the while condition. OK, so let's give the condition as I greater than five. Let's see what happens. OK, so what is going to happen here is first it's going to execute these two statements. OK, it's going to print the number is zero over here because we've initialized I to zero over here. OK, then it's going to increment I to one. OK, then it's going to come out of the loop and then it's going to check the condition is one greater than five. Now that is false, so it's going to end over here itself. OK, now let's just comment this out. So that you don't get confused. OK, we'll comment this whole thing out. Now save the changes, open up your browser. See the number is zero. It's printed only once. OK, now that's the difference between while and do while loop. Now next we have for loop. Let's look at for loop. So what is for loop? So for loop basically repeatedly executes the loop code while a given condition is true. 
So it tests the conditions before executing the loop body. Now here you can see the syntax of for loop. Within the for loop, there is a condition which is begin separated with a semicolon. Then there is condition semicolon and this step and then there is loop code. Okay. Now this begin statement is executed one time before the execution of this code block. Okay. So before this loop code is executed, this condition will be executed one. Okay. Now let's look at the syntax for the for loop. Now this for loop has three statements within the parentheses. Okay. Now begin is executed one time before the execution of this code. Okay. Now this condition defines a condition for executing this loop code. The next is the step. This is executed every time after the code block has been executed. Okay, so after this is being executed, this is executed. So guys, I know this is sort of confusing. Let's practically do this. You'll understand it better. So now I'm going to create a new file called for. Now let's declare a for loop. So use the keyword for and then you put the first statement or the first condition, which is i is equal to zero. Okay, now the next one is i is less than five. Next one is i plus plus. Make sure you separate these conditions or these statements with a semicolon. Okay, you have to put a semicolon over here. Now open up your loop code. Now within the loop code, just let's perform the same thing that we did in the while loop. All right, so the number is oh, we've actually forgotten to declare i over here. So let's declare i first. Let i so yeah, I've declared i over here. So guys, you don't have to declare it over here specifically. You can do that, of course, but you can just declare i over here itself. Let i is equal to zero. You're initializing i and you're declaring it. Okay. So what happens here is first i is equal to zero. You're defining a variable i and you're initializing it to zero. Once you initialize i to zero, it's going to execute this statement once. Okay, so it's going to execute this statement once. After that, it will go to this condition. Is i less than five? Is zero less than five? Which is true. So it's going to execute this statement. Okay. Now after this is executed, it's going to execute this third statement, which is i plus plus. Okay. So the value of i is going to become one, and the same thing is going to happen again and again. Let me explain this one more time. So first you're initializing i to zero. When you execute the first statement, this code block is executed once. All right. After this, it checks this condition is i less than five. If the condition and only if the condition is true, this statement will get executed. Now after this statement is executed, this third statement over here will get executed. All right. I hope that is clear. Let's save the changes. And let's also change the reference over here. All right. Save the changes here as well. Yeah, here you can see that it's displaying it five times. Okay. So that is how for loop works. Okay. Now you can do a lot of things with for loop. So let's say that your teacher is punished you because you talk too much in class and she's asked you to write, I'm sorry, 50 times. So can you use for loop to do that? Well, you can definitely use for loop to do that. Let's try and see how that works. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing. Set i to zero. Then i is less than 50. Well, only if your teacher is kind enough, she'll ask you to write it 50 times. Otherwise, 100 times is the minimum. All right. Now within the code block, let's log this message. Okay. So first we're going to. I'm sorry and let's put a smiley as well. Okay, so I made a mistake over here. Okay, so this is how it works. Let's save this code and you know, let's comment this out. Okay, now let's check our browser. So you can see that I'm sorry is displayed so many times. <laughs> so guys, that's a simple hack. With this, we complete our for loop. Now the last topic of discussion is switch cases. So switch statements are used to perform different actions based on different conditions. Okay. Now how does switch statement work? Now here you can see that this is a syntax. Now after the switch, there is an expression and there are a few cases. Case one, case two, case three and default and so on. Okay. Whenever case one is true, the code block one will get executed. Similarly, if case two is true, code block three will get executed. Now how does this work? 
now what happens is the expression within this switch statement is executed one okay after that the value of the expression is compared with the value of each of these cases okay so this is the value of the cases this expression is compared with the value of the cases so if there is a match this block will get executed so basically the value of the expression is compared with the value of the cases so if there is a match then the associated block will be executed so if the value of this expression and the value of this case is the same then this code block will be executed okay let's try this with an example so let's create a new file called switch okay let me type out the code and then you'll understand what i'm saying okay okay so that's a long code but this is very simple now what i've done here is i've defined a variable called games and the value of that variable is football okay now i'm passing this variable into the switch statement so basically the value of games is football over here now if the value of this expression matches with any case then that block will get executed now here the value of games is football correct so you're going to look for football now the case over here is football so basically this is going to get executed okay now let's just save and let's run the code you'll understand what i'm talking about so guys make sure to change the reference over here save it and let's check the logs see it prints i love football so why did it do this exactly now it did this because the value of this expression matched with this case okay because it matched with this case the statement within that case got executed okay now if i change the value to foosball okay let's see what happens we'll save it it says i like other games now this was the default statement now this default statement is executed whenever this expression does not match with any case okay because i'm not given foosball anywhere over here it executes the default statement so this is how the switch statement works Now before I move on I wanted to tell you that I'll be making use of Visual Studio Code which is basically a code editor to run code snippets that I'll be explaining in this session so if you don't have Visual Studio Code y'all can go ahead and download it or use any other editor of your choice now guys before I start off with the session let me show you how Visual Studio Code looks so I'm just going to open up this editor now guys this is a very simple editor and you know i think it's my most favorite editor you can use sublime text or any other editor that you are comfortable with all right so this is how it looks now what i've done is i've already copied a folder called jquery all you have to do is create a folder on your desktop and then drag it and paste it over here okay so i've already created a folder because i think it's a good practice to have a folder that contains all your code snippets all right now guys if you download a visual studio code you need to make sure that you have uh, installed an extension called live server all right so i've already installed this live server now this will basically host our web page so whatever we type out or whatever code we have over here it will get hosted using this live server so make sure you install the live server in order to host your uh, web page or whatever you create okay so that's about visual studio code now without any further ado let's get started with our first topic so what is javascript now in simple words javascript is a universal language of the web which every pc every mobile phone and browser understands now javascript is mainly used to make a web page or an application look more alive and interactive so every time you see a really cool web page with a lot of motions and graphics it's because javascript was used to design it Now another important feature of JavaScript is that it is an interpreted language, unlike the high-level languages such as C, C++, and Java. Now these high-level languages require a compiler. Now when it comes to JavaScript, you don't need a compiler because JavaScript runs on the web, and most of the web browsers like Google Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox already have a JavaScript engine embedded into them. Apart from that, JavaScript is mainly a client-side scripting language. 
So guys, I hope with this you're clear with what is JavaScript. I hope you have a brief idea about JavaScript. Now, if you want to learn more about JavaScript, I'm going to leave a link in the description. You can check out our content on JavaScript so you can learn more about it. All right. So why use jQuery? Now, we all know that there are hundreds of JavaScript frameworks and libraries out there. But why must you use jQuery? Well, for starters, jQuery makes it extremely easy to manipulate the DOM. Now, DOM basically stands for Document Object Model. Guys, don't get intimidated by the name. I know it sounds like it's a very complex concept, but it's very easy. All right, I'll be explaining the DOM in the further slides, so stay tuned. Now, DOM is basically like a tree structure of the HTML elements. Now, in order to make a web page interactive, web developers manipulate the DOM, and jQuery makes it extremely easy to do that. Now, apart from that, the community of its contributors is more diverse and bigger than any other JavaScript library. It has detailed and comprehensive documentation, which gets better every day. Now, another bonus point is that jQuery has thousands of plugins available for free, and they can easily be added to our projects. So these plugins add value by enhancing user experience. Now, one such example is the Ajax technology, which develops a responsive and feature-rich site. Okay. Moving on, jQuery also provides cross-browser support. So basically, every time you write a code on your local machine and you want to run it on a browser like Google Chrome, Safari, and all of that, you don't have to worry about whether your code will run on different browsers because jQuery takes care of the dependency issues. Now, this is because it supports almost all the commonly used browsers. All right. Now, guys, I hope all of you are clear with why we should use jQuery. Now, let's look at what is jQuery. Now, jQuery is basically a fast, concise JavaScript library with a nice motto which says, write less and do more. Now, that is very apt because its entire functionality revolves around simplifying each and every line of code. It simplifies the DOM manipulation, event handling, and basically every other thing. Now, jQuery offers a very effective way to capture a wide variety of events, such as a user clicking on a link without the need to clutter the HTML code jQuery takes care of all the complex things in between. Also, an add-on is that jQuery is a lightweight library of about 19 kilobytes in size after compression. So this makes it faster to load the library and also takes up minimal resources. Now, jQuery also comes with hundreds of built-in animation effects which you can use in your website to make it more interactive. All right, so guys, I hope all of you are clear with what is jQuery. Now, let's move on to installing jQuery. Now, there is no installation per se. This is just downloading jQuery. Now, let me tell you that there are two ways of doing this. All right. The first is a local installation wherein you copy the jQuery library on your local machine and you include it in your HTML code. And the other one is linked to a CDN. Now, CDN stands for Content Delivery Network. So you can include jQuery library into your HTML code directly from the CDN. So basically, this is like a link to your jQuery library. Okay, now let me show you how you can do this. All right, so this is how the official website of jQuery looks like. Now here you can go on download. So over here you can see download the compressed production jQuery 3.3.1. So this is probably the latest version of jQuery. So what you can do is you can either click on this and you can copy this entire library. This is basically the jQuery library. You can copy this entire library and you can paste it within a file over here. Okay, so I'm gonna paste it within this jQuery folder that I created. Okay, you can paste it in a file. Let's name it jQuery. So what you can do is you can copy that entire code and paste it in this file. But this is not something that we're gonna do because let me tell you that if you copy this entire thing and you paste it in your folder, you can easily go and edit it by mistake. Let's say by accident, you click on something and a small line gets deleted or a small element gets deleted. So your entire code is going to get messed up because your jQuery library was tinkered with. Okay. All right. So we're not going to follow the first method. Instead, we're going to do the link to a CDN method. Now I've created an index.html file within which I have the link copied over here. Now this is basically the jQuery library. You can see the version is 3.3.1. And also I have another link which is for the UI, jQuery UI. All right. Now, guys, this integrity and cross origin is just so that nobody manipulates the contents of these libraries. All right. So I've copied this link from somewhere on the web. I don't remember, but I'm just going to paste this link in my description box so y'all can go ahead and use this. Otherwise, if you find a better link, then y'all can use that as well. Okay. 
So this is basically my HTML file. So guys, I'm not going to obviously discuss the basics of HTML and CSS because that's not under the scope of this session. So I hope all of you have a basic understanding. If you all don't have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS and JavaScript, like I said earlier, I'll leave a link in the description box. You all can go and check out that video and then come back to this video. All right. So guys, that's how you download jQuery. It's not like an installation. It's basically downloading the jQuery. Okay. So now let's look at the document object model. Now the document object model is a tree structure of the various elements of HTML. Here you can see that it begins with document. This is basically this. This document is basically the ancestor of every other element in this file. And this HTML again is the ancestor of all of these other elements. Okay. Now the head and the body elements are children of the HTML element. So this is basically like a tree structure. So basically title is a descendant of head. Similarly, H1 and the P tags are children of body. Okay, so they are just descendants. Now guys, this is a simple tree structure and this is what document object model is. It's not any complex concept. It's a very simple structure of your HTML file. Now let's move on to jQuery selectors. Now the first thing we're going to learn in jQuery is the selectors. Now why do we need selectors? These selectors allow you to select and then manipulate the HTML elements or the DOM elements. Now all that a web developer has to do in order to make a web page more interactive or just create a web page for that matter is to make sure that the DOM is easily manipulated. Only when you add effects into the DOM, you can make any changes on your web. So that's why we use selectors. So basically selectors will select a particular HTML element and then you can use other functions on this HTML element and manipulate that element. All right. So what we're going to do is we look at examples. We'll type out codes and we look at examples. So don't get too confused. Okay. So I'm going to open up my file. So let's open a body tag. Now within the body tag, I'll have a header. I'm going to have a H1 tag, which will basically say jQuery tutorial. Okay, guys, the Q is always caps in jQuery. So we'll have a header which says jQuery tutorial and let's have a simple paragraph by Edureka. All right. In order to make things a little more interesting, I'm going to create an unordered list. Now within which I'm going to have a few elements in the list tag. So let's say I'm going to list my favorite dogs. I know there are no favorites when it comes to dogs because all dogs are really cute. But uh, if I had to list down three favorites, I would definitely go with these three. Okay, golden retriever. I'm quite old fashioned when it comes to dogs. I really like golden retriever, even though there are new breeds right now. But I think this one's really cute. And then uh, Siberian Husky. So guys, you can make it interesting and put in a list of whatever you'd like. Like you can put in a list of your favorite fruits or your favorite colors, anything like that. Okay. and Let's say boxer. Close the HTML tag. So I'm just going to save this file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal an explorer. So basically, this is how our web page looks. Now, like I mentioned earlier, most of the browsers like Google Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer have a JavaScript engine embedded into them. So this is a Google Chrome browser, like you all can see. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on anywhere on the page and I'm going to click on inspect over here. Okay, so this opens up my JavaScript engine. Now, this is basically the file. All right, one second. Okay, there was a small error because I had opened up a CSS file which I had linked. Okay, guys, just ignore that error. So, now what I did here was I opened up the JavaScript engine. We have a JavaScript console over here. It says JavaScript context. Now, what you can do is you can manipulate the DOM elements through this console. So basically you can run different commands over here. You can type something and you can run it. Now, just like in the vanilla JavaScript, we need to select things and manipulate them. In jQuery, we can select anything we want by using this dollar sign. All right. So this is the dollar sign or the dollar function that you can use to select anything. Now in regular JavaScript, we have functions like document dot get element by ID query selector all. Then there is get element by class, get element by tag, and there are hundreds of such functions. But when it comes to jQuery, the dollar function basically replaces all of these other functions. Okay. Now let's look at an example. So let's say I want to select this header, header one. This is h1 tag, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type the dollar sign first. 
we'll open up brackets and within quotation marks we're going to type whatever we want to select all right so what i'm doing over here is i've used the selector function and within the quotation marks i mentioned h1 so what this does is it will basically select the h1 tag for me okay so let's click on enter now when i click on h1 you can see that it highlights my header one tag okay it also shows me the dimensions of the tag and this is how the selector basically works now let's try selecting the body now that i've selected the body you can see that it highlights the entire body and it shows me the dimensions of the body as well okay so guys this is how the selector works now let's make things a little more interesting okay let's just go back to our visual studio code now what i'm going to do here is within my first list element i'm going to add an anchor tag okay let's say we randomly add an anchor tag and we're basically directing this to google.com and let's call it google so guys i hope you all understand basic html because i'm not going to explain the html it's going to be a very lengthy video if i sit and explain html to you all so for that i told you all that i'm going to leave a link in the description you all can refer that link and you all can understand html so i save the file now i'm just going to refresh okay so here you can see the anchor tag which is google now let's say that i wanted to select this anchor tag okay now we previously saw how to select the h1 tag we saw how to select the body okay but what if i want to select this particular anchor tag so what i can do is i'm first going to type out unordered list you have to type out the path to your anchor tag now in order to specify the anchor tag what i'm going to do is i'm going to specify that the anchor tag is within a list li and in turn this list is within an unordered list okay so it's basically like specifying the path to this anchor tag now because there's only one anchor tag in this entire list it's going to select this anchor tag only so let's see how that's done so you simply type out ul li and a so this is your unordered list this is your list item and this is your anchor tag now let's click on enter so when i click on a you can see that it highlights my anchor tag it also gives me the dimensions along with it so guys this is how it works now let's make it a little more interesting now let me just type out this code first and then i'll explain what it's doing so what i'm going to do first is i'm going to select the header okay h1 tag and then i'm going to apply a method to this i'll just type it out first and then you all can understand what i'm saying so what i'm doing here is i'm selecting the h1 tag using this dollar function after that to this h1 tag i'm going to apply this method dot css method now within this method i have passed a parameter and a value to that parameter so the parameter is color or the property is color and the value of the property is red so what this line is going to do is it's going to change the color of the h1 tag to red okay let's see if that works all right you saw that this turned to red so guys this is how you can play with the selector it basically manipulates the dom okay so this is what i meant when i say manipulating the dom now let's make it a little more fun and let's say we change the background color also okay we change the background color to black so here you can see the result so guys basically the selector is just to select a dom element and then manipulate it in whichever way you want okay so this is the most basic concept of jquery understanding the selector is very important because you're going to use selector at every line of jquery so with that we're done with our selectors now let's look at our next topic now we're going to discuss a few jquery methods now one of the methods that i already discussed is the css method i just showed you all how css is used to style a particular header okay but we'll come back to this later on now similar to that we have other jquery methods like the before method after method now what does a before method do now this method inserts a specified content before the selected element now this is the selected element now before the selected element it's going to add this content so whatever content you want to add before a particular element you mention that content within these parentheses okay now let's look at it practically i'm going to open up my browser all right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to select my unordered list and before my unordered list i want to add something before my unordered list so how i can do that is i'm just going to mention whatever i want to do so within h2 tags i want let's say my favorite dogs 
and let's close the h2 tag so what i did here was i basically selected my unordered list first and on my unordered list i'm going to perform this function now what this does is it adds whatever i type within these quotation marks before my unordered list okay let's just see how it works so here you can see that right before my unordered list i have my favorite dogs now similar to this is the after method okay let's go back to the slides now the jquery after method inserts a specified content after the selected elements okay so this is the selected elements and after the selected elements it's going to enter this content okay let's look at how this works we'll look at the same example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to change this to after okay and let's say i type are adorable enter okay so you saw that it says my favorite dogs blah 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 are adorable okay so guys this is how before and after functions work so these are just simple examples of how before and after work so up next we have text now a text function is used to set or return the text contents of the selected element so let's say we have a selected element over here and if we pass this text method on that selected element it's just going to return the text of this element you can also set or replace the text of a particular element by using the text function okay let's not get too confused i'll just open up my browser and show you how this is done let me just refresh my page okay let's look at an example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a selector and i'm going to select the list of elements within the unordered list so i've selected li and i'm going to use a text function over here okay let's see what this returns okay so over here you can see that it's returned golden retriever google siberian husky and boxer okay let's do one thing first let's remove this anchor tag because it does not make sense okay so i'm just going to save my file and let's open up the browser refresh and let's run this command okay so here you saw that it returned golden retriever siberian husky and boxer okay similarly let's say i just want to return the first element of my list then i would do something like this so what i did here was i selected list and in that i mentioned first okay so i basically mentioned the first element of the list now this returned only the golden retriever to me which is exactly the first element of my list here you can see that golden retriever now let's say that i want to replace some content okay let's say i want to replace this by edureka with something else okay let me just refresh all right so how i'm going to do this is first always start off with the selector so i'm selecting my p which is my paragraph tag now since i have only one paragraph within this entire html file it knows that it's this paragraph okay so let's say there was another paragraph over here then what you would do is you would mention paragraph colon first and you'd uh, perform an action on it okay so yeah let's coming back to this i'm going to say text welcome to this fun tutorial so what i've done here is i've selected the paragraph tag and then i've applied the dot text function on this tag now let's see what this does okay let's click on enter what happened here was by edureka was replaced by welcome to this fun jquery tutorial so this is how you use the text function to either set or to return some content all right so guys i hope all of you are clear with this now let's look at our next function okay the next one here is html now the html method is very similar to the text it is used to set or return the html content of the selected elements now let's look at the difference between the two now first let's look at an example of how html is used to return the content of a particular element so let's say li last dot html so what i've done here is i've selected the list and from the list i've selected the last element and i'm running html tag on it so this returns boxer you all can see that it returns boxer now let's see how you can set the content using html now what we're going to do is we're going to change this last element over here which says boxer we'll change it to something else so guys bear with me when i type the code so i'm going to replace boxer with german shepherd now let's click enter here you saw that it got changed to german shepherd okay so this is how you set the content using html 
Now, what is the difference between HTML and text? Okay, let me show you what the difference is. Let's say I'm going to select the entire unordered list and I want to return the value using text. Now, when I return the value using text, you see I get this. But when I do the exact same thing using HTML, let's see what happens. So I'm selecting the unordered list and I'm running the HTML function on this. Now here you saw that it's returning the HTML tags to me along with the text content. Over here it just returns the text content, but over here it will return the HTML content as well. Okay, so you can see that li and nli is not there over here. That's because it returns only the text content. This will return the HTML content as well. Okay, so guys, I hope all of you are clear with the difference between HTML and text. Moving on to our next function is the CSS function. Now I already showed you an example of this CSS function, but what exactly this function does is it styles a particular element. So whatever element you select is styled using CSS. So if you see any color or any pop in your page or any sort of design, very pretty design on a web page, it's because CSS was used. Okay. Now what this jQuery CSS method does is it sets or returns one or more style properties for the selected elements. Now let's quickly look at an example. So what I'm going to do is let's clear this unordered list. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a script tag. Now guys script tag is always used uh, in order to run some JavaScript or some jQuery script. So over here I'm going to create an object using the let keyword. So I'm using the let keyword to create an object and the name of the object is design and let's define some properties of this object let's say that the color is blue and let's define another property like background let's set background to green let's define another property which is border we'll set this to let's say three pixels solid black what i did here was i created an object i created an object called design and i've given this object three properties color background and border okay now these three uh, properties have particular values so colors value is blue similarly background color is green and the border is so on now let's just save this file i know you all are confused wondering why i'm doing this but just give me a second so what i did was i saved this file now let's open up our terminal and we'll select let's say we'll select the header one tag sorry i forgot to add the selector function so we've selected the header one tag and on this we're going to apply a CSS function and what we're going to do is we're going to pass an argument to this CSS function. Now what we're going to pass is we're going to pass the object that we just defined. So we created an object called design wherein we had three different set of properties which had different values. So we're just going to apply these values and properties to this H1 tag. So let's click on enter and see what happens. So you saw that the background color, the font color and a border was added to this. Now this happened because we had created an object with color, background color and border. So we just applied all of these properties to our H1 tag. Okay, it's as simple as that. So guys, this is how the CSS function works. It's basically for styling your web page. Okay, so your web page looks more prettier with the help of CSS. Now let's look at our next topic, which is attributes. All right, now the attribute method is used to set or return attribute values of the selected element. So let's say you select a HTML element and that HTML element may have hundreds of attributes. So you're going to select a particular attribute of that HTML element and you can return it using the attribute function. You can also use this attribute function to set an attribute to the element that you selected. So let's not get too confused with definitions over here. Let's just execute this and see how it works. All right, let's go back to the Visual Studio code. Now, in order to make it a little more interesting, let me just clear this entire thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to display pictures of three puppies and we're going to work on those three puppies. Okay, we're going to work on the images. We're going to try and add borders to those images. Okay. All right. So first thing what I've done is I've created a folder called puppy where I have three cute pictures of a golden retriever, a boxer and a husky. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this folder and I'm going to paste it over here within the jQuery folder. All right, so here you can see that I've added the puppy folder, which has three different images. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to display these images. 
Now, in order to do that, I'm creating a div and I'm assigning a class to this. Let's name it Puppers. So now I'm just going to add these three images. So I'm going to use the IMG tag. I'm going to set the source. So the name of the folder is puppy slash, let's say, goldie.jpg. It's a JPG image. So let me just copy paste this. And similarly, I'm going to add the other two images also. So the other image is husky. And then there is a boxer as well. Now let's go ahead and save this first. And okay, so what I've done is I've moved this to the root folder. So let's just save this and let's refresh. All right, so guys, I was facing a problem. It wasn't loading for some reason. So I just opened my jQuery folder on my computer and I just copied the puppy folder into that. Okay, so this is basically the index.html file we're writing. And I've also copied the puppy folder within this, which has three images. Okay, now this should work. So here you can see that within jQuery folder, I have a puppy folder and I have the HTML file. Okay, let's save this. Now this should definitely run. Let's uh, reveal an explorer. So you, now you see that we get three cute puppies. Guys, how adorable are they? To make it look a little more presentable, I'm just going to align these images uh, horizontally. Okay, so that it's clearly visible. So in order to align them to the left and also I'm going to set their uh, width and their dimension. So what I'm going to do is I'll open another file. So guys, like I told you all earlier that CSS is used for styling purpose. So I'm going to open a CSS file over here. Okay, so this is a symbol. Uh, this means that it's a CSS file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the class puppers. And within this class, I'm going to say float um, left. So what I did was I selected the puppers class, which I had defined within the HTML file. So here you can see that the class of the div was puppers. So I'm just selecting this entire div and I'm just floating it to the left, meaning that I'm going to align it to the left. And also let's set the dimension of the images. So I'm going to mention the image tag over here. I'll set the width. Let's set it to 300 pixels and also the height. All right, let's say 250. So let's save this file and we need to link this CSS file in our HTML file. So guys, don't forget to do that. A lot of people miss out on the step and then they wonder why their code is not working. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to add a link of my CSS over here. So it is a style sheet. So for those of you who don't know, CSS stands for cascading style sheet. I'm also going to write the type. It's a good practice to mention the type. So it is text slash CSS. And uh, also let's mention the path. So the name of my file is index.css, correct? So that's about it. Now let's save this file and let's open it up. All right, so guys, now you can see that they're beautifully aligned to the left and they all look so adorable. So guys, don't get distracted. Let's focus on our task over here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up the console over here. So let's apply this attribute function to these images. Now, first of all, let's select these images. For that, you're going to use the selector function. And within the quotations, I'm going to write img dot attribute function. So what I've done here is I've selected all of these images and uh, I'm applying the attribute function with the following properties. The attribute that I'm going to change is the border. So I'm adding a border and I am setting the border to this value. So it's a five pixel solid black border okay so guys this is how the attribute works now let's click on enter let's see what happens so here you can clearly see that i have added a black border one second let me make it more visible yeah see it looks much better so what i've done is i've added a border black border of five pixels and a solid border okay so guys this is how the attribute function works now let's go back to our next method all right so our next uh, method is the value method now, this is basically used to set or return the values of the selected elements. Okay, so here you're just going to return the value. You're not going to return the attribute or, you know, you're just specifying the value of the attribute and you're going to return this. So we're going to try something different over here. So in order to run a code on this val method, 
I'll have to tell you what is a click function. Okay, so what is a click event? So let's go to the click slide. All right. So here is the jQuery events list and the first one is a click event. Now this event is executed when the user clicks on the HTML element. Okay, so you basically select an element using the dollar function and then when you click on this element, some function is performed. So I'm briefly telling you what this does because I'm going to be using the click function. Now let's open up our file. So we're going to type in something different over here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this entire thing. Let's clear the div element and I'm just going to add script over here. Now script tag is used to add your jQuery or your JavaScript code. So I've just opened up my script tag. Now over here I'm going to type a function. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm selecting the entire document dot ready and then there's a function over here. All right, so guys, before moving on, let me tell you what this document dot ready function does. Now it's a very good practice to have this function in every file of yours, but I forgot to mention it earlier. So it's a very good practice. Now a page cannot be manipulated safely until the entire document is ready. So basically what jQuery does is it detects the state of readiness. Now whatever code you include inside this document dot ready function. So whatever code I'm going to type over here basically in these lines it will run only once the page is ready okay so basically the code that you include within this function so let's say i type something over here okay whatever code i'm typing over here all of this code will be executed only after all of this is executed so only after loading all of these jquery libraries and frameworks only after that whatever is mentioned within this document dot ready function will get executed because let's say that I wanted to run a jQuery function over here. Okay, some jQuery function and I just ignored this line and I didn't have a document dot ready function. Now what happened was let's say that for some reason this library took a lot of time to load and by the time it loaded this jQuery function was already executed. Now obviously that's going to return an error because it's going to say that there is no jQuery library or something like that because this library was not entirely loaded. Okay, so that's why you need a document dot ready function. Okay, so guys, I hope you all are clear. Now this is a good practice to include. It's not mandatory, of course, but it's always good to have document dot ready function at the beginning itself. Okay, so after your title, after you load the libraries, you should always add in this document dot ready function. It's a good practice. All right, so before we type out the code over here, I'm just going to create a button and an input type okay now input type will basically create space for user input so my input type is going to be text so the people who are familiar with um, html css know what i'm doing exactly so i'm giving some id to this input and also let's give it some value okay it's blank value so whatever you enter here is going to be saved okay so i created an input type over here now also I'm going to create a button. Okay, so you use the simple keyboard button and you just type the name of the button. Let's say submit. Now let's come back to this function. Now what I'm going to type here is I'm going to start off with selecting the button. Okay, so it's selecting the button and now I'm adding the click function over here. So guys pay close attention to what I'm doing here. Okay, so basically I'm selecting the button using the dollar function what i'm saying is when you click this button a particular function will get executed now let's type out the function that gets executed on the click of the button so click is basically an event so on executing this click function some event occurs and that event i'm going to type over here okay so what it's going to do on the click of a button is it's going to give out an alert with the value dot val so this is where i'm using the value function all right now let's close all right so what i'm doing here is on the click of the button this event is going to occur okay so you're going to get an alert saying value and wherein the value is going to be this some text identifier so whatever value the user types in is going to get passed over here okay and then this dot value function is going to return that value to you now don't get too confused let's save this and we'll run this and you'll understand exactly what i'm saying 
All right. So what I'm going to do here is see this is the input wherein the user types input and this is the submit button that we created. So let's say hello. Now let's click on submit. Okay. So when I clicked on submit, this is what happens using the click event. So basically an alert is shown wherein the value is returned. So whatever input is given by the user is returned using the val function over here. Okay. So you see it says hello. Let's say Edureka. How are you doing? Okay, submit. So this is just returning the value that I'm typing in the input. So guys, this is how the value function works. All right, it's very simple. It just returns the value. Similarly, you can set the value as well. So I want you all to try something with setting the value. And please comment down whatever you've tried or any new program that you've run using the val function or any other function. We'll be very interested to know how you have used these functions to build your own program. Now the next function I'm going to talk about is the add class method. Now this basically adds one or more class to the selected elements. So you're going to select an element using the dollar function and whatever element you select, you're going to add a class to it by simply using the add class method. Now let's look at this through an example. So first of all, let's just clear this entire thing. Okay, so now similar to the previous example we're going to load the images of all the puppies so it has a class called puppers okay and we're going to add all the images okay so puppy coldie okay similarly i'm going to have the other two images over here okay and the last image which is a boxer so i'm selecting the puppy folder and then the boxer image all right so I created a div similar to what we did in the previous examples. Now I'm going to open a script tag. Before I type out the entire script, I'm going to have a button, right? So let's add a button over here. Okay, let's name it try add class. Now that we have the script. All right, now within the script, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the document dot ready function. Now earlier I already explained the use of this ready function. So um, that's exactly what I'm doing here. All right, now over here, I'm gonna first start off with selecting the button. On the click of the button, some function is gonna be performed. Okay, and what is that function? So basically on the click of a button, an event is gonna occur and I'm gonna type out that event over here. Okay, now before I type out the event, Let's define a style class. Okay. Now the style tag is used if you want to uh, specify some CSS code. Now you can obviously open another file called CSS and enter the entire thing, but uh, it's a small code. So I'm just going to type it over here itself. So I'm creating a class called style class. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define some property called border and I'm going to assign a value to this property. Let's say 5px solid green. So this is what is there in the style tag. Okay. Now coming back to this function. So on the click of this button, an event has to occur. And I'm going to type out that event over here. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting all the images first. And then I'm using the add class method. And I'm passing this style class function that we just created. Okay, all right. Now let's close our parentheses over here. So, what I'm doing here is on the click of this button, and on these images, you're going to run the add class method. Now, to this method, I've passed a class called style class, and within this style class, I have created a border of five pixels solid green. Okay, so don't get too confused. Let's save and open the file. Okay. So what happened was on the click of this button, all these images were selected and a border was applied to all of these images. Okay. Now this border was specified within a class called style class, which we had created over here. Okay. So guys, this is how the add class method works. Now let's go back over here and let's refresh first. Okay. Now along with add class, we have remove class and we have toggle class as well. Now remove class will basically remove that class which you just added and toggle class will toggle between adding and removing the class. Okay, let's just look at how this works. 
Okay, to the same example, let's open up the console. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of these images. Okay, and then I'm going to do remove class style class. Now what I did here was I selected all of these images. I'm running the remove class method on all of these images, and I'm passing the style class as an argument to this method. So first of all, let's add it. And then we'll see how the remove class works. And uh, you can see that every image has a green border. Now let's do remove class. Okay, so you saw that the border was removed. Now let's do toggle class. Okay, so when I did toggle class, it got added again. Okay, so if I do toggle again, it will remove the border. Similarly, again, it will add remove. Okay, so guys, this is how add class, remove class, and toggle class works. Now let's get back to our next topic, which is jQuery events. Okay. Now I've already explained the click event to you, but we're still going to run a program and see how this works. Now, what the click method does is it's basically an event. When you apply the click event to a selector, some function occurs or some event occurs. Okay. And that event is specified within this function. Now let's look at an example. So first of all, I'll just remove the style, which is not needed. And then this button is also not needed. So we do require these images. Let's just keep this as it is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to edit this script path. So instead of having button over here, we're going to select images. So on the click of images, some event is going to occur. That event is specified within this function. So let's type out that event. What I'm doing is I'm using a this keyword and I'm adding an effect called hide. All right. Now let me tell you what this does. So basically on the click of an image, this event is going to occur. Now this basically denotes whatever element you're currently selecting and that element will be hidden using the hide effect. Now hide is basically a jQuery effect. Now this is used to hide a particular element. So whichever element you've selected over here is going to get hidden using this hide effect. Now I'll be explaining hide show and all of these other effects in my further slides. So for basic understanding, just know that this hide effect is just going to hide a particular element that you've selected. Okay, so I've saved the file. Now let's just open it up. So what I'm going to do is let's click on each of these images because we've added an event on each of these images, right? So let's click on this image. So you saw that it got hidden. Similarly, the other two images also get hidden. Now this is happening because on the click of an image, I'm going to hide that image. Okay. Now this is just used to record my current event. So basically on the click of the images, those images are going to get hidden. Okay. That's exactly what we did here. Let me show it to you once again. So I'm clicking this image. It gets hidden. Similarly, this and this. So guys, I hope all of you are clear with the click event. Now, similarly, we have on. Okay, now this method attaches one or more event handlers to the selected elements. Now, whenever you have on, a lot of people get confused between click and the on event. Now, on is used to specify other event handlers. So you can use on along with click and along with key press. Now, key press is the next method that I'm going to discuss. So I'm going to be running an example where I'll show you how to use key press and how to use the on event as well. Now key press basically executes whenever a character is entered. So basically whenever you press a key on the keyboard, some event is going to occur with the help of key press. Okay, so guys, it's quite explainable. If you just read the name of the event itself, you'll understand what it says. Okay, now key press is a combination of key down and key up. Let's not get into too much detail. So I'm just going to create an example where I'll be showing you how to use key press and how to use this on event. Okay, so let's open up our Visual Studio code. Okay, so what I'm going to do is let's clear this entire div. We do not require this for this example. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a input. We're going to give it an ID. Let's say press. All right. And also it will have a type. Okay, and the type is text. And we'll also set some size to this. Okay, let's say 10. All right. Now, here we have a script. Now, within the script, instead of selecting images, we're going to select the input. First of all, let's clear this entire block. 
so we have the document dot ready function now after this let's select the input so here we're selecting the input using the dollar function and i'm going to add the on event here so here i'm also going to add the key press event and some function is going to be performed okay so guys let me just type this out don't worry i'll explain what i'm doing p dot height so what is happening here is on key press so as soon as you start typing on this input some function is going to get performed this p is going to get hidden so let's create a paragraph another paragraph let's call it let's enter this code here start typing okay now there are two paragraphs here so i want to edit this paragraph so i'm going to pass in a parameter called last okay so this is basically going to select the last paragraph which is this one okay now guys i know this is sort of confusing okay there's a small error somewhere over here okay so i haven't closed this now let's just save the file i'll show you what's happening so don't worry if you haven't understood anything okay now basically i define an input there and what i'm going to do is when i start typing so when i start typing this paragraph is going to get hidden so let's see how that works let's say hello yeah see as soon as i press the first character the whole paragraph got hidden now how does that happen that happens because we use the key press function so on the press of a particular character on your keyboard this last paragraph will get hidden so guys this is how the on and the key press work now on is used to specify other events as well so on is an event and key press is also an event okay so this is how on works and this is the difference between click and on so with this we are done with events now we have to discuss jquery effects all right guys so now let's discuss the hide effects now there are a lot of effects over here we have hide we have show toggle fade out fade in fade toggle and similarly we have a few other effects now like the name says it's sort of an effect so basically hide is like an effect so it will select a particular element and it will hide it okay you can have parameters for how long you want to hide an element or for how long you want to fade an element now we've already seen several examples of hide so let me just show you a basic example wherein we'll discuss hide we'll discuss show we'll discuss toggle okay now show will just make that particular element visible and toggle will toggle between hide and show so don't get too confused let's just open up our visual studio code so what i'm going to do is i'll just clear this entire thing okay so we'll remove any sort of confusion now within the body i'm going to have two buttons over here now each of these buttons will have a class called button and i'm going to give an id to each of these buttons so the first id is hide and the name of this button is also hide okay now let's just copy this entire thing and we're going to create another button and we're going to give it an id called show and let's name the button show all right so here i've just created two buttons and i've given a different id to each of these buttons now what i'm going to do is let's load a single image okay so let's not waste time and load three images so we're just going to load the same puppy images so the name of the class is puppers all right and let's add an image okay so puppy and let's select anyone let's say goldie okay so yeah let's close this and this is our div section okay so now let's add a script tag now over here is we are going to begin with the document dot ready function okay so let's select the document i've already explained what this does now within this let's define some code now first what i'm going to do is i'm going to select the id hide so wait sorry i forgot to put this in quotation marks so what i'm doing here is i'm selecting this hide identifier so basically this button hide okay so we have two buttons here that's why i've given each of them an identifier so that you know you can differentiate between these two buttons so basically this is selecting the hide button okay i'm selecting the hide button and on click of this hide button some event is going to occur now that event i'm going to specify in this function 
So what is going to happen is I'm going to select the image over here first. Now I've selected the image and I'm just going to hide that image. So on clicking the hide button, the image gets hidden. Now let's close this. Now similarly for show, we're going to do the exact same thing. Okay, let me just copy paste this. It's going to be easier. So instead of selecting the hide button, we're going to select the show button. And on click of the show button, the image will get visible. So we're using the show function over here. So guys, it's as simple as that. All right, so I hope all of you understood what I'm doing here. So let me just run you through what I did. So first of all, I created two buttons. I gave a different identifier to each of these buttons, hide and show, okay? And then I'm displaying this image, a single image. So what's happening over here is on clicking the hide button, that image is going to get hidden, okay? And on clicking the show button, the image is going to get visible. All right, let's save and let's just run it and see how this works. So let's click on hide, it gets hidden. Let's click on show, it's visible, okay? Now what we can do is we can also use the toggle function over here. So let's just select the images, sorry, the only image that we have and I'm going to perform toggle on it. So it gets hidden. Now if I click on toggle, it's visible. Similarly, it gets hidden and visible. So toggle toggles between hide and show, okay? So guys, that was about hide, show and toggle. So we covered all of these three in that example. Now let's look at fade out, fade in and fade toggle. Now, just like the name says, it basically fades a particular element. So either it will fade out that element or it will fade in or it will fade toggle. Okay. Now let's just execute an example and see how this works. All right. So first of all, let's clear this entire script path. I'm clearing this entire thing and also we don't need buttons. So let's clear these two lines as well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the other images over here as well. Now for each of these images, I'm going to give a ID. Okay. So let's define the ID of these images. Okay. Let's say this image has an ID one and similarly, I'm going to do it for the other two images as well. So this image has an ID two, and we change this to Husky. Okay. And in this third image, I'm going to give it an ID three and I'm going to change this to Boxer. All right. So basically I've assigned an ID to all of these images. Now in a short while you'll understand why I'm doing that. Now let's create a script tag script and we're going to have some code in this. So we're going to start off with the document dot ready function. Okay. So document dot ready and some function. All right. So I forgot to create a button. Let's create a button. So over here only I'll create a button. Let's say the name of the button is by because we're fading out. Okay. So I'm going to create a button called by. Okay. And now what we're going to do is on the click of the button. So we're selecting the button over here and on click of the button, some event is going to occur, which we're going to mention in this function. Okay. So what is the event? I'm basically going to select all of the images one by one. So first I'm selecting this image. All right. So basically it's the goldie image that I'm selecting and I'm going to fade it out. I'm going to use the fade out effect over here. So we can also pass parameters to these methods. So if I say fade out slow, then it will slowly fade out. Okay. Then uh, similarly, I'm going to do it for my other two images. All right. So here, let's select the second image and, you know, let's keep it fast over here. Okay. It will fade out really quick. And then I'll select the third image and we'll say slow. Okay. For this, let's just keep it slow. Okay, now just close the parentheses and we are done with the code over here. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm loading three images uh, and I'm giving an identifier to each of these images. Okay, then I'm selecting each of these images and I'm fading them out. Okay, now let's see how this works. So let's open it up. All right, now let's say bye. So here you can see that 
the first one and the last one fade out slowly. So the first one to fade out was this image because we passed a fast parameter. Okay, for these two we mentioned slow. Okay, and let's look at it again. Yeah. So guys, this is how fade out works. Okay, now let's look at an example for fade in. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to clear this div. So let's not use puppy images anymore. Even though that's sad name, but yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a script function. Now within this, we're going to have three divs. Okay, so instead of keeping this as fade out, let's keep it fade in. So we'll make it fade in over here. Similarly for this also, we'll make it fade in. And for this also fade in. Now, what are we going to fade out and fade in? Let's look at what we're going to fade out. Now, first of all, let me create a button. I'm going to, let's say, Namaste. Okay. We have typical Indians over here. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a div and I'm going to create a class called, let's say, fade. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is within this div, I'll have three different boxes or squares and We'll give ID to each of these divs. So that is one. Now this is the ID that I've mentioned over here. Okay. So ID one. We're going to style it and we'll give it some sort of width. Okay. Let's say width is so much. And similarly, we'll give it some height and let's say 60 pixels. We'll keep the display as none for now because initially nothing should be visible. When you're fading in, it starts with nothing to everything gets visible. Okay, so that's why we're keeping the display as none. And also we'll set the background color. We'll set it to orange for this one. All right, so you can see that I've set the display to none because we're fading in the image. Okay, and then the background color I've set to orange. All right, now what we're going to do is that's the end of this div. Just close the div over here. And we're going to add another division. Now within the div, I'm going to give a small break. So you can use the BR to give a break. Now let me just copy this entire thing. We're going to have three divisions like these. So I'm just copying this whole thing. Now for the second div, what we're going to do is we're only going to change the background color. I'm sort of trying to display our flag, the Indian flag. I won't be able to get the uh, chakra in between, but apart from that, I think it should work. Okay, and this I'm going to change it to green. So we've created three divs over here and on these three divs, we're going to fade in. Okay, this is slowly going to appear on the screen. So for this also, I've set slow, fast and all of that. Let me just change this. So the first one can appear by default. Okay, we're not going to pass any parameter. The second one, we'll put slow. And the third one, let's actually give it some value. Okay, so this is basically time in terms of milliseconds. So I'm going to give this value. Let's save the file and let's see how this runs. Okay, so I forgot to remove the buy button. Let's take that off. Okay, we have the namaste button. Let's save the file and now let's check. Okay, let's say Namaste. So I made a stupid mistake over here. I forgot to change the ID. So this is two and this is three. Okay, so now it should definitely work. Let's save the changes and I'm just going to open up my browser. Right, let's refresh. Okay, so here you can't see the white one because it's totally white, it's not visible. But here you can see that there is this looks sort of looks like the Indian flag. So obviously I couldn't get the chakra over here, but yeah, so this is how it works. So guys, that was about fade in and fade out. So I hope all of you understood how fade in fade out works. Okay, now let's move on to our next topic, which is slide down, slide up. And similarly, we're going to do slide toggle as well. Now, just like the name says, this effect is used to slide down a selected element. And it similarly has a speed and a callback parameter. Similar to that is slide up, wherein the selected element slides up. And then we have slide toggle, which toggles between slide up and slide down. So let's look at an example. Okay, so first of all, let me just clear this entire thing. Okay, I'm going to clear this whole thing. And so I'm going to start off with having a button. 
so let's say the name of the button is we can name it slide all right and then we can what we're going to do is we're going to add a div over here okay a division we're going to have an id for that let's call it div one okay this is not necessary but it's a good practice to have an id over here it's not necessary because there's going to be only one div so we're going to style it let's say we have the width we'll set the width to 90 pixels okay similarly we'll have height parameter and we'll set that to 60 and we'll also give it a good background color we'll give it pink okay and okay i have misspelled background so basically this is the div um let's close the div it ends over here all right so we basically created a div over here it's basically a small square or a rectangle okay of color pink now let's have a script tag now within the script tag what i'm going to do is i'm going to select the button over here and we're also going to add on event over here and let's also add click okay so on click an event is going to occur and that event is defined within this function now what we're going to do is we'll select the div okay using the identifier that we gave it div one okay and we're going to apply the slide up or the slide down function to this okay let's apply slide up first okay we can also pass a parameter say slow let's close this up and this should work okay let's save so what i did here was i created a small rectangle using this div and i styled it okay so i created a small rectangle over here and i have a button called slide and on click of that button this square is going to slide up slowly okay so let's see how it works okay let's say slide so let's see it again so it's slowly sliding up okay so guys this is how slide up works now for it to slide down what we're going to do is if it has to slide down then initially the display has to be none so we're going to set the display to none and we're going to change this to slide down okay let's save and let's see if this works okay let's click on slide see it's sliding down slowly so guys this is how slide up and slide down works okay you can also toggle it in the same manner okay so if you toggle this it will either slide up or slide down okay so guys with that we are done with jquery effects now let's finally move on to our last topic which is jquery user interface okay this is just the ui now i'm just going to discuss three functions over here which is draggable droppable and date picker now like the name suggests you can drag any selected element using the draggable method and similarly the droppable method is used to drop the selected element at a specified target this is how draggable and droppable work now let's look at an example all right so i'm going to begin with clearing everything over here oh guys i don't know why i removed the first header okay let's just keep it as jquery tutorial now what we're going to do is first of all we're going to begin with a style tag so basically we're going to style an element that we're going to drag around so this is just going to be a small square or something like that so i'm going to give this style a id called drag all right now within this we're going to have a few properties like width let's have it 150 pixels then we'll have height similarly so we're just going to design an element that we're going to drag around over here okay 60 pixels and then we have we'll give it a background a background color let's say blue let's click on blue violet all right so this is basically the style tag now basically we have a rectangle over here with the background color blue violet and we've given it an identifier called drag okay so guys one thing i forgot to mention was if you know css then you know that when you use a hash it's basically for an identifier but whenever i mentioned dot with some name it means that i'm selecting a class okay that was just extra information so yeah now let's just open up a script tag and so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to have a function over here all right now guys you can use function as a shorthand for document dot ready function 
okay so this is like a shorthand for function i forgot to mention this earlier but you can use this now what you want to do here is i'm going to select the drag identifier and to that element whatever we designed over here sorry i forgot to put quotation marks now this drag identifier basically selects this rectangle that we created so that rectangle is getting selected and we're going to make it draggable okay we're going to use the draggable function and yeah all right okay so this is the script now what i'm doing here is i'm creating a div of id drag okay so basically this drag and i'm creating a div of id drag so it's basically the same division and i'm just going to have some text on it let's say drag me around okay so yes let's save this and this should definitely work all right so this is basically what we styled we created a rectangle of violet blue color and now you can just drag it around okay you can see that i can simply drag it around the entire html page over here okay so guys this is how draggable works i know it looks really cool to drag it it's like a small game so this is how draggable works okay now let's look at droppable now let me just clear this entire thing so what we're going to do is we're going to have an image of a puppy whom we want to drop off at his house so basically we're going to have an image of a puppy and we're going to drag it and drop it into his house so we're going to involve draggable and droppable over here it's a cute concept so guys yeah i'm first of all going to start with displaying the image so okay i'm going to select goldie and all right so now that i've selected the image now let's have a style function okay now we need a house for this puppy so we're going to design the house now i'm going to give an identifier to this let's call it drop now within this i'm going to have a width okay we'll set it to 400 pixels similarly height 400 and we'll make it float to the right because i'll tell you why all right so when i display this you'll understand why i'm floating it to the right background color as let's give it aquamarine okay so this is the end of style so what we did here is we basically created a square of the color aquamarine now let's add the script tag over here where all the work happens now over here i'm going to begin with function all right uh, now i'm going to start off by selecting the image there's only one image here you can either say image or you can give the identifier of the image it's the same thing and this image should be draggable okay draggable all right now i'm going to select this square that we created which has an identifier called drop so i'm going to select that square and i'm going to make it droppable all right let's just close the parentheses over here all right so this is it for script now let's also add a small text over here so i'm creating a div with the id drop okay within this div let's have a small paragraph which says my home all right okay so what we did here was we started off by uh, displaying this image and then we created a square with the following properties after that we're going to assign the draggable method to the image and the droppable method to this square that we created over here okay now let's just look at the output you'll understand it much better all right so basically this guy wants to go home all right give me a second okay so the reason it wasn't getting dragged was because i did not mention a hash over here when you give an identifier you have to mention hashtag over here okay so let's save this and let's open that up it should work refresh now see it's draggable so this guy wants to go home and this is his house so it's droppable over here okay it does not move around or go back it's droppable so his house is droppable so just we're just taking him to his house i know this is silly but this was a good way of showing you how draggable and droppable works all right so i hope you all understood draggable droppable now lastly we're going to look at date picker so guys this is an inbuilt function it's an inbuilt widget in jquery 
wherein you can enter a date and then you can easily visualize the date. We're not going to go into detail with this. I'm just going to show you a simple example of how the date picker works. Okay, let me just start off by clearing this entire thing. Okay, right up to here. Okay, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an input wherein the user will enter the date. Let's give it an ID. Let's say date is the ID and the type is text. We'll also assign it some size. Okay, say 10. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to open up a script tag. Now within the script tag, it's very simple guys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select the input. So I'm typing the input ID over here. And on that, we're going to call the date picker widget. Okay. So let's save this. So guys, this is all. All right. So I'm just creating an input. And as soon as you type the input, you're going to get a date picker. Okay. So this is an inbuilt widget. There's not much to code over here. All right. So as soon as I clicked on it, the date picker got visible. So let's say I give some date. You can give some date randomly or if you select on some particular date, that date is visible over here. OK, so it just works normally like this. All right. So guys, I hope all of you are clear with the date picker. What is Angular? So it only makes sense to start with what exactly is Angular. So for viewers who are watching any Angular video for the first time, you deserve an introduction to what you are learning. Now, most of you, I assume, actually already have done your research before coming onto YouTube and typing out Angular tutorial. So it's only mandatory that I give you this introduction. So first of all, Angular is a front-end development framework. Now that's out of the way. Let's get into what front-end development framework means. So when if you have any web developer friends, you will constantly hear two words backend and front end backend and front end. So what do these two words mean? Well, uh, the roles of a web developer are forked into two very distinct branches in this industry. The first is that of a backend developer and the second is that of a front end developer. Now a backend developer is responsible for mostly everything that happens on the back end. So basically stuff like routing, well, routing is also done by front end developers, but that's another thing. But routing is basically the job of a back end developer, uh, fetching things from a server, writing the JavaScript for all that things. That is a complete back end developer thing. Setting up the server, for in fact, setting up the database schema. That's everything a back end developer does. What the front end developer does mostly entails what you see on your screen right now. So the way you see Facebook, the way it's designed, how everything, how the news feed is actually placed like that. That is the job of a front end developer. He makes sure that everything on the website looks tip top and smack perfect. And he does this with a lot of optimization. So mostly back in the day, front end mostly used to be done by HTML and CSS. And CSS used to get very complicated in this fashion. It still is a little complicated if you want to present a very polished website, but creating the HTML and making it much more reactive is what the framework does for you. So most online sites will say that front end development framework is also referred to as a CSS framework. Well, while this is very true, it's not so perfect of a thing to say that is a CSS framework. It is more of a reactive HTML framework and I will explain just now how. So the second thing that you should know about Angular is that it is maintained and developed by Google. So Angular JS is a JavaScript based open source front end framework mainly maintained by Google and by a community of individuals and corporations to address many of the challenges encountered in developing single page applications. We'll also get to what single page applications mean in a moment. It aims to simplify both development and the testing of such applications by providing a framework for client side model view controller. That is the MVC architecture on the model view view model controller or the MVVM architectures as you might know it. So basically it's maintained and developed by Google. Now, if you know Google, you know things they give you as a product is amazing. Things like Flutter really took off. Android, we know what it is today. And Angular JS has been out there since a long time. It's got an amazing community. If you have any sort of doubt, you can go ahead and post it out on Stack Overflow under the Angular tab, and you will probably get an answer almost immediately. Other than that, your problems might already be there posted by somebody else who is developing and face the same problem. So basically you have a great community, great support from Google, and it's a breeze to work with Angular today. 
The third thing that you need to know about Angular is that it is a JavaScript based framework. Now, if that was not already obvious from Angular 1, which is named Angular JS, well, I'm just putting it out there. It is JavaScript based. So why is it a good thing that it is JavaScript based? Well, JavaScript is commonly known as the language of the web. So if you are interacting with any part of the web, you're probably going to use JavaScript or the JavaScript engine. You might be doing unknowingly, but you are definitely doing it. For example, you're watching this video on YouTube right now. You are using a JavaScript engine that runs a video framework. So yeah, so if you know JavaScript, you basically know how to talk to the web. So when you're trying to learn Angular, you don't really have to learn a new language. For example, when you're learning Flutter, you have to learn about Dart. So Dart is a new language that is developed by Google and is used in Flutter. That is their mobile application development framework. If you want to go learn Flutter, you can check out my Flutter tutorial on Edureka. Uh, but for now, you need to know that Angular is based on JavaScript. Well, not exactly JavaScript. It is based on TypeScript. TypeScript is the main language that is used in Angular scripts. And TypeScript is basically a superset of JavaScript. And we'll get into what TypeScript is later on. So basically, the fact that it is made up of it is based on JavaScript makes it much more common and easy to reach out for developers like us. After that, we just discussed that Angular is main for single page applications. So we are not trying to create multi page applications with Angular. Angular is made for making single page applications. So what exactly is a single page application? Well, it does not re require a page reloading. So for example, Gmail is a wonderful single page application. So let me just go ahead and show it to you. So if you go ahead and open up your Gmail account and let's say you are straight up going to open on the inbox page. Now, if you were to go into drafts, uh, let the site stop loading. Okay, so if you were to go into drafts, you see that there is basically no load out here. Your screen isn't going into that whole whoop de whoop of loading. But if you are not on a single page application, for example, Go to webinar, which is a recording service. So out here we are on the my webinar tab. And if I were to go to my recording out here, you see that this goes into a loading fashion. This is loading up a new page. So this means that go to webinar is not a single page application, while Google is a single page application. And you just saw how much faster Google can be. My God, this is still loading, and Google was done with it already. So yeah, single page applications certainly have the performance and speed that you require today to do all your things very seamlessly. So it's great to have a framework that lets you create single page applications with so much ease. So with that out of the way, this is all the theory part. Let's go ahead and start up with our own Angular project. So the first thing that you need to do is to start up with Angular is go ahead to your browser, open up a new tab and search for Node.js. No, I am assuming that you don't have Node.js installed on your computer. So click on the first link and go ahead and download the one that is recommended for most users. After you download it, you'll get a setup file. Go ahead, click the setup file and just follow the instruction. It's a pretty easy install and I don't think there should be much problems with it. But just in case out there you get a problem with it, some configuration problem goes wrong, please go ahead and check out another video that actually explains how to install Node.js on your computer because this video is meant for Angular, I have a lot to do and I can't waste time with stuff like how to install Node. There are a lot of videos out there, including Edurecas itself, and you can go ahead and check them out. Now, once you have installed Node on your computer, you can go ahead and check if Node is installed by just typing Node on your command prompt, and this should open up a JavaScript console. You can say stuff like print, or let's say var x equals five, and if you just call x, it'll say five out there. I know my text isn't very clear because I have this weird blue background in my command prompt. But yeah, if you can open up a JavaScript console with just typing node, you have installed node in proper fashion. Now to exit from this console, you can just type dot exit and that will exit you from that console. So now let's go ahead and clear up our command prompt. And the next thing that we are gonna do is install Angular on our computer. So to install Angular, let's see what we have to do. So the best place that you have for any doubts of this sort is the Angular documentation. So go ahead and search for the Angular docs. So this will open up the Angular docs. It's at angular.io slash docs. Go ahead and check the setup part. So out here you see that you need Node.js. Now that you have done it, you can go ahead and install Angular through an NPM command. So NPM is a node package manager. 
and all you have to say to npm is that you need to install so install or you can just simply say i and then hyphen g which basically means that it is going to be a global install and not pertaining to any particular folder or any project setup so we are going to be installing this globally so that you can access the angular cli from almost anywhere on your computer so after that all you have to say is angular slash cli if i'm correct okay it's at the rate angular so for stuff like this always keep the documentation open and you should go ahead and press enter after that so this command will go ahead and install angular on your local machine so let's just wait for this to finish okay so as you guys know i already had angular installed on my computer so nothing new has actually been changed it just says it updated one package so that doesn't really matter so this means that angular has been installed on our computer and you can go ahead and check that by just creating an angular project now i'm in my default user directory so let me just go ahead and change it to the desktop directory and out in the desktop directory i want to make a folder called angular tutorial so angular underscore tutorial so this is where i'm going to be saving all the projects and all the setups that we will be needing for the various assignments and simple applications that we will be looking at and the concepts so this is going to be the folder for the day so let's go ahead and quickly change into that folder and so angular tutorial and we are in our angular tutorial folder so out here what you can do to start up a new angular project is as you guys can see out here it, is, it says to create a workspace and initial application you can use the ng new command so ng new basically tells angular cli that you want to start a new project and then you basically give your project a name okay so ng new and what do we name our project well let's think of some appropriate name let's go back and see what are we actually going to do next so we are going to be writing our first app so it's very simple that we are going to be calling this our first app so ng new will go ahead and create folder which has everything that you need to create your first app so you can opt out for routing for now because we will not be going for routing in this tutorial and we will also be using css for our file so just press enter twice and that will be using the default settings for setting up your angular project and there it goes so that completes our project setup and for this project setup we are also missing out one thing so firstly we are missing out our code editor so i'm going to be using visual studio code but you can use other paid applications like webstorm out there webstorm is amazing if you can pay for it please go for it but for now for a very free way of making a tutorial i'm going to be sticking to my cheap ways and just use visual studio code now just because visual studio code is free doesn't mean it takes away from any of the functionalities that come from the paid apps it has all the functionalities like syntax highlighting for creating and generating components it's really good you even get a built-in terminal to actually run your angular cli commands okay so let's just wait for this project to get set up it kind of takes a couple of minutes from some time so let's just give it some time okay so now that our angular app is set up and up and running all we need to do now is go ahead and just download visual studio code so to download visual studio code go ahead and type in visual studio code on your browser go to the first link and also the second link out here that download visual studio code that should give you a set of file and you should just go ahead and set it up that's very easy to do so let's not waste more time and get started with writing our first app okay so out here if you were to go to your desktop and if you made a folder like me like angular tutorial you will see that there's a folder that says first app now if you were to open the folder you see a lot of things you probably don't understand out here so there is a ts lint which is a json source file there's also the package file there's a package lock there's also this imp very important angular.json file which basically includes all your dependencies now this e2e file is not really going to be useful for us in this angular tutorial e2e basically means end-to-end -end, and this is made for end-to-end -end testing of angular apps what we are going to be interested in is mostly the node modules and the src so out here in src you see that there is this index page there is an index page which is your html file there's also this style sheet which is your basic styling of the web app that comes built in when you 
basically make any am angular app so first of all let's go back and let's open this folder particularly with visual studio code so as you guys can see i have opened up our first app and we can go into our src and we can see that there's an app folder and we get a lot of files out here so we have an app component.css file we have an app component.html file we have an app component.spec.ts file so all of these .spec.ts files are basically used for testing purposes you're not going to be concentrating on testing but rather more on developing an app so this is none of our concern for now you can feel free to actually go ahead and delete it now if you go ahead and open up app.component.ts you can go ahead and see that there is a bit of code written out here so there's an import line from the first thing we can see that it's importing something called components from a library called angular slash core there's also this decorator out here that tells angular that this is a component it has a selector it has a template urls it has styles urls and in the class you can see that there is a variable that says title and it says first app now this really doesn't make sense to a beginner but just wait on when we will know what all of these things mean from components to a class and everything else so first of all let's go ahead and see what this app that angular ships with looks like so to do that go ahead and open up your terminal you can simply do that by dragging it up and down and out here what you want to say is ng hyphen hyphen open uh, which basically makes your default browser open up and all you want to say is serve so this command basically serves the app that is in the development mode right now and it will serve it on a local host at port number 4200 so it's compiling at the moment so let's go ahead and see what it actually looks like let's give it some time to compile and it should open up the app for us automatically let's close off this one let's keep the documentation open let's close off the node.js let's close off my mail okay so this is the first app okay so as you guys can see we are greeted with the welcome screen as you guys can also see it's on a local server this is not hosted at a global scale this is just for your testing purposes as a developer so you can see that it says welcome to the first app now if you go ahead and see out here it says title equals first app now if you go ahead in the html part you can also see that there is this little place where title is referenced back again so as a developer i think you can make some sense that these three files the app component.es the app component.html and the app component.css is kind of interconnected with each other so yeah this is basically what an angular app looks like okay so this is basically the application that angular ships with it's a very welcoming application it says welcome to first app it has some useful links such as a tour of heroes link it has a link to the command line interface documentation and a few of the angular blogs now this is of really no use to us if you want to learn so let's go ahead and actually fiddle around with this file that comes along with angular when you create your app so if you go ahead and look at the app component.html page it looks deceivingly similar to what we see on our screen out here when with this app that angular ships with so as you guys can see it has an h1 that says welcome to and title and out here you can see welcome to first app so basically we can say that the title out here which we saw in the TypeScript file which is said title equals to first app and that gets converted out here above that we also have a few links and basically it's an unordered list and also if necessary there is some styling that goes along too but at this moment there is no styling that is available so let's go ahead and tinker around with this application just to give you an idea um, how angular actually works so angular is basically divided into components and angular app so out here what you see is the app component so every component has three files it's basically it's it's a template so it has its own styling so that is app.component.css it also has its template so the styling is css the template is app.component.html and the logic the business logic that goes inside this thing is in the app.component.ts file now there is also this app.module.ts file and i'll get to that just in a moment but for now what you want to do is go ahead and just delete all these stuff that is there in the app.component.html file 
Now, don't forget to keep your terminal running, which is serving this application. So every time you go ahead and save, it basically saves it. And you can go ahead and see that it has reloaded it. And we have nothing out here, to be honest. So let's make this page a little more interesting. So firstly, let's give this just an input, let's say. So we want a div. And in this div, we are going to have an input of type text. Now, every input should also go with a label. And this label is for name. So we can give this type name equals name out here. Right. So let's make this a little less confusing for you guys. Let's call this first name. Right. And out here, you see, if we go ahead and save it, we should get an input out here. We can type stuff out here, but it really does nothing even if we press enter and stuff like that. So we can also have um, a paragraph out here, which an output out our name for us. Please don't pay much attention to the syntax for now. Just try and understand what is happening in the background because we will get to the syntax just in a few moments. So we want to display the name out here. So to display the name, we need to create a variable called name. So go ahead and go to your app.component.ts file and change this name, the title to name. And out here, let's change it to my name. So we're going to say Aria. So let's save that. Let's go back and save our HTML file. And as you guys can see, Aria is coming out here. But if we still type something in the input, nothing actually happens. Now what I want to do is, whatever I type in the input should automatically be reflected in this paragraph below it. So we can do that very simply with so-called tool that Angular ships with. Now these tools are called directives and we will get into directives just in this tutorial. I'll be teaching you how to make use of inbuilt directives like the one I'm going to be using right now. So let's go ahead and use this directive. Now pay no attention to the way I am writing this because syntax is something that can be dealt with later on. So for now, what we want to do is start up square bracket and then an open parentheses bracket. That is the normal bracket. And what we want to say is ng model is equals to name. So name should be in your double quotes. Now this will tell Angular that whatever is being typed out here is going to be stored in a property called name. And we are also going to be displaying the same name down here in this paragraph. So let's go ahead and save this. And let's go ahead and reload our file. And you surprisingly see that the input part that we had has suddenly disappeared. Now what we want to do to realize our mistake is go ahead and say inspect. And if you go into the console, it says uncut error, template parse error. So it can't bind to ng model since it isn't known property of input. Okay, so basically Angular can't figure out what ng model is. Now this is because we have not imported the functionalities of ng model. Now I said that this is an input model and it comes shipped with Angular. But the way TypeScript works is that you have to go and tell TypeScript everything you are importing that you will be needing for your app to be running. Now all your imports to this is actually done in the module file. So things that need to be imported when you are running this is done in the modules file. So as you guys can see, we are importing a few stuff already. That is by default. So we are importing the ng module from angular slash core. And uh, we are also importing the browser module from angular slash platform browser. Now to actually make the magic of ng model happen, we need to import something and this is at the rate angular slash forms. So everything ends with the semicolon. So basically in TypeScript, you need to tell TypeScript where everything is particularly. So angular slash forms and what we need to import is the forms module. Now this was telling TypeScript that we are going to be using this, but you also need to tell angular that your forms module needs to be imported. So you can do that by just copying this name and putting it in the imports array out here. So put a comma, you press enter and type in forms module. Go ahead and save your HTML page also just in case. And now what we see out here is we do not get any error first of all and we have this nice little input box. So let's close this. We also have this nice little input box. It says aria in the paragraph. It also says aria in the input box. Now, if I were to delete that, everything in the paragraph also automatically gets deleted. So if this was not a single page application, for example, 
reflecting the changes you made to the input would probably take you to reload the page but that is not with angular you can go ahead and simply type your name and everything will happen like it's magic and it'll appear down in the paragraph below so that was all about installing angular setting up your project and we set up a project we saw how the shipping app actually looks like and then we kind of fiddle with it and this is how an angular app basically works you have components and then you also have modules so modules are like sub packages like any app would be divided into sub packages an angular app is divided into modules now modules contain components and this is the component out here that we worked with just now it is called the app component also another thing that i want to bring to your notice is if we go ahead and open up the source code what you see out here is it's basically an html page but there's this weird app root element out here it almost seems like we have built our own custom element below that what you see is a bunch of script imports that angular does for you so that angular works properly but the main interesting part is this app root element now if you remember we had seen this app root element in our app.component.ts file and we see that we have a selector called app root now the page that gets loaded into the browser is actually this index.html page now out there you see that we have created this app root thing so basically app root out here is like a selector so basically this will help you understand how an angular app gets loaded when we get to that so index.html is basically the file or the source code that you see out here it also happens to have this app root custom element now we built this custom element using our components and we told our component that the selector for this custom element will be app root and the template of that component is stored in app.component.html which is basically this file and also the component has some styling which it at the moment doesn't have any if it would have any styling it would be in this app.component.css file and basically that's it and we have our app.component.ts file which makes sure of the logic that is working properly so basically this is how angular works it's a bunch of components now let's go ahead and this was our first app that we created now let's go ahead with our next topic and that is what is TypeScript. Now you really saw that we are using something a little different from JavaScript. It's basically not JavaScript, it's TypeScript. So what exactly is TypeScript? Well, TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript. It is a strongly typed object-oriented compiled language. It was designed uh, by Microsoft and it is basically a superset to JavaScript. So anything that is included in JavaScript is definitely included in TypeScript, but the reverse can't be actually said. So everything in JavaScript is there in TypeScript because it is a superset, but everything in TypeScript is not there in JavaScript. So TypeScript is basically used when you want to create a JavaScript based application that can actually scale at an industrial level. Because when we're talking about TypeScript, it basically compiles down to JavaScript and this compilation is done by the angular CLI So if you want to go ahead and uh, learn the nitty-gritties of TypeScript You can go ahead and check out TypeScript tutorial out there on the web There are plenty of them TypeScript is really easy to learn and even if you don't want to learn TypeScript I think it's easy enough if you know JavaScript you can catch it up along the way It's basically like JavaScript, but having classes interfaces and stuff like that. So with that out of the way we can move ahead to our next topic and that is integrating external CSS into our angular application Okay, so for the purpose of integrating an external CSS We are going to be working with bootstrap 3 so bootstrap if you don't know is a CSS framework So let's go and see what bootstrap does So this is bootstrap uh, we are on bootstrap version 4 right now but I will be using version 3 for this purpose of this demo So you can go ahead and see what bootstrap does out here on bootstraps official site I also have a bootstrap tutorial. You can go ahead and check that out, too It's basically will show you how to use bootstrap in its various forms and formats Okay, so now we are only going to integrate bootstrap into our project So to do that all you have to do is go out here and open up another PowerShell command out here what you want to do is type in the commands npm install and dash dash save and you want to say bootstrap 
at rate 3. What this will do is download all the files of Bootstrap 3 and store it in this Node Modules folder. So Node Modules folder is anything that you use from the Node Package Manager. If you download some external package, it will be saved in your Node Modules. After that, after it's downloaded, I will show you how you can integrate it into your project that you are working on. Let's give it some time to actually download the node modules or what we have here that is Bootstrap 3. Okay, so we have actually downloaded Bootstrap 3. Now you can check that by actually opening the node modules folder and going down to B00. So A, B, C, D, B um, should be somewhere here. Okay, it seems I can now find it there. Let's go ahead and check it out on our desktop. So we have Angular tutorial, first app, no modules, and there should be a bootstrap out here. Yep, below bonjour. So it should be below bonjour. So let's go ahead and find bonjour out here. So this is our bootstrap folder that we had just downloaded. Now out here, we have a few folders so under this bootstrap folder, go into the dist folder that stands for distribution, go to CSS, and all you have to do is copy this, right click on it, and copy the relative path. Now, all you have to do is go into, let's, let's minimize this a little so that it becomes easier to work with. Now, all you have to do is go out here, go into styles, this is the angular.json file, on almost line number 27, you will see that there is a styles array. So out here, all you do is put a comma, press enter, and put in the address of the bootstrap.css file. Now beware that when you copy the relative path, you have to actually go ahead and change this all to a backslash. So just change all of these to backslashes, and you should be ready to go. So let me just show you guys. This is without actually having Bootstrap installed. So this is the app that we have created. Now, if we were to just go ahead and inspect, we can go ahead and see that in the head part, there is only one style that is as text slash CSS. This other styles is just a way of telling Angular that there's a source mapping of all the CSS styles. Now, at this moment, you can see that this is the global styles to this file. Now, once we actually go ahead and save our angular.json file, and then what we have to do is actually go ahead on node where we were actually serving, hit control C, and then what you want to do again is serve it again. So basically save your angular.json file, stop serving your application onto the server, and then save all your files, and then start up a new fresh serve process again. So to start a new fresh serving process, all you have to do is go ahead and type ng uh, new, or you can just say n. Oh wait, we're not creating a new component. All we want to do is say ng hyphen o and serve. So remember, this has only one style at this moment. So now let's see how we can actually integrate Bootstrap if we actually could integrate Bootstrap into our project. Okay, so our application has actually compiled and let's go ahead and see, let's go ahead and inspect our page. And if you go into your head part, you will see that there is a new style that has been added. So this says that Bootstrap version 3.4.1 has been added and now you can use all the styling that comes along with Bootstrap. For example, if I were to put this division inside a class called Jumbotron, this would give it a specific type of styling. A Jamatron is not exactly meant to be used like that, so let's go ahead and change it to a container. Now, if you want to know about all these bootstrap classes that I'm using, you can very well go ahead and check out my bootstrap tutorial that I have up on Edureka's site. Okay, so let's remove this. We are not doing the styling properly at this moment. Let's get back to this. Okay, looks like we have actually broken something but what I wanted to show you is that we actually have bootstrap going on and our bootstrap is completely working 
So this is Bootstrap version 3.4.1 for us. So that is, guys, how you would add an external CSS file to your project. Okay, so our next topic for today is how Angular actually loads. So if we go back to our code editor and uh, we analyze all the files that we've seen. So first of all, you have three component files. That is the component styling file, the component template file, and the component um, TypeScript file. Now, if you were to go back to your page where your application is loaded and you would inspect it, or to be honest, you have to go and see the source. So in the source, you see that there is, is this app root element. Now, how does the app root element know that it has to insert an input box and a paragraph out here? Well, let me just explain that first, because this is a very important concept. This will help you how in learning Angular, because you're getting to the root and fundamentals of how Angular is working. So firstly, the page that is getting served by the ng serve process is this index.html file. Now in this index.html file, we have somewhat of a custom element with the selector of app root. Now, if you would realize we have tied in this app root selector out here in this app.component.ts file. In this app.component.ts file, we have a decorator method. We have a decorator class, I'm sorry. And in this decorator class, we have said that the selector is going to be app root. Basically, it saves a string as a selector and it gives it a value that it, this is going to be used for recognizing an element on an HTML page. We have then also said that the element will have its templating in an app.component.html file. So very basically, when an app root component is present on your HTML file, Angular knows that it has to serve these three files out here. These three files out here, the app component files, it knows because it's tied in with the selector. Now, if you go ahead and see it out here, there is a module file also. Now, before we get to the module file, I'd like to tell you that the first piece of code that is actually run is always the main file. So out here, the main file is the main.ts file. And out here, you see this line out here. So out here in this file, basically there are a few imports. So one is to enable production mode for development purposes. But the most important line out here is platform browser dynamic and it's a bootstrap module. So in this bootstrap module, we are passing in the app module as an argument. So since the app module is being passed as an argument, the app module part is actually invoked out here. And out here you see it has another bootstrap array. So this bootstrap doesn't actually refer to our bootstrap CSS framework we just included. Bootstrap means what should be run first when you are actually running an application. So out here we are saying that we want to run the app component and the app component here happens to have this HTML file, the CSS file and this TypeScript file which are also tied into the index.html, which is app root selector. So whenever this app root selector is found on this HTML page, it is going to actually serve these three files. And that is exactly how an Angular app is loaded onto your screen. So this workflow is very important for you to understand such that uh, you know where you are going wrong, just in case in future debugging processes. We will be having a very detailed lecture on debugging in the future, so please hang on for that. So this part that I just explained will act as a precursor of knowledge for the future videos, which will need you to understand how an Angular application is actually being presented to you on your screen. Now moving ahead, we are going to go ahead to our next topic, and that is components. Now what we have here under this app folder is a component. Now components are the building blocks of Angular. Everything that you see on your screen using Angular is basically a component. So imagine there is this website that you see on your mobile phone and it is a website built by Angular. Now everything on Angular will be starting with the root component and they will obviously contain subcomponents and even more subcomponents after that. So basically it is a tree of components. Now if you were to remember my Flutter tutorial, if you haven't watched that, please go ahead and check that out. Flutter is amazing and you should be learning it today. Well, in Flutter, I had said that application built using Flutter is a tree of widgets. Now, the same analogy can be put to web page that is built using Angular as a tree of components. It's basically a unit or a building block and each framework gives it, it gives its building blocks a different name. So for Flutter, it's a widget and for Angular, it's 
a root component or just components in himself so what we did out here is that we had a component now let's say that we want to create another component how do we do that well all you have to do is go ahead and right click on your applications folder and what you want to say is you want to put in a new folder now let's call this folder um let's say we want to have a component called servers so let's call the servers and out here what we want to do is we want to create the server files so out here we are going to create a new file so we are going to create a new file and this file is going to be called the server dot component dot html so why did we choose this naming process well when you are building an industry level applications you tend to forget what is what so naming something appropriately so out here you know that this is the server dot component dot html file this gives us very good information for example it is a server it is a component and this is the template html file now in this template html file we could be putting anything for example let's just put an h3 and we could say that this is the server component that you are viewing so if this is coming on our screen we will know that there this is a server component now we can we also need to add a new file out here so to serve this file we need a typescript file first of all so what we need to do is create a new file and this will be the server.component.ts file so ts stands for typescript now if you were to go ahead and check out the app component.ts file out here you see that there is an import and then there's a class so first of all we are going to try and replicate this because that is also a component and we are making our component manually so we will know what we want to do so first of all we want to say export class and let's say server out here let's see the naming fashion of what how it is used so it says app component so to make it more clear that this is a component we could just use something of a naming structure like server component Those are brackets now we said export because we want to be using this class everywhere else so this was your way of telling angular that this is a component but this is not where it actually ends you also need to tell angular by actually putting a decorator so as rate component will tell angular that this is indeed a decorator so out here if you were to go ahead and again look into your components file out here you see that we have to open the components part and type in the selectors now basically we what we want to put in in this component is we want to say how we want to select this so we're going to say selector and our selector will be let's say a server i'm sorry that's not how you do it let's just go back and as you guys can see our things are becoming much more easier because of this ide things are getting imported into our file system now what we want to say out here is our selector will be if we have to pass a string so it is going to be server now we can actually call this a server but that is not the proper naming fashion so just to make sure your selector doesn't actually go ahead and clash with any inbuilt selector or some selector that might probably ship with angular what you want to do is call this app server so you just put a hyphen in between and you call this app server now another thing that we need to do is pass the html file so we can say template url so let's see how we can actually use the template url part so you see that it is a template url and we have to pass in the components.html so out here let's go back and let's say template url and all we have to do is pass server dot component dot html now let's see if we are missing out on anything you can always go back and check there so we have to do put the dot and the slash just to tell it that it is in the same parent directory so dot slash server dot component dot html and for now we can skip on the styling because there is no styling involved so we do not put a semicolon here because this is basically like an array so let's go ahead and save that so that saved successfully and now what we can do is go back into our app component file an html file let's go ahead and delete all this now what we can say is let's put an h1 to know that we are in the app component file 
So this is app component that we are looking at. Now, if you guys remember, we have used a selector out here that our selector for this will be app server. So whenever we put an app server type of selector, then H3 should be rendered, which says this is the server component that you are viewing. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go back to our app component and let's say app server. So since we have put our app server here, what we should be able to do is so since we have put an app server there, an H3 should be actually rendered there. Now let's go ahead and check if that actually happens. Let's save all our files. Let's save that. Let's save this. Now what you see out here is nothing is actually getting loaded. There is no H1 and there is no S3 either. Now this is because we have forgotten to actually put it in our modules. So if we see that nothing is actually getting loaded, there is no H1, there is no H3. So let's go ahead and inspect and let's go into the console. And if you go ahead there, you'll see that app server is not a known element. And the beautiful part of Angular is that it also gives you a solution most of the time. So if app server is an Angular component, then verify that it is a part of this module. So this gives us an idea that there is something missing in the app modules part out here. To know that what this actually does. So if we were to look at our app modules TypeScript file, we would see that there it kind of looks like a normal TypeScript file. There are a bunch of imports in the beginning. Then there is a decorator, which is the ng module decorator, and it has a bunch of arrays. Now in these arrays, we have understood what the bootstrap part does. It basically tells which component should be loaded or which service should be loaded when our app is loading for the first time. Now we also need to tell Angular that there is another component that you should be aware of. This is not done automatically if you are creating your servers and components manually. So what we need to do is go ahead and tell Angular that there is a server component. So if we put a server component we also see that there is another import line that has been added. So out here, this is TypeScript. This is the way you tell TypeScript that there is a server component. And this is the way you tell Angular that there is a server component. Now, if we were to go ahead and save that, we can now see that there is two parts loaded. One says that app component and the other said this is the server component that you are viewing. If you were to go ahead and inspect, you would see that this is a head, then this is a body and inside the app root we will have the app server component that is running inside the app server we see that there is an h3 which is basically this part so this is how you can create your components manually and then add them to your project and add them successfully too so that angular and typescript both understand how your components are being made now you can also add a styling to your components by just adding a styling folder, I mean a styling file. So you will be calling this the server.component.css. So this is going to be a CSS file. And out here we can just say, since we have an H3, we can say color will be, let's say, blue. Let's go ahead and save that. And now what we need to do is go into the TypeScript file and we also need to give the styles url and this is going to be so let's go ahead and see how styles are actually put this is put in an array so that's exactly what we're going to do out here so what we want to say is let's just copy this out because it's going to be the css file in the similar fashion let's go ahead and paste that in and just change this to css let's go ahead and save that and now if we go ahead and load it, we will see that our styling has also been applied to our component. So this is the server component, this is the app component, which makes it very clear. Now if you are actually a guy who likes things to be much more automatic and seamless like me, worry not because Angular gives you the power to create components and not worry about if they're included in your module and everything just through the CLI. So if we were to go to our PowerShell part, and we were to actually run a command that says ng generate component and we could say let's say so we have a server 
so we need somebody to let's say sub server so sub server now what the cli will do is it will go ahead and create everything that you need for your component so we see we have a sub server folder out here the sub server has a sub server.css file and this also has a sub server.component file now only we can go and put this so it has a component file has a paragraph that said sub server works there's also the testing file which we didn't create there's also the components file out here i mean the typescript file and as you guys can see it says app sub server so that is a selector that you use it with so let's go ahead and use this so we go ahead and put this into our servers html file and we can just say app sub server let's go ahead and save that and now what you should see is that there is a sub server works out here so basically what you did was you created a component through the cli and you basically just used it this is how you are going to be using most of your components creating most of your components and that is through the cli i just wanted to show you how you can do it manually too just so that you know how a server is written i mean how a component is written and what each line of code means when a component is also written now if you were to go ahead and compare this there is a constructor function and there is this ng on in it we will get to these parts later in our playlist because for now, if I would go into the nuances of ng on init and a constructor, it would only create chaos and confusion in your mind. So that was about components for now. So it's time for our first assignment. Okay, guys, so that is how you use and create components using the Angular CLI. Now, coming back to the server component that we created, I would like to bring to your notice a few different things that you can do. So first of all, let's go ahead and analyze the selector part. So if you have any experience with web development, you will know that a selector is basically a way of selecting stuff or elements on your HTML page. Now, when we say app server like this out here, this could be anything. This could be a property, this could be a class, or this could be an HTML element too. For now, this is an HTML element. But let me just show you, this can also be used as a class. So let's see, we say it's dot app server, and let's go ahead and save that so this is going to be dot app server now let's go ahead and find where we actually used our server so we have used it app server like this now if you were to comment this out and let's say we put in a div that had a class and it said app server now as you see this is the server component that you are viewing and the sub server works so let's go ahead and inspect that Let's go into the body. That's the app root. And then there's a div which has a class app server instead of an app server component. So what we did was that we created an app server and we made the class a selector. So the selector is basically a class now. Now the class can also have its own styling and that is basically how you do it. Now, instead of actually writing your template URLs like this, you could also let's command this out you could also say something like a template so your template could be just a template and you are going to put your template in these quotes now this could be something like sub server okay so this will basically put the app sub server in this template so instead of a template url you could be using a template too and instead of your styles url basically you can do some inline styling now, before we go ahead with our next topic, what I would like you all to do is solve an assignment for me. So this assignment will test how good you are at creating your components. So let's go back and just change everything back to the way it was. So let's save it. Let's save this, let's save this, save everything. So out here, we can just say app server again. And now that creates an app server for us. Okay, so this is save. And now I want you guys to do a basic assignment, actually. So let me just write down the instructions for the assignment. Okay, so for your first assignment, this is exactly what you are going to do. So as you guys can see on the screen, I have put down three instructions. So first of all, what you have to do is create three components called red, green, and yellow. 
now we have to use them in the app component part and then we have to give them some appropriate styling and probably an appropriate message so you guys can pause the video out here and go ahead and try and create these three components and then come back if you actually are successful or not also and check out the solution that i will provide you guys okay guys so that was the first assignment i just gave you all so i hope you guys had paused the screen when i told you that i'm giving you guys an assignment and i hope you guys actually try to solve it because in this part we are going to try and solve the assignment i just gave you so this part you can use to see how correct you were well it was a pretty easy assignment so i hope most of you guys got it because that means i could successfully teach you how to actually use components so for the solution we have created out here angular folder that says assignment one and it has nothing in it so let me just go ahead and open it with visual studio code out here if i were to go ahead and go to my source folder into the app folder and just go ahead into the spec.ts into the typescript file rather and we were to go ahead out here and I were to serve this you would see that there is nothing okay so if we were to just serve this file out here you would see that it is the normal application that ships with angular so let's just ng open and serve okay so as you guys can see it says welcome to assignment one and this is the basic application that angular ships with now what we're going to do is we're going to delete everything and we are going to start from scratch now let's go back and see what we actually wanted to do. So what we have to do was create three components called red, green, and yellow. So let's go ahead and do that first. So to do create these elements, first of all, let's go ahead and delete all this garbage that we do not need. Save it again. And let's just keep the title. So to keep the title, just pay attention to what I'm doing. Keep the title. This is very, you don't need to do this to get the assignment correct. All you need to do is make the components so this is just me being fancy with you guys so this or we could say welcome to assignment one make this an h1 so that it looks better yeah so welcome to assignment one so that's it now what we have to do is create three components so to create three components what we want to do is create a new terminal in visual studio code so that we can create the components really easily and out here we want to type ng generate component red and we're going to do this for three different times so we're going to have the red component we're also going to have the blue component and we're also going to have the yellow component now since we are doing this with the cli our app dot module automatically gets updated with red blue and yellow now all we need to do out here is use them because that is the second part we have to use them in app component so our app component is out here this is our app component so what we can do is say app red this will produce the red part this will produce the app and blue part and this will produce the app yellow let's go ahead and save this now what we see is red works blue works yellow works so we have successfully created three components and we have put them in our app component part. Now what we need to do is give them their styling. So let's go ahead and go into these separate components. Let's open up their styling files. We want to say, because we already know that it's a paragraph that works there. So paragraph will have border of, so since this is a blue component, we'll give it a blue border. So it'll be one PX solid and blue. And maybe we can also turn the color to sky blue i'm using very basic colors out here let's also copy this uh, because we are going to be using a very similar type of styling for red and yellow so let's go into red and let's face that we want this to be red and this to be crimson and let's go to yellow and let's say the same thing this is going to be yellow we could use here and we could also use another color maybe a much more paler yellow let's keep it dark because fonts need to be dark actually so let's save these 
let's save this file let's save this file and let's save this file now let's go back and see how it actually is working so blue works yellow works um, we need to go and um, put up some more styling for the yellow part because that seems to be kind of going haywire so let's go to yellow.css let's go here so we have actually done this in the app component let's save this go back to yellow go back to yellow.css paste this out here and let's save it so now our yellow is yellow our blue is blue and our red are red you can also add some new styling to them by adding a background color so this is also going to be a yellow or we can rather choose some different yellow maybe let's make it much paler on the yellow side let's copy this line put in red component .css. okay so for red we can choose something of pale red sorts that makes it like that and in blue we can choose something of a blue sort so for blue we could go for a paler blue and that should be much more paler let's save all of this now let's see so yeah we have a blue background a yellow background why isn't our red background working we haven't saved it it seems and our red background is working too so we have successfully completed our assignment one so i hope you guys are satisfied with the solution i hope you guys could do it on your own too so because that's exactly what matters okay so now that we have learned about how components are the building blocks we even made our own custom components and we even did an assignment on one so it's time we move on to the next topic and that is data binding so data binding is like communication well what are we communicating it's communication between your typescript file and your template so basically your business logic and your and what basically the user sees so suppose you click a button on a screen and you want to take some action according to that or you are retrieving some information from a calculation or from a server and you want to output that on a screen well you do that with the help of data binding now there are two types of data binding the first one is string interpolation and the second one is property binding so this is the way of you outputting something onto the screen so string interpolation and property binding so let's go ahead and see how we can do them so let's go back to our assignment that we had just done so first of all what we want to do out here is go to the modules and we actually want to remove all these components let's go ahead and just remove these components let's go ahead and remove these imports and then we can go ahead and just delete these files out let's delete that let's delete this let's also delete this now let's go back to our app component and we have to remove these so app module we have to actually save this too now that we have saved it we go ahead and see that it's just uh, it says welcome to assignment one now out here you see that we are using this double curly braces and this is string interpolation so what does string interpolation mean well it converts anything any variable any string like this into an interpolated format and it shows it to you on the screen so let me just give you a rather better example of a usage of string interpolation so let's go back to our app component.html and out here we want to say there is a paragraph and in this paragraph we are outputting some server status so let's say server is server with pid is go offline so we want to actually put out something like this so at this moment it'll just simply say server with pid is offline right but what if our server had a certain name so server name let's say dash 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 with pid dash 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 is at a status of dash 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 let's see now what we need to do is go ahead and go into our app component.ts file so that is our typescript file and now what we are going to do is create a few of what of these variables that we need so first of all is server 
name and let's say the server name is Apollo okay and we also need a server PID so server PID is gonna be let's say 11 and we also need a server status and then we can set the server status to offline so this will be a string so that's why we just surround them with our single quotes so now we can say something like this on our components.html page so if you remember we were getting the title of our general application that ships in with angular when you make a new angular project you see that it says welcome to so and so application so that was done with string interpolation if you remember it was the curly braces that held something like title in there right so out here what we can do is put some variable or even a function that will return a string or anything basically that can be converted into a string and that will be displayed out here between these curly braces so what we can do is we can reference the server name so our server name is basically kept in like this and then with pid so we can put the pid out here so this is a number so the number can also be converted into a string so therefore string interpolation will work in this process and we can also put in the server status of course so we put in the server status by referencing the variable that holds the server status okay so now we have done the string interpolation so let's go ahead and see what our output looks like so server name apollo with pid 11 that is process id 11 is offline now i had also said that we could put in a function out here so let's go ahead and create a function so in this function we will basically toggle the server ID so we can say toggle so in this function we will basically be toggling the server status so we will say something like toggle server status and this will return this dot server status equals to not okay so what we do out here is for toggling this we will say equals to false so if it's false let's just understand that it is going to be offline we could put in some logic to say that false will print out offline but let's not get into that for now so we can say something like or rather let's not deal with this let's do it the way it should be done not be lazy people now we can say there is a status flag and it is set to true or false in this case because it is offline now this dot service status flag will be made true out here so status equals to true so we're going to make it true or rather we could make it not of this dot server status status flag and status flag now that will work properly because this will basically convert it and there should be no spaces out there and we can say if this dot server status flag equals to true so we can say if this dot status flag equals to true we have to open more braces and we'll say server status this dot server status will be set to online okay and there we go and after this has been done we can just return this dot server status right so basically what is happening out here is we have set a flag okay missing white space quick fix so we can put in a triple equals just to make sure it's exactly true and not only check the equivalence that is and also check the value so out here what we are doing is we are setting a status flag to false and according to that status flag we are changing the server status to online or offline okay so now that we have put in this function we can use that function by calling it in our string interpolation method so just instead of putting a variable we can put in the function and this will change the server status to online now basically what we are doing here is really simple is it's returning a string and it's being converted into a string okay so now that we have toggled the server status to online and we did that through passing a function in the string interpolation so now let's understand how we can do property binding so every HTML element has some property or the other these properties list can be easily found on MDN that is the Mozilla developer network so let me just give you an example of a property so let's say we had a button to toggle the server status further from offline to online again and again instead of just being toggled from offline to online 
hard coded into the code so let's say we had a button and let's say this said toggle server status right so if we had something like a button like toggle server status so we have a button like this out here but it really doesn't do much at this moment but let's say just for the sake of showing property binding let's say the button was disabled and you wanted this button to be actually enabled after two seconds that your website has loaded up just so that there are no discrepancies in the button press okay so we can achieve that by writing a constructor function in our class component so out here you can make a constructor so we can say set timeout so we have to first give the time after which it will be enabled so let's say two and a half seconds so it's two and a half seconds and now we have to put in a logic of actually turning this button to be enabled so let's say we have a variable called button state so button state at this moment should be true because our button is disabled first it should stay disabled and then it should get enabled so we have to say this dot button state equals to false right so now that we have done that all we have to do is go ahead and bind this property so we do property binding by putting the property in between this square bracket and then binding it to the outcome of a variable or a function so out here we can say we are going to bind it to button state okay we need double quotes for this i'm sorry not single quotes so button state now what is happening out here after the constructor is going to get executed our button state is going to become false so disabled will become false and first of all it will be true because the button state being true for the first two and a half seconds and actually let's see this in action so our page is loading and after two and a half seconds our button becomes active so let me just show that to you again it's inactive for two and a half seconds and then it suddenly becomes active so this is how you perform property binding so what we just saw here is we saw string interpolation in action we passed of string interpolation arguments with variable names and we even did a function then following that we did property binding so for property binding we first created a button so that we can toggle the server status but we haven't really added that functionality yet we are yet to do that but what we did was we binded the disabled property of the button to a certain variable now this could have also been a function and it will be the same way you just pass in the function with the brackets and it'll work and now what we will see is something that is our next topic and that is event binding so event binding is basically um, binding dom events to certain logic that will reside in your typescript so we want to bind our toggle server status that we had created out here because we are basically toggling the server status and then returning the server status so we can basically do that by passing an event so every button has an event called click and to click we will pass the event toggle server status with the brackets now this will become active after 2.5 seconds and basically it's not working as we wanted it to so let's go ahead and inspect it okay so it's not working because we are toggling the server status out here and what we want to do is return the server status so it should actually work to be honest so this dot server status so if we were to just output the server status out here okay so we do not have a logic out here so to make it back to go offline so else we can just add something like else this dot server status equals offline so now that we have set up our function to even display offline and because we were first changing it back to online and there was no real logic to change it back to offline again so now that let's do that and now we can have a toggling happening out here so we can change it to online we can change it offline so now we have a button that can actually toggle our server status from online to offline and so forth and so on so that was event binding and property binding and we also saw string interpolation so with the help of event binding and property binding now we have a button that can actually make it offline and online.
but there's another way that we can do this and that is two-way binding so for two-way binding what we're going to see is basically we are going to combine property binding and event binding so let's try and do that so for event binding let's go back to our code editor and out here let's go to our html page and what we want to say out here okay so let's remove all this so we can make this server information so first of all we can have a form so basically we can have an input of type text and this will take in let's say let's put a placeholder and let's put in server name let's also put a button below this and this will be a submit button or rather instead of a button what we can do to show two-way binding is put in a paragraph and we are going to type out our server name out here and we are going to put in the server name here so server name is going to be here so this is basically string interpolation and what i am interpolating is the server name that we had created okay so this has a capital s so let's not forget that so our capital s should be out here and what we are going to do is basically use ng model so to use ng model what you need to do is go into your app module out here so in your app module what you need to import is basically the forms module so to import the forms module you have to say import forms module from other rate angular slash forms so that's it and we have to put this in single quotes and out here what we need to do is let's go ahead and see what is saying disable rule import spacing so we basically imported the forms module and this forms module will have a functionality called ng model so ng model will let us bind whatever is being typed to be actually binded to a certain variable so we can put that ng model property to our input so this ng model will be binded as an event and also as a property so we need to pass in the server name so let's see we have a server name called apollo out here so it's already pre-filled with apollo and let's say we want to name our server something else so let's call it the jigsaw so jigsaw could be the name of a server and as you guys can see it is being automatically updated out here so that is two-way binding so just to give you guys the difference between two-way binding and one-way binding what we can do out here is say put a placeholder so this is the same part we will have server name so what we can do is make another input and this time around we are going to put ng model as just a property so ng model with camel casing and we are going to say it will be binded to server name so let's bind it to server name and let's see what happens so now we have two inputs and everything is filled with apollo now if you see out here if i go ahead and change apollo out here it is not automatically changing in the paragraph two because it is only one way binded while out here if we were to give the name paul to our server it would automatically update it everywhere but if you were to go ahead and delete a little bit it's not really updating it out here because it's not two-way binding you need a event to actually go ahead and submit this so that your event and your property gets binded together and basically you have two-way binding then okay so that does it and just to make this a little more interesting let's make this something like h1 so we can put an h2 and let's say input server information okay so once we have that ready so we can say server name and the server id will be the pid basically so we have an input server name part and then we can display server information out here so display display server information what we can do is let's just copy this out so server pid is it the server pid i constantly forget it's server pid so that's why server pid will be presented and server status so now we basically have a small little server page going on and we have a button that can toggle the server status we have a place where we can input the server name 
So what we just saw out here is basically we saw string interpolation. So all this output is being shown to you through string interpolation. We are binding a property to this button and with the help of that we are toggling it for the first 2.5 seconds. This is disabled now and this will become enabled. Then we saw event binding where we actually toggle the server status with the help of a button. And then we also saw two way event binding where we put in an input method or an input element and we are constantly displaying what is there in the input with the help of um, two way binding. So this brings us to our second assignment for today. And in this video, I would like to say that again, please try and solve the assignment on your own. And these are the instructions for your second assignment. So for assignment two, what you have to do is create a page that can take the input of a first name using two way data binding and you have to output the name using string interpolation. So again for using two way data binding, remember you have to use ng model and to use ng model, you have to go and import the forms module and to your app into your apps.module.ts file and in that apps.module.ts file, you will also have to declare it out there. So don't forget to do all that. And in the output, you have to actually use string interpolation. Then we have to add a button to reset the name to a blank string. So this should be something like property binding, I guess. I won't know until I solve it myself. And again, this button should be disabled if the name field is currently empty. So I would suggest that you pause the video right here and you go ahead and solve this. And if you can't solve it, you can always follow along with me because I will be coding to the solution of this assignment right now. So let's go back to our code editor and what we're going to do now is try and solve assignment number two. So I'm going to keep on editing the assignment project that we had made. I'm not going to make new assignment project. So what we're going to do is basically remove everything from here. Let's remove everything. We will also be needing some new logic. So this is not going to work for us. So let's go ahead and remove that. We also don't need a constructor function. We don't need anything. We just need the class to be there. And that's all. At this moment, I will also let ng module be there in our apps.module because we will be needing it. So I'm not going to edit this out. So let me just say that I have saved everything. And now all we have is a blank canvas that we can start developing on. So our first instruction says that we have to create a page that can take the input of a first name using two way data binding. So let's see. We want the user to know that he is inputting his first name. So label, and this is going to be for. So it's going to be for first name. So we can say F name, something like this. And then we can say first name. And out here, what we can do is put an input that has type text and it also has a name of F name. So the label is now binded to our input. This is how you should properly always code. We also should put in a placeholder, even though we have a label, because that is just good practice. So we are going to say first name in the placeholder and now we have a place that we can put in our first name in so we can also put in a space out here first name is going to be here right and we also need to input our first name in a paragraph according to the second instruction so we can put it out in a paragraph and we can use string interpolation for this and we can just use a variable called name because we are only dealing with one name there's no last name so we can just create a variable called name. Now we go back to our TypeScript and we create a variable called name and let's keep it blank for now. Okay, we are not gonna use double quotes. We are gonna use single quotes and let's keep it blank for now. So now we can say our name which should be displayed out here. So basically what we need to do is two way binding. So that is pretty simple. We learned that really easily that we can do this to the ng model and we can bind it to the property of name or rather the variable name that we just created. So out here we will have a name and we can just go ahead and start typing now and our name gets typed out here. Now the other thing that we need to do is we need to add a button to reset the name to a blank string. So first let's go ahead and create that button for ourselves. So we need a button and this button should set reset name and basically it should have a function or an event whenever it's clicked. So whenever it's clicked, it should have a function that basically goes ahead and turns the name blank again. So we can have a function called reset name. So reset name is going to be our function. So let's go ahead and create that function now. So reset name is going to be our function and 
what we want to do is set this dot name equals to blank again. We can actually do this without the event, I guess. So we can fix the missing white space. Let's see if we are actually, if you do reset name, it goes ahead and resets the name to blank. So we have binded it to an event and that is the click event and we need reset name out here. We are not passing anything because it is directly being binded to the property or rather the event out here. So now we need to bind it to a property. So the property that we are going to bind it to is disabled. So the disabled property is going to now check a function basically to see if the name has any value or not. So this can be really easily done by actually saying something like name dot length zero, but we are not going to try and add code out here. So let's just stick to the functions. Actually, we could actually have done a tertiary operation and basically done it in one line, but why do that? So let's see check name. So check name is either going to return true or false. So now we have check name and what we can say is if this dot name equals to equals to and we can also set state so state is true we are going to need the state variable to actually handle the disabled functionality so if this dot name is equals to equals to equals to blank what we want to say is this dot state will remain true or what we can do is if it is unequals to this what we can do is say this dot state equals to so let's go over our logic again so if our state is true and if it is not an empty string rather we are going to turn our disable to false so if it is false out there what we need to do out here is say check name okay so we made a mistake we can't do that let's see inspect console and template can't bind to disable since it isn't a known property of button okay so disable is not the known property because it's disabled so that was the silly error that we had made now let's see let's go ahead and load it okay so check name is not a function okay so let's go ahead and use check name we actually forgotten to save this out here go ahead and put the white space there so now we have a button that can actually set the string to a blank string again but according to our assignment it says that this button should be disabled if the name is empty so this way we can actually practice our property binding so basically we have to bind the property disabled to a function that will basically return the state so let's say it is a function that is called check name and now let's go ahead and create this function so check name is going to be our function and put that in double quotes now let's go back to our app module out here so let's create a state first now the state is going to be false first of all and let's say we are going to have another function called check name and in check name what we want to do is check whether so we can do the checking part with an if statement so this dot name we are checking for the name if it is empty string and if it is an empty string what we want to do is make our button disabled and that can be done by just returning true in our state variable so we're going to set it to true and we are going to return it so return this dot state so if we return this dot state out here we are going to have a button now that is basically disabled okay First of all, we need to go ahead and check what we have done wrong. So we need to go ahead and save this. So check name is actually being passed. Now let's go ahead and reload that. So now we see that we have a button that is disabled, but as soon as we start typing, the button gets enabled and we can click it to basically put it back into disabled state and also making the first name string into a blank string. So this is the solution to assignment number two. I hope you guys had followed along with me. And if you had any doubts when solving it on your own, the doubts have been cleared now. Now let's move ahead and let's look at the last topic for our Angular basics today, and that is directives. So what exactly are directives? 
Well, let's head over to Angular's site and let's see what they are saying about directives. Well, it says that there are two kinds of directives out here. So one is attribute directive and one is a structural directive. So an attribute directive changes the appearance or behavior of a DOM element. So in short, a directive is basically an instruction to the DOM. Now this instruction may be to change the DOM due to some attribute or it could structurally change the DOM too. So that is a structural directive. So structural directives are basically used in places where you want to input a certain, let's say a division like out here, a division is being used with the directive ng if and we are outputting hero dot name out here. So what this is is basically there is an if statement and we will get to what ng if means just in a moment. But this is a directive and this has instructions written in a module which we will also get into future lectures about directives where we take a much much deeper look into what directives are and how custom directives can be built by you. But for now we are just going to understand what a directive does. So in short a directive is a structure and this structure gives instructions to the DOM. So let's look what a directive looks like and how directives can be made by just reading the documentation. So to build a directive, what we have to say is let's say we give a directive as app highlight. So we have to create a directive, say ng generate directive. So this is a CLI command out here. So we can generate directives like that. But for now, what we are going to do is we are going to use some built in directives to understand how attribute directives and how structural directives are actually working. So the directives that we are going to be using are ng if, ng else. So basically if and else and ng4. So these are the three directives that we are going to be using today. And after I show you how to use these directives, I will also be giving you an assignment and that will be your last assignment for this angular tutorial and we will wrap it up after that. In the future, we will be actually discussing every single bit that we have learned about today that is components, data binding, two way data binding, directives, everything will be done in much more detail. And when we are doing this in detail, we will have an overarching project. So we will be building a project through the course of this playlist. And by the end, you will feel pretty confident that you can go out there and pretty much crack Angular interview job out there because we will be teaching you how to build an app. And in the end, we will also train you for Angular interview questions. OK, but for now, let's just focus on how to use the built in directives that ship with Angular. So to use the built in directives, let's see what we can do. So the first directive that we want to use is basically an ng if directive. So let's see what we can do to show ng if. So ng if is basically to show something structurally. Let's put up an h1 that says this is an example of ng if. Now we want to show something if a variable is true and we want to show something else if it is false, right? So we can do that by simply saying P. So we will show a paragraph and let's say ng if. So we are going to tie it up to an expression and we are going to call this expression a flag. And we are going to say flag is true and we are going to say flag is false otherwise. So out here to show flag is false otherwise, we are going to use something called a local reference. So a local reference is used within the ng template. So for the ng template, we have to give a local reference name. So let's call it the else block. And in the else block, we want to put out a paragraph that says flag is false. Now we need some way to actually toggle this flag. So let's create a button. So we are going to say something like toggle flag and out here for toggling flag we are going to put an event and we are going to bind this event to a function that toggles our flag so we are going to call this function toggle flag okay so we have our template created now all we need to do is add the business logic for this so for all the logic that we need to do is create a variable called flag first of all so let's go ahead and delete all this that we don't need so we are going to have a variable called flag and flag will be first of all set to true. Now there is also going to be a function called toggle flag and in this function what we are going to do is we are just going to toggle it. Now to toggle this all we can do is this dot flag equals to 
not of this dot flag so this is a really easy way to toggle a variable and just now we can just return this dot flag so since we are doing that so now what we can do is save this and let's see how that actually works so it says flag is true and flag is false so flag is false is actually not being displayed because we have not referenced this local reference that we have created so we have a local reference and we need to create it and we do that by saying else we create the else block now let's go ahead and save that let's see flag is true and now flag is false flag is true flag is false so to make sure that we are actually putting up two different paragraphs so let's go ahead and inspect this let's go into our body let's go into app root and let's see this button so this has a paragraph created out here so let's toggle this and a new paragraph gets created which says flag is false now flag is true flag is false flag is true flag is false so this is a brilliant way to actually show something very conditionally now i can show you this is a other block that we are actually showing instead of one block being constantly just modified it is a separate block in itself so that is a very important thing to know so let's go ahead and do that again so let's save it and now let's go ahead and see what we can get so in our head or rather in the body we have the app root and now we have paragraph that says flag is true and now there is another paragraph with the id flash which is a very wrong way to spell false but it proves the point that this is a new block in itself so this is how you can use ng if now let's look at another interesting inbuilt directive that ships with angular and that is ng style so with ng style what you can do is you can give dynamic styling depending on a certain condition now if you analyze what we have out here we do have a certain condition which is where the flag is true or flag is false now what we want to do is we want to color this this is an example of ngif into red or green if flag is true or false respectively so we can do that very easily with the help of something called ng style so with ng style what we do is we give a property now this property may not be in single quotation marks so you can say color and what you can do is you can put an expression now you can say something like a function that is get color and you could execute that now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and create this function called get color so we are going to get the color and we are going to return a color that is probably a string according to the flag so if so what we want to say is if this dot flag is equals to equals to true we want to return we want to return green and if it is false we want to return red so let's go ahead and see so as you guys can see this is green right now and this turns red and then turns green and red again so what we did basically we passed an expression and in this expression we are putting in a color and the get color method is returning a string which either says red or green so this is how you can dynamically add styles to your elements on your html page now another way to do dynamic styling is with the help of ng class so what we can do out here is we can add a class to an element dynamically so let's say we have another h2 and let's say this is just an example of ng class now what i want to do is we want to turn this so the class we want to add is basically let's call it white and we want to add this when get color returns true let's say so we just want to go ahead and paste that logic out there and now what we have to do is go into the app component css file and create a class called white and this class will basically put a black border border 1px solid black it will rather let's make it a red and then we want a background color of let's say black and we want the font color to go white so this is a bunch of styling that we are adding which is basically the real reason you use classes in css so that you can use a bunch of styling together now that we have created the class let's go ahead and save all our files and let's go ahead and see what it looks like 
So this is what it looks like. This is just an example of ng class. Now, when this is set to false, the class is removed. Let me just show that to you. So if we go ahead in the body part and go into app root and just look at this class that will be added. So we add a class called white and then we remove a class called white class called white and this is how ng class can be used to put in all sorts of dynamic styling into your HTML elements with the help of ng class. Okay, so the next directive that we are going to have a look at is called ng4. So let me just give you guys a quick example of how to use ng4 before I dive into the last assignment of this tutorial. So ng4 is used when you actually want to iterate through an array. So let me just show you what I mean. So let's say you had a bunch of names or let's make something very viable. So first of all, let's call this something like the student roster. So h1. So this is called the student roster. Now suppose you had a method. So input. And what we are going to say is placeholder is name and out here we also want to display the name so all the name of the students we will want to display so student roster and there will be a button to say submit so this will say submit student name and this will have a function so whenever we click it we want to add the name that we just entered into let's say an array so we can say add is the name of the function now what we want to do is go ahead and first of all create a student roster so student roster is equals to let's say let's add some pre-built students so aria and let's say rohit and let's say opasana now what we want to do is let me just fix these white spaces up now what we want to do is we want to display the student roster and then we also want to add to the student roster every time the button is clicked so we have a function for that and it's called add and basically what we want to do is we want to push an element so that could be a current name so current name could be blank for now and let's leave it like that and what we want to say is this dot student roster dot push we want to push in this dot current name so what this will do is this will push in the current name let's go ahead and make a place so that we can display it now the whole point is that we want to display it in one single item we do not want to create let's say a paragraph for every time this list has to be populated so what we can do is we can simply create a list item and out here we can just say ng4 let's say names in the student roster so student roster so is that how we had named it student roster and it's exactly how we had named it and what we want to display out is the names so what we have done right now is we are pushing in something but what exactly are we pushing in well we need to add that to our input so what we need to do is say ng model and we are going to ng model this into the current name so now that we have done that now what we want to do is we just want to interpolate the name out here so this will just display the names so this is going to be names let's go ahead and save that let's see that if it displays the names so we have the names Arya Rohit and Upasana so let's say someone like Rahul also joins the class and we can say submit student and Rahul is now added to the student roster okay so this is how you can basically use ng4 we have one list item and basically it is going around and circulating through everything that is there in this array just out here so now that we have seen the usage of ng if ng if else and ng for let's go ahead and do our last assignment let's not forget we also saw how we can use dynamic styling so we are also going to incorporate that into our assignment so let me just go ahead and type out the instructions for your assignment okay guys so this is your last assignment i will again remind you that for assignments you have to pause the screen and try and do the assignment on your own and then you can compare your solution with the code along part that comes after the assignment so for assignment number three we have create a button to toggle a paragraph display the paragraph could be saying anything so after that we have to lock the number of times the button was clicked okay so it says button out here but its button was clicked 
and after the fifth click we have to give some specific style to the log okay so this seems like a pretty easy thing to do what we have to do out here is basically get rid of everything that is here and let's first create a button that says toggle display and then we can add a paragraph that says lorem ipsum so lorem ipsum is just a random paragraph so let's go ahead and see this so this says toggle display but toggle display at this moment does nothing so we have to put a functionality into the click so click will basically return true or false so we can bind this to a function that let's say toggle display so this will return true or false so we have to go ahead and create the toggle display method first so toggle display and what we want to say is this dot state let's say so let's create a state variable first so state is going to be true and toggling is basically what we had learned that we have to turn it into something that it is not so this dot state equals to not of this dot state and that should do it for us so this will toggle the display so now that we have toggled the display now all we have to do is bind this logic so we say ng if and we only want to show this if state is equals to equals to true so if that is what we have done correctly we are toggling the display and this is true now what we need to do another thing is according to the instructions of the assignment is that we have to log the number of times the button was clicked so what we need is basically a counter to count the number of times we have clicked the button now every time the button is clicked we want to actually increase the counter and we can simply do that with an incremental statement so this dot counter now what we want to do is we want to say out here we want to create a paragraph and this will have ng4 and so click of clicks so rather counter so for ng4 this needs to be pushed into an array so we are going to say button click okay so there's another way to do this we don't really need a counter or rather we can make counter into an array itself and when this is clicked all we need to do is say this dot counter dot push a counter dot length plus one so we are going to say this dot counter dot length plus one so the length initially is zero so this should just go ahead and add it to this counter now what we want to do is we also want to cycle through this array of counters so clicks in counters and what we want to do is we want to print out the click information so let's see so now that we have actually put the logic to push the length of a counter into our array we need to do and cycle this array so to cycle the array we are going to create a paragraph and we're going to say ng4 and we're going to say clicks of counter and what we are going to try and interpolate out here is the counter or rather the clicks and let's see if that works so out here we have our display we're going to click it once click it twice and we can see it goes on and on and on and we have kind of created a counter and this is kind of logging it all down now that we have set up our counter for our toggling all we need to do is follow the last instruction and that is after the fifth click we have to give some specific style to the log okay so we can do this with the help of ng styles so ng styles let's see we want to make the color of our font blue only when get length is more than five so get length is a function so this will return some value or the other so let's go ahead and create that too so get length is going to react and create if let's see this dot counter dot length is greater than four then we want to return the string blue else we want to return the string black so now we have a function that returns something and we have binded that function with the color style with the use of ng style directive 
So let's go ahead and see if this works for us. So let's toggle the display one, two, three, four, five. And that has turned our list into a blue list just after five. So this is how you would approach the solution to assignment three. What is React.js? React is a declarative, efficient, and flexible JavaScript library for building user interfaces. And also, it lets you to compose complex UIs from small and isolated piece of code called components. Right, I'll make it more simpler and introduce React to you. React is just an open source JavaScript library that is used for building user interfaces. So it was developed and it is maintained by Facebook and it is widely used by many companies and organization worldwide. React.js allows developers to build the reusable UI components that can be easily combined to create complex and dynamic user interfaces. So this makes it easier to manage the code and reduces the time and effort required to build and maintain the applications. So why it is so easy because react uses a virtual dom that is nothing but the document object model so this dom will be keep track of the changes to ui and update only the part of page that need to be updated so which can be result in improved performances this virtual dom approach also makes the react js high effective and fast so even with the large and complex user interfaces so finally, I will tell you that React.js is a powerful and flexible front-end library that enables the developers to build fast, efficient, and dynamic user interfaces. With that, we will see why it is so popular and the features of React.js. So I'll start with the main important feature that is reusable components. So here in React.js, the one of the most important feature is considered as the reusable components. So in React, it is the ability to create the reusable UI components. So these components can be made easy by combining to build the complex UI interfaces. By reducing the amount of code that need to be written and making it easy to maintain and manage. So at the end, so this kind of feature will lead you to faster development and reduce the time to market your projects. And the next feature is virtual DOM. Here React uses the virtual DOM as I mentioned previously. So which acts as an intermediary between the applications and the actual DOM. So the virtual DOM keeps track of the changes to the UI and updates only the part of the page that need to be updated rather than updating the entire page, right? So this can be greatly improve the performance of the applications and it ensures the fast and effective updates. So by using this uh, virtual DOM, the next feature comes that is the fast and efficient. By using the virtual DOM and other performances optimizations, React can be very fast and efficient even with the large and complex UI interfaces, right? So this can lead to improve the user experiences and it reduce the load times. Nowadays, if you see React is widely adopted. Why? Because it is easy to learn. React has a relatively small learning curve compared to other front-end frameworks and libraries. So this can make it accessible to the developers of all levels of experiences and can help to reduce the time and effort required to get started with building applications. And also you need to keep in mind that the React has large and growing community of developers and users, which means there is a wealth of resources, tutorials and support available to help the developers get started and overcome some of the challenges. So these kind of communities can also help drive innovative and development, making React a strong and evolving platform. The next benefit is popularity and adoption of React. Here, the React is widely used and popular with many major companies and organizations, which are using for their web applications. 
so this popularity and adoption can help ensure that the react will continue to be developed and supported by making it a reliable platform for building applications so i hope you all also will join the community and the final one is improved user experiences right here by allowing the developers to build dynamic interactive and some responsive user interfaces react can greatly improve the overall user experiences of application so this can lead to increase the engagement and satisfaction by making the application more successful and effective so i hope you understood why it is so popular with these features right now let us jump into the setup environment so as you know react is a javascript library for building the user interfaces and it requires few tools to get started right so the first one is node.js here react requires node.js to install on your system like node.js is a platform for running javascript code outside of the browser so you can download this latest version of node.js from the official website that is node.js.org so i'll show you now go and type node.js.org and you will get into this site and you can see here the latest version is 18.14.0 right you need to click on that and you need to follow the installation instructions for your operating system so i'm using windows so i already have node.js so we'll just verify go to comment prompt and just type node and you will get the version so i had installed 18.12 version so that's fine you can install the new version if you don't have right the next one is to install visual studio code so you know visual studio is a code editor you can go to the visualstudio.com so you will get into this site and you can install for windows or any operating system that you are using for so this is also simple installation you can click on it and follow the installation instructions also you can use sublime text and atom also so i would recommend you to install visual studio code or any code editor that feels comfortable so once you install both of the prerequisites then we will move on and create a project directory for that go to terminal or command prompt so i'm using command prompt now i will initialize the project by typing npx create react app then give space and mention the project directory here let me give my hello world right hit enter so as you can see a new react app is created wait until the configuration is getting over so as you can see everything is installed successfully and you can see happy hacking over here right now that we have a react project set up you can start the development server in your terminal by navigating to your uh, project directory so i have navigated to the project directory and just type npm that is node package manager and start so by doing this uh, you will start the development server so this will start the development server and you will be able to view your react app in your web browser in local host 3000 as you can see our uh, react app has been successfully shown here right so by following these steps you should now have a fully functional environment for development react app you are now ready to start building your own react app and explore all the features and benefits of this powerful library called react now that we just saw how to install the react and other prerequisites now we will look into the tool chains so i have some of the popular tool chain listed over here 
and uh, we will see here the first one is create react app so this is an officially supported command line tool for creating react projects so it set up a basic react project with all the required dependencies and a development server so it will allow you to start building your app right away now the next one we have next.js so this is a popular framework for building the server side rendered react application so this includes the features like automatic uh, code splitting optimized performance and easy integrations with other technologies like typescript and graphql right so the next one is gatsby so this is nothing but it is a static site generator that uses react to build fast and efficient website and the final one we have is redux so it is a state management library for javascript applications that provides a centralized store and it reduces to manage and update the application state in a predictable way so this is a popular state management library so that's often used with react and also it provides a way to manage your application state in a single centralized store and making it easier to manage and debug your applications so these are few just examples for popular tool chains with react the exact tools that you choose will depend on your specific needs and requirements for your project with this i hope you all understood the tool chains next we will move on to how to create a hello world app so you know that we have already created a development server over there so we will start there itself you can see this is a simple react syntax for hello world it's just have import react from import and we have a react dom and we have just in one hello world in a h1 tag so now that we have a development environment set up right so let us write hello world application now so let us go to visual studio code so as you can see i have opened visual studio code and just go to the files here open folder right you can see my hello world and select folder so with that you will get that folder inside your visual studio right so you need to just uh, go to index.js into the uh, src file so here uh, i have just uh, written the import react from react and import react dom and i have the element over here that is h1 and i have just um, rendered this in the root so if i run this i should get this hello world in h1 tag so this is how you write uh, a simple hello world program in react now we will jump into the core concept of react that is component so what are components components are independent and reusable bits of code uh, they serve the same purpose as javascript functions do so it works in isolated and uh, written html right so in other words we can say that every application you will develop in react will be made up of the pieces of components yes that's true right so what are components in general so they are uh, building blocks of react js applications right so they allow you to split your user interfaces into reusable independent pieces that can be composed to form the complex uis so there are two types of components in react js one is the functional components the other one is class components here functional components so these are uh, stateless components that only receive the props as an input and renders html so they can be defined using the functions that returns jsx that is nothing but the javascript with the html syntax right now if you look into the class components so these are stateful components that can be managed their own interval state and have access to the lifecycle method so they are defined using a class that extends the react.component class 
so here components can receive the inputs in the form of uh, props and can manage their own interval state the state is an object that holds the data specific to a component and it can be updated using the set state method react.js components can also manage their own behavior for example by handling the user events and making the api calls so when a component state or props changes here the react.js will automatically re-render the component okay and by allowing your application to stay up to date with the latest data here the components in react.js are designed to be modular and reusable so this will allow you to build the complex applications by composing the simple independent components for uh, examples of the components a button component that displays a text label and triggers a callback function when clicked right so a form component that renders input fields and handles the user submission so that is upon the forms and the next one will be card component that displays an image title and description etc right so these are the examples of the component so at the end of this session we will be looking into a project it is of to-do list project so i will be explaining all of these components and buttons how they work everything so stay tuned so this is all about the theory in the components now let us just move into jsx in react right jsx is an extension for javascript that allows the developers to embed the xml like syntax within their code by making it easier to write the components and templates so it is self-explanatory now let us directly jump into what is jsx so as i said jsx is a syntax extension for javascript that makes it easier to write the components so it was developed by facebook and it is used in many popular frameworks such as react okay now with this jsx you can write the components using the syntax that are resembles the html right by making it easier to read and understand and if you see some of the benefits of uh, using jsx is it improves the readability and maintainability of the code and also it allows for reusable components and it can simplify the complex ui logic okay now if you see the jsx syntax so it uses xml like syntax right for example the following code shows you like how to create a button using jsx so this is a simple syntax for creating a button and if you see the next one embedded expressions so here jsx also uh, can also be used to embed the expression within the components so by using the curly braces here you can see we have used the curly braces right so these are if you want to embed some of the expression inside syntax then you can use curly braces for this and a uh, jsx is most commonly used in react where it is used to define the components to use jsx in your react projects you will need to install a transpiler such as babel so which will convert your jsx code into regular javascript that can run in your browser so if i want to conclude what is jsx it is nothing but a powerful syntax extension for javascript that can make it easier to write the components in the react so uh, with its improved readability reusable components and ease of use so it is a great tool for building complex user interfaces so i hope you understood jsx we will move on to embedding expressions okay what is embedding expression like how do you embed expressions inside the react so embedding expressions in react it refers to the incorporating the dynamic values such as data from state or props so if you can see here in the below example as you can see we have uh, uh, the constant name as edureka uh, and the element is welcome to so here we have embedded the name over here so uh, here i will be getting the output as welcome to the name has edureka 
So here this value will be embedded inside this name inside this curly braces. Okay, that is what this embedding expressions means. So this will allow you to create a dynamic and interactive user interfaces. Okay, for example, the values might be changing in some of the applications, right? So that will be added here in the curly braces. So that is the simple logic behind that. So here I will give you another example here. So I have a piece of code. So this example here, uh, as I mentioned you in the earlier example, I had Edureka over there. Here I have John Duke. And this name will be embedded inside this hello John Duke. For example, uh, you get any mail from any websites. For example, you get a mail from Edureka, right? So here uh, they will be just uh, sending you mail by telling hi and your name. For example, if I get hi Tejashwini and they will be some messages, right? So that hi, that name is there, no? So that will be dynamically changed each time. So in case I get any mail, it comes in my name. And if you get any mail that comes in your name, that the name will be changed dynamically according to the persons. And you can even embed any valid JavaScript expressions within the curly braces. Here, uh, this includes the things like arithmetic operations, uh, function calls, ternary operators, etc. So if I show you another example over here, so I have some constant number over here. For example, I have number 1 and number 2 and 10 and 20 respectively, right? So here uh, the output shows the number of sum of number 1 is 10, right? So here the number 1 is 10 and the number 2 is 20 and it will give you the sum of both number 1 and number 2. And it is important to note that when embedding expressions in React, you should only use the expressions that are guaranteed to be side effect free. Such as simple calculations, string concatenations or array access. So here uh, you should not use expressions that causes side effects. So for example, the function calls or set state within the curly braces. So has this can lead to unexpected behaviors. Uh, and additionally, it is a good practice to keep your expression simple and concise to improve the readability and maintainability of the code. So we have next topic that is rendering elements. So in React.js, rendering elements refers to the process of displaying the UI components on the screen. So unlike browser DOM elements, the React elements are plain objects and are cheap to create. Here, the DOM takes care of the updating the DOM to match the React elements and element describes what you want to see on the screen, right, as I said previously. So here an element is a plain JavaScript object that represents a part of UI. So when the React updates the element, it updates the UI accordingly. So whatever it, it has been changed, it automatically changes in the screen also. Right. So here we call this root DOM node because uh, everything inside it will be managed by a React DOM. So if you can remember that uh, I have created Hello World program previously, right? So I have mentioned root over there. So whatever I change inside the element, so everything will be changed through this root. Okay. Now let us look into rendering list. Rendering list in React.js refers to the process of displaying a list of elements on the user interfaces using React component, right? So this can be achieved by mapping over an array of data and creating a React component from each item in the list. So if I make it more simple, for example, you will often want to display some of the multiple similar components from a collection of data, right? So you can use this JavaScript array method to manipulate any array of the data. So here I have shown the image over here, right? Here to do's is an array of to do items. See to do's is an array of to do's items. 
the todo list components map over this array and creates a list of items that is inside the li for each todo items and this key prop here you can see the key you no know? so this property is added to each list item to make sure that react can efficiently update the list if the data has been changed this key property tells react which array item each component corresponds to so that it can match them up later right so this becomes an important if your array items can move next we have conditional rendering in react you can create a distinct component that encapsulates behavior you need then you can render only some of them depending on the state of your application here Conditional rendering in React is a process of rendering components based on certain conditions or state. The state of component can change dynamically and React allows you to conditionally render components based on the state of your application. Here React uses JavaScript to control the rendering of the components. To perform conditional rendering you can use the javascript control structures such as if else statement ternary operator and switch statement conditional rendering in react works the same way that the condition works in javascript use this uh, javascript operators like if or the other conditional operators to create the elements representing the current state and let the react update the ui to match them next we have handling events first let us define what are events events are actions or occurrence that happens in the browser such as a user clicking on a button a page finishing loading or an element being updated react allows us to handle these events and respond to them with the specific actions in react we handle events using the event handlers an event handler is a function that is executed when an event is triggered as i said if a user clicks on a button or etc to create an event handler in react we use the syntax on event name which is equals to in a flower bracket we use the function name okay where on event name is the event where we want to handle and the function name is the function that we will be executing the event in is triggered as you can see here we have the syntax difference between the html and the react code okay so here as you can see in html we have the events that are named using the lower cases but in case of react we use only camel case where that is the valid syntax in react and in html you can pass a function as a string as you can see in the example here we have a button where this is a event handler on click edureka and the button name is edureka so when the person clicks on the button called edureka the function will be changed or updated automatically so when it comes to react it is done with the jsx then you can pass a function has the event handler here i have given the same example but you can notice it is in the camel case on click and we have embedded the expression in the name of edureka right so let us take an example of a button component that increases a counter every time it's clicked here the component will have a state count that will store the value of a counter when the button is clicked we will call the handle click function that will be increasing the value of the counter right if you can see here here is a function and i have two parameters that is count and set count i'm using the use state over here so here this will act as an handle click function where it will be increased the value by 1 every time the handle click is called okay so here as you can see i have mentioned a button over here so let us take a look at the output you can see click me button over here so 
if any user clicks on it the handle click function is triggered and you will get the output or the value to be increased by one so you can see here you have clicked one times okay fine now i will click another time here and you can see the changes over here right so this is how we handle the event over here next we have binding event handlers the first and foremost common way to bind the event handlers is by using the arrow function in the on click property here event binding tells the browser that this function should be called whenever this event is triggered or in other words whenever the event is triggered the function which is bind with the event should be called here for example let's say we have a button in our component and we want to handle the click event of the button let me take the same example over there okay in this example we are using the arrow function you can see here right so this arrow function is to bind the click event of the button so whenever the button is clicked it will log the message button clicked in the console so this is one of the way now we will move on to composing components in general what is composing components okay imagine that you are building a website and where your website will be containing some of the components such as navbar search bar some of the text some buttons etc right so here those components are not built together they were built separately and they were put into uh, your website by composing all the components that you have already prepared right so that is the same logic applied over here so uh, components are the piece of isolated code right so those are composed into a website so for example we will look into the code here you can see we have import react and you can see some of the to do list components over here and you can see the submit button and its function and you can see the form over here where we will be having the inputs like text submit buttons everything right so here these are small components so these are put in together and made it to be a website so as you can see here we have a text field to add your uh, task to do list task for example learn react so i will hit enter and i will just add task so if completed task it should go away if not uh, it is always incompleted right so if incompleted task is clicked you will get a motivation quit and you will have a delete task so this is the project that we are going to work so here this text this input field these buttons are each component so these are each components that i have put into and made a website so this is called composing of components right so as you can see here we have single components for example let's imagine this has a button this has a text this has a input field okay so these are put it together and made the website here from passing data from a parent to child component we use props right so here props data is sent by the parent component and cannot be changed by the child component as they are read only right here we have the props and here we have state so whatever components that is sent by props that cannot be changed by the state over here because it is props is a parent component and whereas state is a child component where these child components are only to be read only next we will move on to props and state we will explore what are props and states and their differences in react props in short for properties and they are used to pass data between the react components here react's data flow between the components is unidirectional it is like from parents to child only where 
props are the arguments passed into the React components. Here the props are passed to the components via HTML attributes, where props are passed to components via HTML attributes. In simple, props allow you to pass data from one component to another component as an argument, where state holds information about the components. Here, let's imagine uh, we have a parent that is props and a state that are children, right? Where here the props will assign some of the information to the uh, state or uh, the props will pass data from one component to another component where the state will be only containing the informations. Now we will look into the prerequisites. You might be wondering what are the prerequisites to learn such a great JavaScript library. There are quite important prerequisites that you must follow. The first thing, you should have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Then you need to install and have a basic knowledge of Node Package Manager that is NPM and to practice and implement the code, you need to have a code editor. Without implementing it into a practical way, you will not understand any topic in coding, no matter what language you wish to learn. And finally, the most important prerequisite that you must have is consistency in learning. Do not jump straight into the React.js roadmap without understanding the React.js concepts. Before learning React, you should have a good understanding of these JavaScript topics that you must know some of the basic syntax that you will use in the JavaScript. Just have an idea of ES6 plus features, arrow functions and template literals. After that, understand the spread operator, await syntax and import and export syntaxes. And also you must know array methods, object property shorten, destructuring and rest operator. Once you understand with the JavaScript topics, then we will see the basic things that we need to learn in the React.js. First, understand the file and folder structure. And you all know that React is made up of components. So you need to have a deeper understanding in components, JSX, props, state, events, styling and conditional rendering. So these are all the most important concepts that you need to understand. Now we will look into some of the essential hooks to learn. So here we have listed few hooks such as use state, use effect, use ref, use context, use reducer, use memo, use callback. So once you are completed with the hooks, we will move on to the actual roadmap here. Now let's learn some of the React.js UI frameworks. You can consider learning Material UI and Design, Chakra UI, React Bootstrap, Ribbus, Blueprint, Semantic UI React. So these are all the most important and useful React.js UI frameworks that you can consider. Now. In this, Material UI and Design and Chakra UI are some of the most important frameworks that you can learn. After this, let's move on to some of the React.js packages. Here we have some of the most popular React.js packages that you can use and practice with it. Like React Router, React Query, Axios, React Hook Form, Style Components, Storybook, and Framer Motion. Now let's learn how to manage state with state management tools. So here we have some of the state management tools like Redux, Mobex, Hook State, Recoil, and Akita. After learning React.js fundamentals, now you can consider learning Next.js also. Here are the some of the important things that you can learn in Next.js like file and folder structure that we have learned before also. And you can also see what is static site generations and server side rendering and also have a look at incremental static regenerations 
डायनामिक पेजेस सी एस एस और एस ए एस एस मॉड्यूल्स लेजी लोडिंग मॉड्यूल्स ए पी आई राउटर्स सो यू कैन ऑल्सो कंसिडर लर्निंग दीज सो वंस यू हैव कंप्लीटेड दी फंडामेंटल्स नाउ वंस वी कंप्लीट विद द फंडामेंटल्स कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ रियक्ट चेयर्स नाउ इमेजिन यू हैव क्रिएटेड रियक्ट चेयर्स एप्लीकेशन यूजिंग दीज फंडामेंटल्स एंड कॉन्सेप्ट दैट वी हैव डिस्कस्ड हियर now the next step that we have to follow is testing your react application right for this you can consider these few testing tools like jest testing library cryptpress enzyme jasmine and mocha after you test your react applications with these tools and your react application is qualified without any errors then you can consider deploying it right So here we have some of the deploying platforms like Netlify, Vercel, Firebase, GitHub Pages, Heroku and Render. Using these platforms you can easily host or deploy your React JS applications. Finally we have some of the project ideas that you can implement using these roadmap Here we are just giving you few examples and you can create your own ideas too. Here for example you can create some real estate apps, travel companion apps, e-commerce websites, voice assistant news apps, portfolio websites, budget tracker, chat apps, video chat apps and you can also clone some of the existing apps too like Uber, Swiggy, anything you wish like. Now what if i tell you everything we saw on the road map is in our fingertips if you follow a single path you're right edureka's react js certification course covers every topic that we saw in the road map now let us go and explore all about react js hooks starting from what is react js hooks React JS hooks are functions that allow you to use the state and other React features in functional components. They were actually introduced in React 16.8 as a way to make it easier to share the stateful logic between the components and also to make it easier to work with the functional components. Here the most commonly used hooks are the use state, use effect and use content. so these are considered more important or most useful hooks so other than this we will also explore some of the additional hooks too for example use reducer use memo use callback and use layout effect so these are the hooks that we will be exploring in this session we will see each of it in a detail form right now before that we will see what actually the hooks are now let us go back and see before react hooks So before react hooks if you wanted to use the state or other features in the component then you had to use a class component here the class component are more complex than the functional components and can make it difficult to reuse the stateful logic here with the react hook you can use the state and other features in the functional component which makes it easier to share the stateful logic between the components and also it makes it easier to work with the functional components here the react hooks differ from the traditional react class component because in that they allow you to use the state and other features in the functional components instead of having to use the class components and additionally you must keep this in mind here the react hooks do not require the use of this keyword which makes them less verbose and easier to understand and why do we say here the class component is more difficult so here the class component in react are based on this javascript class syntax which can make them difficult to understand for the developers who are new to the react or who are more familiar with the functional programming additionally these class components often include the boilerplate code such as the constructor functions and binding the methods to the correct context which can add unnecessary complexity and make the code harder to maintain and the most important feature of this react hook is it allows the creation of custom hooks 
which are reusable functions that can hold the state or the logic that can be shared between the multiple components. Here, this makes it easy to extract and reuse the logic that is used in the multiple components. So, at the end, this can make the code base more maintainable and easier to understand. One of the main advantages of React Hook is that they make it easier to share the stateful logic between the components, as I said in the previous statement. So, this is because the state and the logic can be extracted into a single hook and it can be reused in multiple components rather than having to duplicate the logic in multiple class components. React Hook also make it easier to test the functional components since they do not rely on this keyword and the lifecycle methods. Now let us see the types of hooks we have in this session. Here we have three major hooks that is use state, use effect and use context. So these are considered to be basic hooks and more important hooks or commonly used hooks. And additionally we will also look into use reducer, use memo, use callback and finally use layout effect. So these are the hooks which we will be covering in this session. Other than this, we also have many other hooks. So if you want to learn more about hooks or more about React.js, you can enroll to our Edureka's React.js certification training course, where we will be providing you with an hands-on and a live demo sessions. So here, we will get started with our first hook, that is use state. So let us see what is use state and how does it work in our code and I will give some of the tips that how can you use the use state inside the code. Now according to the definition, use state is a hook in React that allows you to add the state to the functional components. State is a way of storing and managing the data that can change over time and can affect the components behavior and rendering. Though I will explain it in a detailed form. Here this use state is a hook in React that allows you to manage the state in the functional component. Prior to the introduction of hooks, the state management in React was only possible in class-based components. So, with this use of use state, you can now manage the state in the functional component as well. And also, the use state is a function that takes a single argument, so which is the initial state. After that, it returns an array with two elements, that is, current state and a setter function for updating the state. The current state is a value of the state and the setter function is used to update the state. So here I will explain this in a detailed form with an example. So I am using Visual Studio Code. So here I will show you a small demo. For that I will jump into Visual Studio Code. Now as you can see I have already created a app called Counter App. So you can see here the counter app and here I have created a counter.jsx inside the source folder and inside the components folder. Now let us write a small react hook example. First I will import the react component from react. For that write just import react from react okay. After that, I will import use state hook from the React package after this line. For that, you just need to write import in the bracket use state. So you will have some of the recommendations over here and you need to find use state over here. So state. And you can notice that I am writing in a camel case statement. Here the React.js takes the import in a camel case. After this, now that we have imported the component and use state from react. At the same time, we need to export this file to the index.js, right? So that the output will be shown in the browser. So that don't forget to export this file to the index.js. So I will export. So just type export default counter because my file name is counter. So I'm writing counter and you just need to go inside the index.js and include the counter file inside the react strict mode. Now let us get back to the counter.js file. So now let us declare a new state variable. So let us call this as count. 
here the u state returns a pair of value that is the current state and the function that updates it as i said in the explanation so that we will just write a function called counter inside that just write const and pass the values that is the current state and the function that updates it right so here the current state is this count and then we will set the count so this will be the function that updates it and in our component we use the u state hook by invoking it and passing the initial value for our state variable which is zero so i'll use that so i'm using the u state so i'm passing the value as zero okay now let us return this so i am wrapping this with a div tag now here we use the count variable to display the current number of clicks in the page and in the button tag here we use this on click property to specify a function that will be called when the button is clicked right now for that i will write a paragraph to indicate the numbers so i am writing you click here i am calling the count and this count will be indicated in numbers so you have clicked this many times so right so so i will give the button to click so on click so i'll set i am calling this set function so that is set count this s should be in a small here the function that we pass to on click is an arrow function that calls the set count and passes in the new value of the count so which is the current value plus 1 so let us write the count that is the current value and plus 1 so whenever the button is clicked here the count will be incremented like the current value plus 1 so the count will be incremented to 1 so i'll close the button by telling click okay so let us run this by typing npm start and you can see the server has started you can see that we have written you clicked this many times right so let us click this button and check so here you can see the number is incrementing so if i click on this the number is changed the value to 2 so that the current value is right now is 2 so if i click the button once again the number will be incremented plus 1 so that the current value plus 1 will be incremented so here as you can see the count this is the current value and plus 1 so every time the button is clicked this function will be called and the state variable count will be updated and here the component will be re-rendered to reflect the new value so i hope you understood now i will give you some of the tips to use the u state here we have some of the limitations for example keep state update simple here you need to avoid the complex logics or the calculations when updating the state instead use a callback function to update the state based on its current value and next so you need to keep in mind that you need to use the use state when it is only necessary here use props or the context when possible instead of creating the state for every piece of data after that you need to use the use effect hook for the side effects keep the state top level that means you need to keep the state at the top level of your component hierarchy as opposed to buried deeply in class component this make it easier to understand and debug the code easier and you need to keep in mind that you need to test your component always you need to test your component to make sure that they work correctly and the state updates are behaving as expected with that we will move on to the next hook that is use effect now let us explore about use effect here this use effect is a hook in react that allows you to synchronize a components with an external system 
Also, it will allow you to tell that React to run a piece of code after rendering in order to update the system or the side effects of the component. So this is done by specifying a callback function that contains the code to run and an array of dependencies which are variables that components uses and that React will watch for changes. Now, when the component is first rendered, the callback function passes to the use effect will be run. This is similar to the component did mount lifecycle method in the class component. If any of the dependencies specified in the dependency array change, React will rerun the effect. Now, this is also similar to the component did update lifecycle method in the class component. So, as I said before, here we have class did mount, class did update, and class did unmount. So these lifecycle methods are used in the class component. So here the next lifecycle I'll be explaining is component will unmount. Here when the component is unmount, the cleanup function passed to the use effect when it will be run. This is for cancelling network requests or cleaning up any other side effects that were created. Now that we will understand this use effect hook with a small example. So I'll go back to the Visual Studio code. I will clean up the use state. I will keep the React component and the export has default. Now we need to use the use state and use effect from the React. So for that we will import use effect along with the use state from the React package after the React component line. So that I will just import inside the curly braces right use effect and use state right in our component we declare a state variable data using this use state and the initial value is an empty array so for that we will just write a function for that counter so for that i will be setting the constant values here and i'll pass both width and the set width as i said the current value and the function that will be updated so here width is the current value and i'll set the state So now what does this line mean? So here I have written this line, right? Now this means that I am taking the windows inner width. So let us see, for example, I want the inner width of the browser and I need to design a web page where my grid needs to match it. So I need to know the width of my system or the browser so that I am taking the inner width of the browser. Now let us fetch the use effect. I am taking the function handle resize. So we need to know the size of our window, right? So that is why we are using this function. Function handle. Now I will set the width for window inner width here the set width function update the state when the browser window is resized now let us set the window uh, event listener here the use effect hook is used to add an event listener to the window that is listens for a resize event and when the resize event is triggered the handle resize function is called for that we are writing a code here so for that window dot add event listener and i am specifying here resize here as i said 
when the resize is triggered the handle resize will be called to update the width of the state in the new value of the windows inner width now here let us clean up the function to remove the event listener here now i will return here i will return the remove event listener here i am specifying this window dot remove event listener here the empty array at the end of the use effect is the dependencies it means this effect only runs once on the component mode right so here now i will return this also so i'm writing the windows width will be so i'm calling this width function here here the component returns a div that displays the current width of the browser right now let us check out the results here the window width is 614 now let us resize this here as you can see if i resize the windows width changed to 335 so if i again resize so it will change according to that so it will not change the height so as if we have just said only for the width the total window width of my system is 614 so if i resize so it will change according to the size we move to so i hope you understood the example with the use effect here some of the tips to practice this use case in a best way for that you need to first understand the purpose of the use case of the use effect hook here it is used to handle the side effects so as i said in the example such as the data fetching in a functional component and always you need to include a dependency array as the second argument to the use effect and this array should include any variables or state that the effect depends on here if a variable is not included in the dependency array that the effect will run on every render and you should be mindful of the order in which effect runs here this effects are executed in the order that they defined so it is important to consider that the order of your effects if they are dependent on each other and you should use the cleanup function provided by the use effect to remove any side effects before the component is unmount so this is especially important for the data fetching and subscriptions to prevent the memory leaks so as i did here in the example i did the cleanup function to remove the event listener right so like that and also you should keep in mind that the excessive use of use effect can lead to unnecessary re-renders and it can be slow down your applications and also you can use the use context hook instead of use effect when possible here the use context is a simpler and more efficient way to manage the shared state across the multiple components that is what we are looking next we will look into the use context here now let us see what is use context it is a kind of hook that is used to consume the context in a functional component it is an alternate to the context type property or the consumer component that were used in the class component here when a component needs to access the context it can use the use context hook to describe to the context and retrieve its current value the hook takes the context object has it argument and returns the current value of the context the component can then use this value to update its state or props the use context hook allows a component to subscribe to changes in context so that it can re-render when the context value changes so this is done without the need to pass props down manually through every level of the component tree which makes the code more efficient and maintainable here when a context value changes the react will re-render all the components that are using that context this means that the component using use context hook will be re-rendered too 
which is how the component will get updated with the new context value. Now if I summarize the use context, the use context hooks allows the functional component to access the context and the subscribe to changes in context. It also eliminates the need to pass the property through the multiple levels of the component tree, eventually which leads to more efficient and maintainable code. Now let us see a small example. So let us go to Visual Studio Code and I will just remove from the function. So default let us keep import react component from react. Here in import we will just import the create context with use context. Okay. So now let us create a context with a default value. For that I am writing the const and theme context. Here we use this create context to create a new context called this theme context. Okay with the default value of light. So I'll keep the default value as light which is equal to create context to light. Right? Fine. Now let us create a function counter. Now let us use the context to access the current theme. Right, so that I am specifying the const. Now the theme is we are using the use context in theme context. Here in our example component, we use the use context hook to access the current value of the theme context. Right, so here we have light. So we need to access this light in this theme context. Here we will return the div. So let us specify the class name as a theme, right? And let me write something like the current so we need to get the uh, output from this theme so when the value changes here the value here will be also changed accordingly now here let me write a function called app and return the theme context dot provider value is dark. So I am specifying the counter over here inside the theme context. Right now let us see the output. Here as you can see the current theme is light. Right. We access the value of the context in this case. Here the theme and we use it to set the class name of the div element and in the app component we wrap the element component with the theme context provider and set the value to the dark okay here now whether the value is provided to the context will be available to all the components that are wrapped inside the theme context provider and all of them will be able to access the current value of the context by calling the use context and theme context. Okay. Now here are some of the tips to practice the use context. Here to keep the context value minimal only store the values that are necessary for the components that are consuming the context and you need to avoid the storing unnecessary data as it can lead to unnecessary re-renders and performance issue and also you need to use the default values. Always provide the default values for the context when creating it. In case that consuming the component does not have access to the context. Now you should use the use context for global state. So that it is shared across the multiple components. Such as the user's authenticated status or the selected theme. 
Also, you need to avoid using context for local state. Here, use state hooks for local state that is specific to single component rather than using the context. Only update context when necessary. You should only update the context when the value has changed to avoid the unnecessary re-renders and performance issues. Here, you need to use the use effect hook to update the context. The next we have the test context. Test the context value and update to ensure that they are working correctly. Here, we use the test context to test the value that were updated correctly and whether it is working correctly. Now then we have the use multiple context. So here if you have multiple pieces of global state and that need to be shared. Here we need to consider using the multiple context to keep the state organized and easy to manage. With that we will move on to use reducer hook. Here the use reducer is a hook in react that allows for managing the state within a functional component. Here it is similar to use state, but it is typically used for more complex state management. And the state reducer hook takes two arguments, a reducer function and a initial state. Here the reducer function is a pure function that takes the current state and an action. And it returns the next state. The initial state is the starting state of the component state. A component can call the dispatch function returned by the use reducer to send an action to the reducer. Here the reducer that updates the state based on the action and the current state. And also the component re-renders with the new state. The use reducer is considered more powerful than use state because it allows for more complex state management such as handling the asynchronous actions and managing the multiple pieces of state at once. In short, the use reducer is a hook that allows you to manage the state within a functional component in a way that it is similar to how you would manage the state in a Redux store. It takes two arguments, a reducer function and an initial state as I said initially and returns the current state and a dispatch function that can be used to update the state. Now with that, let us look into a small example. So, let me remove from the import again. Let us import the use reducer package from React. After that, we create a reducer function that takes in two arguments, that is state and action. Here, which are the current state and the action that is being dispatched respectively. Okay, so that let's write const. So initially I'm setting the value to count zero. So initial state is count zero. Fine. After that, the function, the function reducer state action. After that I have switch case. In that I will write switch. I'll write action type. If that is the case then the case should be in increment. Then I will return the count To the state count plus one. If the case is in the decrement, then I will return count state minus one. Then default, I will return the state. First, let me write the code and I will be explaining you each and every statement here, right? So that first here I'll write the function. Here, as you know, the use reducer hook returns a pair of values, the current state and a function that updates it. In our case, we use the destructuring assignment to assign the state and dispatch, right? 
Next, here we use the state count to display the current count in the page and in the button tag. Here, for that, I will specify the page and the button tag. Here, for that, I am returning a statement. So, return. Here I am writing the count. Here count and the state count. Now let us specify the button for increment as well as the decrement. Here on click. Let us write the dispatch. So this type will be in increment. Fine. Now for the same, I will give for decrement. Right. See here. Here I am giving the decrement. So after that the div is closed. So here the function that passes in the on click property to specify a function that will be called when the button is clicked. So I'll be showing that in the output page. Here the function that we have passed to on click is an arrow that function calls dispatch and it passes in the object that describes the action that should be performed. Here in this case, the action type is either increment or decrement, right? So when the component is rendered, it was initially the number is zero. The count is zero. So when the button is clicked in the increment, so it will call the dispatch function with the type increment. And the reducer function will receive the action and the state so that it will update the state and increment by one. So see for example if I go to the output. So if the button is clicked in the increment. So the count will be two. For example if I increment one. So the count will be plus one. Right. So when the minus button or the decrement button is clicked. So it will call the dispatch function to the decrement. Then the reducer function will receive the action and the state. So it will update the state and decrease by the count 1. And the component will re-render and it will show us the output as minus 1. So count minus 1. So here keep your state and the action simple. Now let me give you some of the tips. Here you need to keep your state and action simple. The use reducer is designed to handle the complex state and actions, but it is important to keep them as simple as possible to avoid the confusions and make it easier to debug. And also, you should use the initial state correctly. Make sure to provide an initial state that is the same type and shape as the state in your reducer function. And the use actions to change the state. You need to use the actions to change the state in your reducer. So do not modify the state directly as this can lead to unexpected behavior. Also you need to keep your reducer function pure. So what that your reducer function should be pure means it should not have any side effect and should not rely on any external state or variables. So with that we will move on to the use memo. Use memo is a hook that allows you to optimize the performance of your React component by only recalculating a value when one of its dependencies has changed. Now it is similar to the use effect hook in that it allows you to perform a side effect, but instead of updating the component state or props, it returns a value that can be used by the component. Here the use memo hook takes two argument as previous hook sticks. The first one is a function that returns the value you want to store and the second one is an array of dependencies. 
the function is only called when one of the dependencies has changed. If none of the dependencies have changed, the previous value is returned instead of recalculating the value. For example, if you have a component that displays a list of items and the list is passed in as a prop, you can use the use memo to only refilter the list when the search item changes instead of refiltering the list on every render. Now let us see a small example. So now let us go to Visual Studio Code. I just have import react component from react and I have exported the counter. Now let me import the hooks from the react. So I'm importing use state and use memo, right? Now let us define a functional component called counter. Okay, so function counter. Now let us create the state variable for first name, last name, and age. So that constant first is our first name. Then I will set the first name. Here I will use the use state. Same thing for last name and age. I am giving a empty parameter over here so that it is dynamically updated when the user enters the first name, last name and the age. Okay, right. Now let us calculate the user object over here. So now let us see this function will uh, rerun only if the first name, last name or the age state variable have changed. So I am giving the uh, user also. So const user by using the use memo. So let us return the full name. The full name consists of the first name and the last name. And finally age. Right. In the array, I'm just giving the first name, last name, and age. Return inside the div, I'm just giving the input value for the first name, last name, and the Edge. Here the component also uses the use memo here, right? So this hook can create a memorized object called the user. So that is why we have specified the user over here. And that combines the first name, last name, and the age. The state variable into a single object with properties that is first name and the age. The components then renders input field that allows the user to update the state variables and display the user object. So that is what. So here I will be giving the input values over here. Here first one is the first name. On change. So if the value is changed, then the output should be re-rendered. Here in the age, we have to type the number. So the input value will be in the form of number. Right? Then let me give a paragraph inside saying the full name. And the age. Now let us see the output. 
So if I show you the output here, I can type my name. So here in the full name, you will get uh, the first name and this is the last name. So for example, I'll type V. So as you can see the full name, I have uh, written in the first name as Tejashwini and the last name has V. So in the code here, it should return in the name of full name is the first name plus the last name and the age. Right. So here, if you see uh, in the place of first name, I have typed only my first name and in the last name and uh, in the place of age, uh, since I given in the input has numbers. So it will tell you to increment or decrement or else you can even type the number. So in place of age, you have the number over here, right? For example, 46. Yeah. And you can increment or decrement as you need. So in this code, the react functional component is called the counter, right? So it uses the react hook called use state and use memo to manage and update the component state and to perform a calculation based on the state. Here, the component has three state variables that is the first name, last name and age. So which are initialized using the use state. Now these state variables are used to control the values of three input fields rendered in the component JSX that is these three input fields. Here the component also has a user variable. So here, here you can see the user variable right. Here the function concatenates the first name and the last name the state variable to create the full name. The property of the user object and the user age that state variable as the state property. The second argument of the use memo is array of dependencies which is used to determine when the calculation should be rerun. In this case the calculation will rerun only if the first name, last name or age state variable has changed. The component re-renders an input field from each state variable and displays the full name and age property of the user object. Right, with that we will move on to the tips for use memo. Use the hook called use memo when you need to compute a value that depends on prop or state but not change often. Always pass a function that runs the value you want to memorize has the first argument. The function should take the props or state that the value depends on an argument. And the use memo with the second argument an array of dependencies to tell the react which values the memorized value depends on. So this will ensure that the memorized value is only recalculated when one of the dependency changes. Avoid using use memo in render functions as it can lead to poor performances. Instead, you can use it in the component functions that are called before the component re-renders. Also, you need to use the use memo with the caution when working with the large data set or the complex computations as it can cause performance issues if not used correctly and avoid using the use memo to store functions as they cannot memorize instead you can use the use callback hook for this purpose now let us see use callback hook use callback is nothing but it is also a react hook that allows you to optimize the performance of your react component by only recreating a callback function when one of its dependencies has changed it is similar to use memo but that allows you to store a value and only update it when the dependencies has changed. But instead of storing a computed value, it stores a callback function. Here the callback hook takes two arguments. The first one is a callback function that you want to store and the second is an array of dependencies. Here the function is only recreated when one of the dependencies has changed. If none of the dependency have changed, 
the previous callback is returned instead of creating a new one. For example, if you have a component that displays a list of items and the list is passed in as a prop, you can use the use callback to only recreate the function that handles the recreating the function on every render. But it is important to note that the use callback is often used in the conjunction with the use memo when the dependencies are object or the function. To prevent unnecessary re-renders and recalculations as use memo only recalculates the value when the reference to the object or functions changes. Now let us see a small example for use callback hook and import the hook packages from react that is I'm using the use state and use callback from react now the function called counter let us initialize the count and the increment value here right so that for here I am writing the const So I'm, I'm setting the count as well by use keys by use state and the next one is increment I'm using the use callback function over here let's set the count to count plus one because we are incrementing it right so right now let us return with a div tag inside that I'm writing a h1 tag so I'm telling the count value then I'm specifying the child increment after this we have the child increment over here as you can see right so that I am creating a function over here called child. Inside that I am just passing an argument called increment by returning a button with an on click function increment. Right now in this example the parent component has a state variable that is count so as you can see here we have count this is the parent component and the callback function is the increment that increments by one so here the count plus one so as you can see this is the parent component plus incrementing by one here the child component receives the increment function as a prop and renders a button when clicked and it calls the increment function over here the use callback hook is used to memorize the increment function passing in the count as a dependency this means that the increment function will only be recreated if the count state variables change so this can help to prevent the unnecessary re-renders of the child components when you run the code the output will be a increment button and a h1 tag saying the count is zero so when you click on the button the count will be increasing by one and the h1 tag will be displaying the updated count right so if you can see i am clicking on increment and the number changes to two by increment plus one so one plus one is two okay so right now let us see some of the tips so here use the use callback when you need to pass a callback function as a prop to a child component and you want to avoid the unnecessary re-renders always you need to provide the dependency array has the second argument to use the callback this tells the react which variables the callback depends on and when it should recreate the callback and also you need to keep in mind that the dependencies you include in the array 
if you include too much or unnecessary dependencies it can cause the unnecessary re-renders and negatively impact performance and you need to avoid the use callback inside the loops or conditions as it can lead to unexpected behavior and hard to debug the issues and always you need to check if the callback function is the same using the reference equality operator before passing it to a prop so this will prevent the unnecessary re-renders of the parent component you need to be careful while using the use callback function with this the state or prop that are objects or array because these are passed by references not by values so if the callback depends on such variables it will be recreated every time the parent component re-renders and you need to be aware that the use callback does not work with async functions because it cannot memorize the results of asynchronized operations always test your component with and without use callback to check that if it works as expected and that the performance improves you expect has visible right okay now let's move on to the last hook in this session that is use layout effect now what is use layout effect use layout effect is a react hook that allows you to synchronize all layout changes to a component here it is similar to the use effect but it runs synchronously after all dom mutations now this can be useful when you need to measure a dom node or read its layout before making changes that affects its size or position also it should be used with caution as it can cause visual inconsistencies if not used correctly and also it is recommended to use use effect unless you have a specific use case that requires the synchronous behavior of use layout effect so you need to be careful while using the use layout effect and also importantly to note that the use layout effect should be used only for updates that are critical to the visual appearances of the component and that cannot wait until the next frame for all other updates it is generally recommended to use the use effect instead with the run asynchronously and does not block the main thread and also it is important to remember that if you need to perform any side effects that involves the dom such as adding or removing the event listeners you should do so inside the use layout effect instead of use effect this is because the use effect runs after the browser has painted and may cause unnecessary layout thrashing if it updates the layout of your component okay with that let us move on to the example now this code is a simple react functional component that uses the use layout effect and the use state so here it uses these both hooks to measure the width of an element and display it in the screen okay the first code imports that the layout effect and the use state and the use ref from the react library right here the use state is a hook that allows you to add the state to a functional component in this case it is being used to create a state variable called width and that will store the width of the element here the use state hook also returns a set width so that can be used to update the value of the width state variable here now the use ref is a hook that allows you to create a reference to a dom node so in this case it is being used to create a reference to a div element that will be used to measure the width of the element over here here the use layout effect is a hook that allows you to synchronize and apply the layout changes to the component so it is similar to the use effect as i mentioned earlier but it runs synchronize after all dom 
mutations. So this can be useful when you need to measure a DOM node or read its layout before making changes that affects its size or the position. So this component start with the div element with the ID my element and within the width state variable is displayed and use layout effect is then invoked. So inside the hook the code first gets a reference to the element with the ID called my element using the document dot get element by ID inside the my ID. This use layout effect hook is then invoked. Inside the hook, the code first gets a reference to the element using the ref variable called ref.current. You can see here this ref.current. Then it uses the get bounding light ray. Right? This method to measure that the width of the element and assign it to the variable width. After that, the set width function is invoked with the width variable as an argument. So, which updates the state variable with the width of the element. Here, the use layout effect hook also accepts a cleanup function, which is a function that runs when the component is unmounted or the effect is being rerun. So, this is that function. Okay. So, the cleanup function will also display the cleanup in console. So, when you inspect in the console, then you will get to know about it, right? And also, you need to keep in mind that uh, it is important to note that the use layout effect hook should be used with the caution as I mentioned. So, uh, as it can cause the visual inconsistencies if not used correctly. So, it is recommended to you to use the use effect unless you have a specific use case that requires the synchronized behavior of the use layout effect and it is important that if you don't provide a dependency array the effect will run on every render so which could lead to a performance issue so it is better to provide a dependency array with the values that the effect rely on so that it only runs when those values changes okay so it should not run whenever the ch small changes happens the whole program will run so write in this example an empty dependency array so this is the empty dependency array so it is passed to a use layout effect hook so which means that it will only run the code once when the component is first rendered so in this example instead of using the document.get element by id to find the element it is passed to a reference to the element as it uses the ref dot current dot here the ref dot current dot get bounding client ray so to get the width of the element so let us see the output over here so we have to run so after that so as you can see the width of the element is around 613.4400 okay so let us inspect this here you can see as i mentioned you will get a console here we have console right as you can see here the cleaning up function as i said in the program right here you will get the cleanup function here so inside the console you will get the cleaning up so let's go ahead and see what node.js is actually so if we speak about Node.js, it's a powerful JavaScript framework, or I might say it's a runtime where you can run JavaScript on the console. It is developed on Chrome's V8 engine. So if anyone doesn't know what a V8 engine is, let me just tell you what it is. So if I check out the v8.dev, the official website of Chrome's V8 engine, you would see that it is an open source, high performance JavaScript and WebAssembly engine written in C++. And, you know, more or less, this is the engine that runs on the Chrome browser. So you would see that whatever your Chrome browser understands, it would be the same thing that Node.js also understands. So the creator of Node.js thought that, okay, this is an open source JavaScript engine. Why not implement that in a platform which enables you to run JavaScript on the server? So this is the reason 
why Node.js understands JavaScript. So that is one thing that we would like to also keep in mind. So it's something that runs on Chrome's V8 engine and it compiles JavaScript natively into the machine code. That is all because of Chrome's V8 compiler that we have. And it is basically used for creating server-side web applications and also network applications actually. So mainly Node.js is used for. And basically if it is a data intensive application, Node.js is something that is specifically made for that. Let's see how that happens basically. If we talk about the features of Node.js, it is open source. It is simple and fast. It is asynchronous, highly scalable. You would face no problems in scaling your Node.js application. It basically works on something called a microservice architecture as well. And it facilitates that microservice architecture really well. It is a single threaded model, which means it is not resource intensive and yet it is fast, you know, yet it allows things to be done in parallel. We'll see how that is done. And then there is no buffering. Basically, there's no waiting as far as Node.js is concerned. And that is because of a concept in JavaScript, which is called event loop. We'll see more about that as well. And it works on so many platforms. So that is some brief of the feature. Let's see Node.js architecture. And before going into the architecture of Node.js, we would also like to see the traditional architecture. So traditional architecture, if we speak about traditional server architecture is basically where every client request is managed by separate threads. So there is a multi-threaded model going on in normal server architectures like Java, for example, it's a multi-threaded application or a multi-threaded setup altogether. So where your web application runs on multiple threads and various client requests are processed parallelly. Now, there is nothing to take away from this model because it is really good and it has been working throughout years when Java is, at this point of time, Java is actually one of the best languages and secure languages to be programmed in. However, this is resource intensive because you can see that there are so many threads going on in parallel, which means your server or your machine should be something which is uh, capable of running these many threads. However, if you talk about Node.js, it only runs on single thread and still it processes requests in parallel. So one thing that I would also like to clarify here is in the background or maybe under the hood, if you may say, Node.js doesn't process any request in parallel, but it goes through an event loop where once the request comes, it goes into the process and Node.js doesn't wait for the output of the request to come in while it takes in the next request. So as and when the first request, for example, gets the output, it would just respond for the output or with the output to the respective client, basically. So, you know, in the background or under the hood, it is basically running only one thread, which is not resource intensive. And it is at the same time processing requests from so many clients. And it provides a virtual feel that everything is running in parallel, but everything is not. So that is all because of event loop that is going on. So that is basically the architecture. And then we talk about something very important as far as Node.js is concerned, which is called Node Package Manager. Now it is called NPM in short, and it was primarily known as Node Package Manager. But nowadays it is not known as Node Package Manager because it is doing so many things than package management. It's doing so many other things as well. We'll see what it is. So if we talk about the official definition, it's a package manager for Node.js packages or modules, which has been added as a default installation from Node.js version 6 or 0 0.6 onwards. And then it stuck. It is already there in any installation that you do in Node.js. If you are a Java programmer, you can relate this with Maven. And if you are a PHP programmer, you can relate it with Composer. So it is the same mechanism where NPM has a repository of so many libraries and then the repository serves whatever the package you need for your project. And if we talk about the features, it provides and hosts online repositories for Node.js, which can easily be downloaded in our project using a command line. So it provides a command line utility as well. And it also allows you to manage the repositories or the versions of libraries that your project may use. So we'll see what are the versions and what are the libraries that we are talking about. So the libraries that I'm talking about, when I say libraries, it is just Node.js modules. So Node.js modules, or if we talk about the module system, there are core modules, there are local modules, and then there are third party modules. So core modules are the ones that are actually available in the default installation of Node.js. 
You don't have to program anything. You don't have to install anything else. Just Node.js to get the core modules working. Few of them are listed in here like HTTP, URL, query string. We'll be using them and there are some others as well which we'll be using today. And then local modules. It is something that a programmer builds. It could be a function, it could be an object, it could be anything. The programmer builds and the programmer exports so that other team members or other programmers can import that module and use them. So it's something that a programmer would build. It's like a custom module and then third party module. This would be installed through the NPM repository. So if we speak about NPM in this particular case, let me just also open up the NPM website. So it is basically npmjs.com. And you can see that it has so many repositories. There are so many companies that it is serving and all. There are so many repositories available as well. Let's just search a few repositories in this particular case. I'll search one of them. If we talk about React, you might have heard of React. React is one of the repositories that is available in NPM. You might have heard of Angular. That is also one of the libraries that is available in the NPM repository. You might have heard of jQuery. You might have heard of Bootstrap. These are like naming just a few of them. There are so many, so many repositories that are available. Even Express that we are going to use is one of the libraries that is available in this particular repository of NPM. So you can see here that Express is one of the libraries that is to be used. So we'll be installing Express and see. By the way, this is the way you install any third party library from the NPM repository. All right. So that is the third party module and you would be using npm install or npm i to be in short to install this particular repository. Now let us see the package.json file. Package.json file in Node.js is the heart of the entire application. It is basically the manifest file that contains the metadata of the project. Now at this point of time, let me just create a Node.js project and see what this package.json file looks like and then we'll analyze what this file actually is. So let me just create a folder here, Edureka. And in this folder, I'm willing to, you know, initialize a Node.js project. So let's say I'll call it Node.js demo, or maybe I'll call it task manager, even better. We'll try to create some of the task manager functionalities in here. And it'll be an API that will be creating or a web service that will be creating. We'll see what it is. So in this task manager, I'm going to initialize a Node.js project. And in order to initialize a Node.js project, you need to have Node.js installed in your computer, which means you have to go to the nodejs.org website and you can download this LTS version. This is a current release, which is basically experimental. It'll have all the latest features, but it is prone to be erroneous at some time. So, you know, generally for development, you don't use this one, but you use this one. But say if you want to check out the new features, you can also install the current release, but we'll always go with the LTS. And I already have this installed. You know, clicking on this will allow you to download the MSI file, that is the setup file, and then you can just double click on that setup and just install it on Windows. And in Mac as well, the setup is really simple. And in Linux as well, probably it'll give you a deb file, for example, if you're going for Ubuntu. So the setup of Node.js would be really straightforward, but after the setup is done, what you have to do is you have to just check whether Node.js is installed in your computer or not. And you'd be checking it this way, node hyphen V. That'll give you the version of Node.js and you can see that I already have it installed and I have the version 10.15.3, that is the LTS. And then I'd also check NPM. If you recall, we saw that NPM is something that comes in inherently with Node.js altogether. So we'll be going for NPM hyphen V. That will give you the NPM version. So we're all set and we're all ready to go. So let's go for creating or initializing a Node.js project. It is something like this, npm init dot, which means current directory. So if we just hit enter, I think dot is something that is not to be done, right? So this would ask you certain questions like what is the package name? Let's say I want the same package name as task manager. I want the version to be one, okay? The description, let's say this is a task manager project, all right? Entry point would not be significant at this point of time. So we'll just keep it as it is. No test command as of now, no git repositories. I'm not going to even commit that to a git repository and no keywords as well. Author, I can say Edureka. 
and license no meaning as of now for a license because we are not going to make it public or anything so it tells us that is it okay and also it tells you that it's about to write to this particular file package.json inside our task manager folder so which means after i say yes there is a possibility of this being written into a file called package.json inside my project so let's go for hitting enter let's say yes and if i now check out my folder you see that the package.json file is in let's just open this up in our editor you see that here is the package.json available with every information that we provided now this is a very basic package.json there'll be so many things inside a package.json file and a normal or a real world package.json might look something like this where there are so many things like the name of the project is there then there is something called version as well description of the project what is the starting point of the project which is your main script to run first there are certain scripts we saw that we didn't provide any test command and then there are certain engines what all tools do you use to run this project who is the author what is the license there are certain third party modules that we would like to have you can see in this particular example that there is express that is there as a third party module which we'll be using and then there is dev dependencies like when you go into a development environment like for example our computer there will be certain dependencies that will be there and that will be registered inside the dev dependency then there is repository related information which we didn't provide actually if you want to see what are the bugs and all there has to be a separate url and the home page so that is your package.json file which got created by the way when we initialized the node.js project and you can also manually create it but it's better that we go for npm init as a process so now let's go for node.js basics so if we talk about basics it's like any language basics and the main thing that we need to check out as a basic is the data types so there are certain primitive data types there are certain abstract data types like non primitive data types so primitive data types are string number boolean null and undefined abstract data types are object array and date to name a few by the way there are so many others but these are to name a few so say for example if i create an application let's just create a string as a variable and let's see how that works so let me just create an app.js file and in this i'll create a variable and i'll be very specific i'll say first name and i'll say first name to be edureka so this is a variable that we declared and if i want to show this variable in my console i'll just do console.log first name so when i do this the main perception is basically if i want to run this app.js i might have to create an html file where i might have to include this app as a script file and then i might have to execute the html file and open the console to see this particular output but if you have installed node.js on your computer which we have you'd actually be able to run this particular app.js really easily let's run this one for that i would have to go into my project let me just clear the screen and run this one and really simple to run a node.js application it's simply node and the file name that is app.js and you can see that it displays the first name in my console so whatever i do as console.log gets displayed in my terminal so that is something that i would like to keep in mind and remember this is a string that we have created but there's no concept of a strict data type so basically the first name can also be something like this a so first name can be reassigned to let's say a number and that will not be a problem for javascript that is the core nature of javascript it's not strictly typed so that is something that i would also like you to keep in mind so there are so many data types that are available which we have created a string and then there are so many others this is how you create a variable that we already saw and then there are operators now as i said like there is something that is already similar to all the other programming languages variables are one of them operators as well however there is one operator that is pretty unique and that is the triple equal to sign so say for example if i go for something like this var let's say age 1 is equal to 30 and var age 2 is equal to 30 and then let's say var result is equal to h1 double equal to h2 now i'm using this double equal to similar to any other binary operator like i might go for plus and similarly i'm going for double equal to now this is because this is a comparison operator this would return either true or false and this would get stored inside the result variable so this time i know that you might have guessed it it would be returning us true and if i 
do the result if I go for console log of result and if I execute this app.js you see that it returns as true. Now if I go for a string all right and when I declared a variable in the previous example we saw that there is no strict data type so this would not actually check for the data type this will just check the value and though it may seem that it should give us false this would give us true and the fact is like JavaScript doesn't care about data types so if say for example you want to also compare the data types along with the value instead of double equal to use triple equal to and that way this would give us false there is so much going on inside or in this particular two examples that we have but for now you can remember that double equal to doesn't compare the data types while triple equal to also checks the data types but then again there is so much going on under the hood which it's not in the scope of this particular session uh, but just keep this in mind there's a unique operator that is available for JavaScript specifically and then there are certain other languages that might have these operator but JavaScript is the one that came up with this all right so this is one thing and by this time you might have got an idea on how we run an application or how we run a file in node.js so this is one other thing that I would also like to mention where functions are created say for example if I have a function to create let's say function say hello and I pass in name inside it and I return let's say hello plus name now plus here is a concatenation operator and that will return us a name or a hello message with the name whatever we have passed in so I can do this like console.log say hello and let's say hello to Ravi all right so if I run this particular file it'll give me whatever output we expect which is fine now one thing I would also like to tell you is in JavaScript there is a provision where you can create a function without a name an anonymous function which is also something that JavaScript came up with a function with no name and if this is the case then how would you call the function so for that you can do something like this var say hello is equal to a function something like this and then the rest of the thing remains the same function gets called as as normal what we have done is we have created a variable and inside this variable we have assigned a function rather than a value so and then we are calling the variable as a function so again if I run this particular code the output would be the same just keep in mind that function here can be anonymous in JavaScript all right and then objects now object there are two ways you can create objects one is through object literals like var let's say student is equal to a constant object which has let's say name Ravi and email Ravi at gmail.com for example right and then we can do a, something like this console.log student dot name right and then student dot email and so on and that would display whatever the name is basically so an object dot property can be done and then there is a constructor pattern as well available but it's okay if we don't go for that but then there is another pattern which uses object constructor to create an object now going into node.js core modules one of the modules is file system that is the fs module fs module if you want to include or any module if you want to include you go for this syntax a variable is equal to require and the module name and this would be something like this for example var fs is equal to require fs now for this fs module you don't have to install anything else but node.js has to be there and which is there and uh, fs module would be available it's a core module in node.js so let's say for example if i have a file called hello.txt and it has some data all right and if i want to read this file i'd be able to do this like fs dot read file and it asks me the path of the particular file so let's just give the path basically i can try with the relative path first so it'll be basically hello dot txt let's see what it gets and the second argument that we need to pass is the callback function so node.js or any javascript platform would work more on the basis of callback function that's how it creates the virtualization of so many things working at the same time all right so I would go for a callback function and this function anonymous function would go for two arguments one is error and one is data let's see if there is no error then we'd go for logging the data inside the console let's see what data we get all right so if I run this file now 
hopefully I should get the contents of hello.txt file. Let's see. Here, I don't get the content, but I get something called a buffer. That buffer is basically some container that contains raw data. Out of this buffer, I can get the string basically. So let's say if we go for buffer dot to string, which is a function, which will convert the data to a string. So now it will give me whatever the content hello world has. And similarly, if I, for example, have to write something inside a file, let's say if I want to write something inside a file and then once the file is written, I would like to read out the file. We do something like this fs dot write file and write file would again go for the path and I would be going for the data as well and the data is something like something like this and once I go for the data data could be any data type by the way could be boolean could be object could be any data type and then I go for a callback function Now the callback function would have something only one argument here which is error if there is no error like if no error then I would like to read the file right so then I can go for fs.read file so I can just take this whole thing and I can put it in here so what I have done is I have written something into the file and if there is no error after writing whatever I have written I would be trying to read that file and in here if there is no error I would like to display the content so hopefully this should give me how are you or maybe let's see whether it overrides whether it appends let's see what happens if I check out this you can see it gives me how are you and if I go into hello.txt you can see that it has overwritten the particular content that was there before so this is an fs module demo this is how you'd be reading and writing files I might like to also try and read and write JSON in some JSON file that might actually give me a feel of an API that has been created. Let's see how that goes. And then there is something called events. But before going for events, I would like to create a server first. So let's just create a server. And you know, the events are basically something that we would be working with where we would be emitting certain events and then we'll be listening to those events. Let's see how that whole mechanism works and how the event handlers would work and all. But before events, I would like to go into creating the server through the HTTP module because server is also a network application which is something that Node.js would enable us to create. So we'll create a server through the HTTP modules and then I'll come back to the events. Let's see how that goes. All right. So let's just get rid of this FS related code and I'll again go for the FS code in some time. I would also get rid of the hello.txt. I don't need this. Right. And then what I'll do is I'll create a server in here. So for the server, I'll go for var HTTP is equal to require HTTP. And then there is something which is really simple to create a server in Node.js, as opposed to all the other languages, the server is something that a programmer would create. So say for example, if you compare Node.js with JSP or Java, there is Tomcat Apache web server that is already available. If you compare Node.js with .NET, there is IIS server that is already available. If we talk about PHP, there is Apache server that is already there, compiled and available. In Node.js, there is no server. So the concept of Node.js being a server, it's something that is not true. In Node.js, it is just a runtime which enables us to run JavaScript on your machine so that you can create a server if you want to. And creating a server, it's not a big deal in Node.js. This is how you create a server. HTTP dot create server. That's it. And I'd save it in a variable called server. And my server would listen to the port number 3000. The server dot listen 3000. All right. So this is what your server would listen to. And if you want, you can also provide the host name here, which is by default localhost. But if you want explicitly, you can provide localhost as the host name. So your server would be listening to localhost and 3000. And after it, you know, starts listening, I would also like to provide a message and again the callback function or an anonymous function would come into the picture so function and so log will go for server started on port 3000 right okay so what have we done we have simply created a server by http create server and we are listening on port number 3000 so that is what it is and then at the end we are displaying some message on the console so let's see 
One thing that you'd notice is in the other programs, the application actually ended. Like once you were done with the whole program, you see that you get the command prompt back. But in this case, when we are listening, the server is constantly listening to the port number 3000. So the application would not end in this particular case. You may have to end the application forcefully by hitting control C. So let's see. Now, if I run it, you see that server started on port number 3000 and the application is not ending. All right. So if I go for, say, localhost port number 3000, there'll be something that might happen. You see here that the request is sent to the server. But the server is not responding because we have not programmed our server to respond with something. So here the server is not responding while the server is running. All right. So if I stop my server, you would see it would tell you that the site can't be reached. So basically what that meant was previously the server was running. So if I, for example, run the server, this would again, let me just open up localhost 3000. This would again start to load, but the message that the site can't be reached won't come because the server is still there. The site is reached, but the server is not responding to us. So let's program our server so that it responds to us in which you go for a callback function inside your create server method. And this callback function has two things, request and response, two arguments. And if I want to send a response in this particular case, you go for response.end, all right? And if I, let's say server works, that's the message that I want to send, all right? So what this would do is, this would send a message to your browser saying server works. So let's just take that message. So for that, because I have changed something in my app.js, I might have to stop this and I might have to restart my server. So server listening on port 3000. And if I now refresh, you'd see that it gives me the message server works. So this is pretty cool. We have created a server in like almost three statements, right? So that is something on how you create a server. But generally what people do is people use this functionality of creating a server along with Express and then create a server through Express, the framework that we were talking about. So we will see how to create a server through Express. But before that, let's move back to the events and let's see how events would work in this particular case. Now, when you talk about events, there are two methods that you would be generally going for. One is called emit and one is called on. So remember these two methods, emit and on. Let's see how we can make it work and what are events basically or how an evented system would work. So in that case, we again use a core module, which is called events. So var events is equal to require events. Again, a Node.js core module. We don't have to do anything to include this one. And in this particular case, we'd also create an event emitter. So var event emitter is equal to events dot event emitter and it should be a new event emitter actually right now if we go for the presentation you would see that they have also emphasized on two things that is on and emit so we will see what these things are all right so now in this particular case let's go for something called event dot on now event dot on or not event dot on actually event emitter dot on now this function it's basically an event listener now whenever an event occurs this function would listen to that particular event all right so this would listen to the event and event dot on we would have the name of the event and let's see what we can do as a function there's a callback function that is also something that is involved in here so we will see event emitter where it will go for event dot on and something inside as arguments. But as of now, I'll just keep it this way and I'll simply go for something on the emit side of things. I would like to emit an event and let's see how that goes. All right. So in this particular case, what I would do is whenever there is some request on the server, I would like to emit an event and then I would like to listen to the event and log something on the console. All right. So let's see. In this particular case, I'll go for event emitter dot emit. And I can name the event anything. The event that I'm trying to, you know, emit is basically someone has requested to the server. So what I would say is on request, maybe just someone, I can name it anything. That's why I'm naming it a very bizarre name. So someone requested 
that is an event name and um, if i want i can pass in some data as well but as of now i'll just keep it this way i'll just emit someone requested and when i would like to do something when someone requested so i would go for event emitter dot on someone requested and function that is a callback function let's just go for console dot log and i'll just say a request has been done on the server something like this on the console all right so this is an event emitter and basically on is an event listener all right so we are triggering an event or maybe i can call tri event trigger that'll be a better name so this is an event trigger and this is an event listener so event emitter dot emit is an event trigger and event emitter dot on is an event listener so whenever this would be triggered this event would be executed and this function would be executed so let's see so if i now rerun my server because i have changed something in my node.js app i'd have to rerun this it says server started on port 3000 i will just refresh and it'll give me server works that is fine but if i check out on the console you'll see that a request has been done if i re refresh again you see that a request has been done and then there are two requests that is because one is checking whether the method get is available on the server or not and this the other request is basically executed with the method get actually so there are two requests but we don't need to you know go into detail in that particular case uh, however one thing is for sure that whenever the event emitter is triggered we can execute the on method and we can listen to that particular event all right and if say for example i want to pass in some data let's say test right and this data can be taken into the function the anonymous function as an argument and i can just display that for example data that should display test to me so whatever you pass in could be a string could be a boolean an object anything could be taken into the function as an argument you can name it anything and you can display that particular argument as well inside the console let's rerun our program and let's refresh the server is requested and you can see request has been done on the server and test this particular data is also being displayed so that is the event emitter you can emit events and you can listen to events whenever the event would be emitted the listening would happen all right so this way you know our node.js server becomes an evented server and this is really good if you want to create a chat application or any real-time application event handling would actually help us create a good real-time application so that is where this would basically come into the picture so you know you can check out socket io there is a library called socket io which helps you to create a chat server this would heavily use event emitter on and emit methods all right so this is the one now we have created the server using the http module and if we talk about the server you can always see that the client would be either a web browser a mobile browser or an application that might request to your web server and the web server would contain your server file that is the app.js that we created plus some application logic as well if you we want and the logic might be taking data from the data layer or any external system and it might be serving the request back to the client so basically this data would be taken into the business layer and to the web server and the web server respond like response dot end sort of a thing would happen in this particular case so this is how the request and response cycle would go on and then we see here that it's creating a web server using node.js you can pause this particular portion and you can also try out this whole thing i think you would know how a server is created you already know that and then there are certain other things that are listed in here which you can try Express.js is a web framework which is built on top of Node.js. It helps us in creating web applications or APIs which can respond back from the server side to the client side. They can integrate with different type of database like MongoDB, Oracle, or MySQL, and helps us in creating server side applications. It's a very lightweight framework, so you don't overload or burden your system with unnecessary dependencies in the code. So it's very easy to integrate and it helps us in creating websites or web applications which work with APIs or a backend for our mobile applications. So some features about Express. So Express is very useful because it helps us in our development lifecycle because by using Express, we can reduce the number of hours we spend on your application development time. 
the thing is express is built on top of node so it provides apis or methods which can help you in doing things which have to be done custom in your node.js application or have to be done repeatedly again and again so it writes you a complete boilerplate for all the code setup and helps you in development next point is it provides you built-in templates we look for templating engines or framework for doing templating but in this case express writes us jade or ejs as a templating engine for our html needs it helps in building a single page multi page or hybrid applications so what's the meaning of this so when you need to create a multi page application so that's a application which navigate from one page to another page and server has to create those pages for us that's called a multi page application so in the same case we have single page applications which process the first load of the page on the server and then process everything on the client side if you want to create a multi page or a single page application you can use express as a backend and even if you like to choose kind of a hybrid you have a react front end and some part of it is done on the client side or some part is done on the server side you can use express also in that case so it's very extensible you can extend it to different things and requirements next thing is it makes integration with database easy another thing in express is it makes our life very easy when we are going to use databases because it's built on top of node.js so we can use all the node.js packages for connecting with different types of databases and integrate in our application and they will work perfectly fine and they will not have any integration problems with it so it helps us in connecting our applications with different type of databases or you can choose a combination of different databases and develop applications on it the next point is it's very easy to configure a express application because it's been developed with a mindset of making your developer experience very easy so you don't have to do a lot of code for configuring an express application just few configurations in different files and your application will start working the base application which you get from the express generator is very much configured up so you don't have to make too much tweaks into it and create your application it's very convenient to use express next part is it helps us in defining middlewares for different tasks if you work with express there will be a lot of places where you're going to configure different middlewares middlewares are like operations which are done between particular operations so they can intercept our operation and do data manipulation or send different responses or even do logging for us so by using different middlewares express helps us in doing error handling or manipulation of data or logging the information this approach helps us in making our life cycle very easy we don't have to struggle in finding out problems or issues in our code by going through all the lines we can just configure middlewares at different points of data flow and they will help us in logging out information or finding errors so let's see how we can start with express first you have to create our node.js application then we will install express into it so for creating a node application first i have to create a folder for that i will open my terminal in my terminal i will say navigate to desktop and mkdir or make directory which is named as node.js express tutorial once the folder is created i will just navigate to this folder let's cd node.js express tutorial in this folder i will run npm init npm it will ask me some questions about what's the package name and all those information about the package which you can see i will just press enter and go through them at the end it will give me a package or json file which is a preview of it so i will just say yes it's fine and it creates the package or json file for me in the project now i have to open this folder from my visual studio code you can choose any editor of your choice i'm using visual studio code any editor will work for this application now in this folder you can see i have a package json file which is the same which we configured through the terminal window now what we have to do is we have to install express so i will go back to terminal and run npm install express and dash dash save i'll go back to my project folder and you will see that it created a node models folder which has all the dependencies for this package or the application so now i will create a server.js file in this server.js file we will write our express js code we'll write const express so that's for importing express into this project if we don't write this statement we won't be able to use express so we'll just write express and then we have to create an express application so we'll just write const app is equal to express i will start writing the first route of my application so we haven't covered the routing part of it but i will show you the root url and then we'll see how the routing mechanism works in express so first we'll have to write app.get that means it's the get route for our application the slash url and define the callback for it so the callback receives two parameters so request and response so you can write the logic of data which you want to send from this request 
the request will receive all the information which is sent from the client and response will have all the information which you want to send to the client side back because we don't need to receive anything from the client yet so i will just say res dot send and define hello world over here as string so we have created our first route and now we have to start this application so starting this application we can just write app dot listen and it will listen to port number 8080 so once the route is configured I will just go back to my terminal and run node.js command for server.js file. So I will just first clear this screen. So I will run node server.js. So this has to be done in your project folder. So once done, I didn't got any message back because I haven't done any console.log or returned anything from that file. So that's fine. But now I will go to my Chrome browser or any browser of your choice. It's not that you have to go to Chrome. I will just say localhost 8080. It prints out hello world so that's the message which you get from your server onto your client because we are making a request on the root url that's the slash url and it's a get call all the browser requests which you do from the address bar are actually get calls so it's picking a get call to the node.js server and prints out information over here so if i change it to something else so i've changed the message and i will restart my server so for restarting server you have to go to the terminal window again and press Control c it stops the server then you have to run the same command again and that will restart the server go back to your browser and refresh it prints hello editor now so this is how we create a simple application with express.js and we can use express generator which can be used for creating a complete boilerplate for your application so you can try out express generator later on so this creates our basic application based on express and we can use express generator to create a complex boilerplate for us which will have different files and uh, different configurations which we can configure later on. So now we're going to start working with routes. So when we work with ExpressJS, the first key thing which ExpressJS provides us is the routing mechanism. The routing mechanism in Node.js is not present. So we have to write our own logic to define that if a request is coming for a particular URL, how to navigate to that URL and what's the callback for that. So instead of writing our own code, we use Express for that. And Express works on different methods which are available on the HTTP protocol. So these methods can also be considered as current methods like get, post, put, delete. And they will be configured in our application to do RESTful URLs also or application URLs. So when we are working with our application, we have to decide like which URL will do what. So when you are creating an application, anything which sends data to the client side, that's a get call. So any kind of URL which is sending data is configured with a get method Anything which receives data from the client side and stores it on the database or processes that information Will be a post call anything which updates the data like if you're sending any data from your client side to your server And that information is already on the server and you want to update that you have to make a put call for that So that the system knows that this call is specifically for updating the content the next one is delete now when you already have some content in the system and you want to delete that records you can use the delete call I'm going to show you like how this is actually integrated in Express So we're going to create two requests one is get which we already made the next one is post So let's see how a post request is configured in the example. I created a URL which is app dot get Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create app dot post over here and define slash and response dot send I'll just prefix it with post over here so that we know that it's a post call response Now I will go back to my terminal and restart this server. So one thing I will do is I will write a callback over here So this lets us know that the server is started Otherwise, we are not getting any message on the screen that this started or not And one more thing uh, you can choose any port over here. So I'm by default using 8080 but you can choose any port of your choice or if any port is blocked you can change this to of your choice So I'll go back to my terminal and say node server Now it says server started. So my application is started again I will go back to my browser and run the page again So it prints the same output which is hello at Reka. Now the next thing is I have to use postman to send a post request because I cannot send a post request from my browser Until I do a form submit or a ajax call so I'm not going to do an Ajax call or a form submit right now I'm just going to use postman to test our API's or the URLs I will just go to post this URL and I've already have some URLs I will just remove that and write localhost 8080 
and run this request i got the response but it gave me an error it gave me a javascript error that reference error risk is not defined so something wrong with the code let's fix it so i have used risk over here but i haven't configured the arguments for that so i'll just copy these arguments and put over here that's the same for post and i have to restart the server so whenever you make some changes into the file you have to restart your server to get the latest updates so i'll go back to my terminal run clear and node server now i will run this same url again not prints post hello edureka so now our post url has been configured so in this way you can send data back from your server to your client side based on different types of requests which you have if you have different URLs, so i'm just configuring the root url over here but if you have different routes like people or products or those so you can just write app dot get products or post or delete or put as per needs and write slash products and i'll just update this products and people so made some changes and i will go back to my terminal restart the server again and show you the content now i will just write localhost products like this and the command so it says cannot find this url which is post slash products yeah that's correct because we don't have that url configured it's only get so i have to switch back to get and make the request again now you can see it sends us information about products so this way you can use different templating engines like handlebars or jade or ejs to send different pages over here so this is how we configure our routes for our system so as per need you can choose whichever method you want to choose and configure the route based on it every route can have multiple methods on it but you should not use the same method again and again otherwise it will just override the previous ones so you cannot have two get routes for the root url or the product url because the last one will override the other one so you can only have one route name with the route method so the next thing is i will show you what is express generator so express generator is an npm package which we can download our system so it has to be installed globally on our system so you have to write dash g or to make it a global package i will go back to my terminal window and stop the server and run the command express install express g so it gave me an error that it's not able to install express generator dash g on my system the reason is because when you're installing global packages on a mac machine it based on your node js installation it might require your super user access on a mac machine or on a linux machine so you might face this error so i'm facing this error so what i have to do is i have to do a cleanup instead of running npm install express generator dash g i have to write sudo npm install express generator dash g so this will ask for the user password which is currently logged in once you add the password it says express generator has been installed successfully on the system now we can use express generator now for using express generator first we have to create a new project folder so i will just move outside of this project folder and create a new folder over here so i'll just write mkdir or make directory and create a new folder so i'll just write node express gen so i will go to this folder node express gen and run express over so once you install express generator globally on the system you can run the express command once you run this command it gives you this output this says that you have used express generator and it created all the files for us so this is the boilerplate files which are created by the express generator and you can use them to run or create a node.js and express application so i will just run npm install to install all the dependencies first so all the dependencies are done now i have to run npm start over here which starts your express application so let's wait for it to start i think it started on our system and we'll go to our browser and run localhost 3000 so you can see it installed all the packages and everything which are required by express and created a boilerplate in which we can tweak all the files so i'll just go to my visual studio and open this project folder to show you what's in this project so the project is desktop node express gen so over here you will have a app.js file which is for configuring your application a similar way which we created our server.js and then we have route files so for every route or every method which you're going to use 
in your routing we have these files for that by default it provides to index and user so index is the root url and users is slash users and you can use these to configure your routes and if you need more routes you can create multiple of these and start importing them in your app.js file like this and they will start integrating into your application so you don't need to decide that you need 50 routes and what will the methods of them and anything you can configure your routes based on your needs and how your development grows so it's very flexible and you don't need to define everything on the first load you can develop and make the system grow later on in Sort MySQL. So MySQL is a relational database management system which allows us to manage a database and create records based on tables and rows. So it's an open source system which works with different platforms. So you can use it with Mac, Windows, or Linux, and different other server platforms on which it can be installed. And it provides a lot of different storage engines which have different uses. And it's been backed up by Oracle. So it's open source, but it's been backed up by Oracle. So you can use it without any commercial license and if you want a premium services or support from Oracle you can still buy the premium support license for that and in which Oracle will provide you support for any kind of issue or a security patch or anything. So what are the advantages of MySQL with Node.js? So first is scalability and flexibility. So when we're working with Node.js, Node.js is very scalable so it can be installed on a very low end machine like on a Raspberry Pi or it can be installed on a large scale server same way you can use mysql to create embedded server on a small device like a raspberry pi or on a new server like on a aws server or even a edge server which you can deploy on your data warehouse so it's very scalable you can choose different variations of hardware for mysql and it will run on any of them next thing is low cost of ownership as mysql is open source so there is no startup cost for licensing or starting with mysql you can just download the mysql package and start developing your application on it and if you want support, you can go with the paid licenses from Oracle. Next one is secure data protection. So MySQL has been getting developed more than 10 years. So it has a good security implementation and it has powerful mechanisms to handle out different user accesses and ownerships on the database. So it's very secure and it's been following the industry standards for security. Next point is ease of management. It is very easy to download and start your first development with MySQL. So it's very easy to maintain also. So it provides you different tools like MySQL Workbench, which can be used for maintaining your database or going through the database records and everything. And you can have events or schedules automatically configured in your database to do cleanups or to different operations in your MySQL server. So it's very easy to maintain a MySQL server when you're developing it. Next point is high performance. So when you're working with MySQL, it provides you different ways of caching your data in your memory and doing indexing. So you can have multiple indexes in your system or single index in your system and also do caching of your records in your memory only instead of like going through the records again you can cache them inside your memory only so in that way it provides a very good performance when you're working with mysql it can be used for applications which have a high demand on performance so mysql can be also used as a server which is highly available or can be also used as a clustered database so in which you can create master and slave servers and deploy on your cloud or in your data warehouse so in that way, you can create different replications of the same database and keep a copy of them so that if the demand is high or if there is any downtime of any server or any machine, you can easily switch to another slave or you can use a cluster for managing those things. So it's very scalable in those parameters of high availability. So we'll move to the next topic, MySQL installation. So we'll see how we can install MySQL on our system. So I'm using a Mac machine right now for the session. But you can install MySQL on Linux, Windows, or Mac as per your needs, and most of the steps are similar. For installing MySQL on a machine, I have to go to the MySQL official website, which is dev.mysql.com. So I'll just go to that site, slash downloads, slash installer. So over here, what we have to do is we have to first download the MySQL server. So I'll just go to MySQL server and I'll scroll down and I will find MySQL server over here. So it gives you different options for different operating systems. These are the operating system it supports. So you can choose any of them and download the package for this. So right now I'm using a Mac machine. So I will go with the Mac OS and it shows you the different options which are available. So I'll just download the first one. It will take you to the next page where it asks you for login or sign up. So it's optional. You don't need to log in or sign up. To download the package. You can just say no thanks and start my download. Once clicking on this, it will start your download. So I already have this download on my system. I'll go to my downloads folder. So 
So you can see in my downloads folder, I have this package, which is MySQL 8.0.16 Mac OS X. So I'll just start this package. So this is a DMG which will start the installation process. So this is the package for installation. I'll start the installation now. So once the package starts installing, it will provide you a wizard where you can configure the MySQL server. So it's giving a prompt that it will determine what softwares are required for the installation. So just continue. Continue the lessons. Agree. So if you want to change the installation location, you can over here. Otherwise, just install. So I'll just say it starts the installation. So the installation is done. Just move this to trash. So now I have the MySQL server installed on my system. If you want to check how it is installed, you just go to my system preferences over here. I will find a tab for MySQL. I just click on it and it gives you information like which instance is active and what instances are on my system. So this is a Mac specific screen for Windows. You will have the same kind of a screen where you get information about the MySQL setup on your system. From here, you can start the MySQL server or stop the MySQL server, and you can also configure different directories for MySQL, like the error directory or the data directory for MySQL server. So the next thing is which we want to download is the MySQL Workbench. So Workbench is a tool in which you can connect to your database and get information from the database and uh, do operations on it. So in this case, I will just go scroll down. It gives me option for Mac OS X. So I will just download this package. So again, it will ask me for login or sign up. I'll just scroll down and just say no thanks. Just start my download. So MySQL Workbench is downloaded on my system. So I'll just double click it and start the installation process. Again, for Windows and Mac, the steps are a little different, but the utilities are same. I'll just install this on my system. So I already have MySQL Workbench installed on my system. So if I install this package, it will give an error right now. So I will just stop the MySQL Workbench and replace it again. So once MySQL Workbench is installed, you can connect to a database and see cards on it. So I will open MySQL Workbench over here. So as this is MySQL Workbench and you can configure your connections over here. So by default, it gives option for the local host or the local package. So I'll just connect to that and it will ask my root password. So I will just add the password over here and press enter. So now it's connected to my database and also the MySQL server and I can go through the different database which I have over here or different schemas queries and run queries over here and all those information. So we'll be using this for tweaking data into our database and checking out how the records have been added into the MySQL record database. Now we need to start with the node.js application part where we're going to create a connection between the node.js application and MySQL. So for that first we have to create a node.js application. So I'll open my terminal. So now in my terminal, I'm going to start with a node.js application. So I'll create mkdir directory node mysql example. Now we'll navigate to this folder. Now I will set up the node.js application which I want. So first when you're creating a node.js application, you have to do npm init. So I'll just run npm init. This will help me initialize a node.js application. Says that you want to name this application as MySQL example. I'll just say yes. So if you are fine with it, you can just press enter. Otherwise, you can rename it by typing the new name over here. So if you want something, you can name it. I'm just going to go with the default name right now. The default name is based on the folder name which you have. So I'm just going to continue with the folder name, the default name, the version of it, description, if you like to add any, the entry point or the starting file, test command, git repo, keywords, and author. It gives you a preview about the package.json file, so it's okay for us. So I'll just say yes. Now it's going to be created. So I'll just clear the screen and do ls. So you can see the package.json file is added into my folder. The next step is open this node application in Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code for development, but you're free to use any editor which you like. So the folder is loaded and it has the same package.json file which we just created. Now we have to install all the packages which we need. I'll just go back to my terminal and install all the packages. So we need to install npm install packages, which are dependencies for this project. So we'll install express, express handlebars, MySQL. So these packages, the three of them are dependencies for this project. We also need body parser to parse the body information. So we'll just install that too. We also need nodemon, which we are going to install as a dev dependency. I have a type over here. I'll just fix this. It's handlebars only. So the required packages are installed. Now I have to install the dev dependencies. So I will install npm install 
instead of saying dash dash save we are going to say dash dash save dash dev so that means it's a dev dependency now we install nodemon so nodemon is installed on the system now we can start developing our application so we have the package addition file so now we will create our server file in our project folder to define our starting files for node.js so for that i will just create a server.js file and this we have dependency on mysql require mysql like this and express const body parser require body parser so now we'll create a express application by saying app is equal to express and then we we'll define app dot use for body parser so this configures the node.js application now i'll just at the end i will start this application by saying app dot listen the port number so we'll just listen to port 3000 now you have to configure how the database works this is a node express application now we have to define the configuration for the mysql database so i'll just write mysql connection is equal to mysql dot create connection and define the connection object over here so first we need the host that's local host because I'm just pointing to the local machine, so it's going to be localhost. Otherwise, you can provide the IP for the database, the user for the database the server. It's going to be root and the password. So the password is password in this case, database. And it's configuration about multiple statements. So you want to set true. So now the connection object has been created. Now we'll just start the connection. And it takes a callback which provides us feedback that the connection has been established or not. So it provides us an error if the connection object is not connected. So we can just write error handling like this. So if the connection is successful it will just print connected otherwise it's going to print connection field so now i'll go back to my terminal and clear the screen you can see the files over here so now i'll just run node mon server js so it says connection failed that means it's not able to successfully connect to the database it's not a problem i will see if the configuration is correct or not so I think it's looking for the database which we have, but we haven't created it. So first I'll do is I will create this database right now. So for creating a database in MySQL, I'm using MySQL Workbench. So over here we have option for create schema. So schema or database are same over here. So I'll just write the name of it, which is Edureka and apply. So you can configure the character set and the collision for the database and it just confirms you the query so now we have a database created over here i will just go back to my code and save it again so now you can see so what i did is i just went back to my server.js and saved it again so which triggered the node mon to reload the node.js server so now because i have the database ready it's able to connect to the mysql otherwise it was giving an error that the connection was failing so the database creation has to be done before you start with the reporting part the next step is defining all the routes for our application so the first thing is we are going to create different routes for this application which are going to be in different files so first i will create a routes folder in this folder i will create people.js this will have the routes for all people and in this file i will import express require express and define the router so i'll just define so this is a router object for the express application on which we are going to create all the routes so i'll just define get and the handler for that 
Let us define request and response. Now we have to use this router, so I will just export this module dot exports is equal to router. And in my server file, I have to import this in my application. So I'll just import on staple routes equal to require so I have people routes over here and then in my app.js for the application I will define app dot use path so it's going to be slash people and the handler for that the handler for that will be people routes so all the routes which are coming for slash people will go to the people routes file and in that we can handle uh, the request which we need to respond back so now in my people file i will just go back to the route which i have which is get so over here we can make a database connection and do the query part so for creating the connection first i will do one cleanup so i will create a new file which will be named as connection.js and i will move the connection details from this app.js to a particular file over there so just take this and import it over here and now i can export my sql connection from here module dot exports equal to mysql connection so i'm exporting mysql connection from here so once the mysql connection has been exported i will go back to my server.js and import it over here const mysql connection is equal to require connection now I can run the connection methods over here. So I will just copy this line and move to my people.js. So actually, we need to make a connection over here. So I'll just write connection and write mysql.connection query. That's the database query which I want to execute. So I will define select star from people and the callback for it. So the first parameter is going to be error rows fields and if we don't get any error so i can just write row otherwise it will just log that what's the error we'll respond dot send rows over here otherwise else console dot log the error so let's configure now we need to go back to our terminal and run this code so it says mysql it's not defined so that's the issue because I haven't copied the MySQL import over here. So I have to cut this import from here and add it to my connection file. Now you can see it made a connection. Now the next step is go to Chrome and hit that URL. The URL was localhost 3000 slash people. So I'll just hit this and go back to the terminal and see if it gives any errors or something. So we got an error that there is no such table available on the database. Now what I have to do is I have to create this table. So I'll go back to my MySQL workbench. So I'm in MySQL Workbench and I will create this table on this particular database. So I'll name it as people and define the columns for it. Name, you can define different parameters for people like age, define name, where care, 200. I'll print the query like, do you want to execute this query? Yes, I want to and execute that query. So now the table will be created as people. I will go back to localhost and run localhost 3000 slash people you can see it prints out a blank array over here because the table is created although it doesn't have any records in it so now add records to this table so i'm using the editor inside for quench for adding records so I'll just click on particular record and say praveen and age is equal to run to so I the value for first record and for the second record apply the changes so once you apply the changes it will give you the queries that will be executed so it says insert queries for adding records just apply the queries and confirm that the queries have been triggered successfully now go back to your browser and do a refresh so you'll see that the record started coming up so these were the two records which i added into the database so now we have a successful database connection and it's able to retrieve records from the database so we can use different tools like postman to verify our apis so i can just open postman and send the request to this url which is localhost 3000 people so send request or get request to it 
and you can see it prints out a JSON response over here. Why do I get a JSON response? So this MySQL package actually converts whatever the record you're getting from the database, it converts into a JSON response. So you don't have to manipulate all the array or the table structure. It provides you a structure which can be directly used in your application, which is very good. So you can use different types of structures. You can reuse any kind of queries with MySQL and BIM package and run them on your MySQL server. Introduction to REST API. So let us understand what is REST API. The term REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It is basically an architectural style that defines a set of rules in order to create web services. Now, in a client server communication, REST really suggests to create an object of that data requested by the client and eventually sends the value of the object in response to that user. For example, if the user is requesting for a movie in a particular city in India, at a certain place and a certain time, then you can create an object on the server side. So over here, you have an object and you are sending the state of an object. This is why REST is known as the representational state transfer. Now the architectural style of REST helps in leveraging the lesser use of bandwidth to make an application more suitable for the internet. This is why it is often regarded as the language of the internet and is completely based on resources. Another important point is that REST is a stateless client and server model. Now that we know what is REST API, let's move ahead and talk about some of its features. Now the first and the most important feature of REST API is that it is simpler than SOAP. If you've heard of REST, I'm sure you must have heard of SOAP. Now beyond the REST architecture, developers are using the standard SOAP, which is another possibility when writing an API. Now, the main advantage of the former over the latter is that its implementation is much more simpler. That is, API is very simple. Now, a clear example can be seen in the API catalog that Salesforce company provides. It has tools with both architectures, but it is very noticeable that REST allows access to services that are very powerful, convenient, and very simple to interact with in the entire company. So that's one of the great features of REST API. It's much more simpler than SOAP. The next feature is it supports JSON and XML. Now there are developers for all tastes and an API should definitely aim to adapt to them all. Thus, another advantage of REST API is that it satisfies the expectations of those who use the JSON language as much as it satisfies those that rely on XML. Now with tech giants like Microsoft, Google or WordPress opt for this type of software architecture in many of their tools it is, among other things, because it prevents them from ignoring any developer. They all have a place in the REST API world. The third reason is documentation. Now each change in the architecture of the REST API should be definitely reflected in its documentation so that any developer using it knows what to expect. Now this already represents another advantage over other standards, which although they may be slightly explained as it is the case of PayPal SOAP API, which usually does not provide much detail. Now, nevertheless, the documentation does require the creators of the API to keep that information fully updated, which sometimes can be cubersome. Luckily, there are tools like Swagger for synchronizing such updates so that they can occur automatically when changing any detail of the API. The last feature of REST API is error messages. Now, when making a mistake while working with an API, any developer will appreciate knowing what the error has been. Hence the possibility offered by the REST architecture of including error messages providing some clue in this regard is also very relevant. Now talking about Microsoft, the services offered by the company founded by Bill Gates through Azure, its tools for the cloud have a clear list of possible error messages, which surely must have been more useful in more than one occasion. Now that we know some of the features of REST API, let's move ahead and talk about the principles of REST API. Well, there are six ground principles laid down by Dr. Fielding, who was the one to define the REST API design in 2000. Now, the first one is stateless. The request sent from a client to a server will contain all the required information to make the server understand the request sent from the client. Now, this can be either a part of URL, query string parameters, body, or even headers. 
Now the URL is used to uniquely identify the resource and the body holds the state of the requesting resource. Now once the server processes the request, a response is sent to the client through body, status or headers. The second principle is client server. Now the client server architecture enables a uniform interface and separates clients from the servers. This eventually enhances the portability across multiple platforms as well as the scalability of the server components. The third principle on the other hand is uniform interface. By the name you must have figured out to obtain the uniformity throughout the application, REST has some following constraints. That is resource identification, resource manipulation using representations, self-descriptive messages and hypermedia as the engine of application state cacheable. Now in order to provide a better performance, the applications are often made cacheable. Now when there is a response from the server, it is either labeled cacheable or non-cacheable either explicitly or implicitly. Now if the response is defined as cacheable, then the client cache can reuse the response data for equivalent responses in the future. Then if it is non-cacheable, then the information if requested again will be fetched from the server. The next principle is layered system. Now the layered system architecture allows an application to be much more stable by limiting component behavior. This type of architecture helps in enhancing the application security as components in each layer cannot interact beyond the next immediate layer they are in. Also it enables load balancing and provides shared caches for promoting scalability. The last principle is code on demand. Now this is an optional constraint and is used the least. It permits a client's code or applets to be downloaded and to be used within the application. Now in essence, it simplifies the clients by creating a smart application which doesn't really rely on its own code structure. Now that we know the principles behind REST API, let's go ahead and look at the methods of REST API. Now anyone who has worked in web technology in the past before must be aware of crude operations that is create, read, update and delete. Now when someone says crude operation, it really means that we create a resource, read a resource, update a resource and delete a resource. Now to do these actions, you can actually use the HTTP methods, which are nothing but the REST API methods. So this is the traditional architecture. Generally, the server side technologies like PHP, ASP.NET, Ruby and Java servers all follow a multi-threaded model. Now in this traditional architectural approach, each client request creates a new thread or a process. You can see that every time the client makes a request, there's always a separate response. Now again, if the client one makes say request three, then a separate response is again sent for that. So to avoid this, Node.js uses single threaded event loop model architecture. So here it means that all the client requests on Node.js are executed on the same thread. Now this means that all the client requests in Node.js are executed on the same thread. But this architecture is not just single threaded, but also event driven. It helps Node.js in handling multiple clients concurrently. Now if you see the diagram, it represents the single threaded event loop model architecture. And as you can see, the main event loop is single threaded, whereas the input output workers are executed on distinct threads. This is done to accommodate the entire event loop where most of the Node.js APIs are designed to be asynchronous or non-blocking. This eventually reduces the server response time and also increases application throughput. Now that we know what is REST API and also we have a brief idea of Node.js, let's go ahead and build a RESTful API using Node.js. So the first thing that we'll require is for us to download Node.js. So I'm just going to Google Node.js and I'm just going to the official website of Node.js and you can see that you'll get an option download for Windows. You will have to download the LTS version and this is recommended for most users. So that's that. And once that is done, you can just set it up. I'm just going to click next and I'm going to accept the terms and I'm going to click next. This will allow me to choose a custom location as to where I could download Node.js. I'm okay with the location. So I'm just going to click next. So I'm just going to leave this on default and I'm going to click next. I'm just going to click next and I'm going to install. You can see that Node.js has been set up 
and installed successfully. So I'm just going to click on the finish button. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just open my command prompt. So once I open the command prompt, I'm just going to check if Node.js has downloaded successfully in my local machine. And yes, it has. It says version 14.16.0 has been downloaded. So that is that. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to create a new directory and I'm going to use the mkdir command and let's just name this directory edureka for now. Okay. And I'm just going to switch to this directory by using the change directory command. That is the CD command. And once that is done, I just want to list out the files that are currently present in this directory. So it says zero files are present in the directory. So that's great. I'm going to clear the screen. So now what we're going to do is we're going to check if we have downloaded NPM. So when we download Node.js, the Node.js downloads NPM package automatically for us. So for all of y'all who don't know what the NPM package is, firstly, NPM just stands for Node Package Manager. And it is simply a package manager for the JavaScript programming language. So it can also install packages globally so that all the Node.js applications on the computer can import and use the installed packages. And this is exactly why we need NPM and it is pretty important. So once that is done, I'm just going to clear the screen. So now what we're going to do is we're going to initialize the NPM package and we're going to use the command NPM in it. So if you want to automatically say yes to all of the questions that will pop up after you execute this command, then you can just add hyphen hyphen yes. And then I'm just going to execute this command. So you can see that the directory name is given. You have the version, you have the description, which is blank as of now. And there's a file that has been created that says index.js. We'll talk more about this later. And you can see test, you can see keywords, author, license. This is great. Now to work further, we'll have to work on a code editor. I'll be currently working on Visual Studio Code. You can choose anything you'd like to. If you're comfortable with Sublime Text, you could go ahead and, you know, work on that or anything else, you know, you could really work on whatever you're comfortable with. So now I'm just going to open Visual Studio Code. So this is how it looks. So I'm just going to click on File and open folder and I'm just going to look for my file or directory edureka. So I'm just going to go to local disk C and click on edureka. So if I open this package.json file, you can really see the entire file, the name, the version description and everything else that we'd already seen. Now what we're going to do is we're going to download Express. So Express is simply a backend web application framework for Node.js and it is used to provide server side logic for web applications or mobile applications. And as such, it's used all over the place. So what we're going to do is we're just going to download Express. I'm going to switch back to my command prompt and I'm going to type the command npm. I meaning install and express and this will download the file for me. If you switch back to your Visual Studio code, you can see that it has downloaded the lock file and it has also installed the various node modules. And if you open them, you can just see all of them. Just going to close this. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to be creating a new file. I'm just going to right click create a new file and I'm just going to name this index.js. So firstly, I'm going to write const express equal to require express. So once express is imported into our code, we need to create express application and that's very simple. I'm just going to do that now. So we write const app equal to express. And we will execute this function. So this creates our express application on the app variable. Now this app variable, I'm going to define our API URLs. So I hope you know this restful API is everything based on resources. So every resource has a URL. Now I'm just going to call get. So this is my endpoint. I'm going to declare that. And here we're going to declare two functions.
So here we have two parameters. One is the request and one is the response. So to get data for a particular resource, we use the HTTP get method. So in this case, app dot get means that we want a handler to handle all the API requests for a particular URL on the get method. So we define the method. So as of now, we want to define the URL for it. So we'll write slash, which has the HTTP method. Now as get this handler will be called. So we have to define the handler and we will have to write this function. This will be the callback for this URL. And over here we have to also write request and response. So there are two arguments which we receive. The first one, as I've already mentioned, is the request. And the second one is the response. Request usually has the information about the information that has been sent from the client to the server side. And response or rest means what information you want to send as a response from your server to the client side. Now over here, we'll just be sending information. So we have just written welcome to the tutorial. So we'll just complete the code and then we will save it and then run the file. So everything looks good here. We've just mentioned the port 3000 and we've also written a message of active on port 3000. Okay. I'm just going to save this. And once that is done, we will simply shift to our command prompt. Now we will execute the file. So it says active on port 3000. So we're just going to go to our local web browser and we'll check out the port 3000. So localhost 3000 and it says welcome to the tutorial. So that's great. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to make some changes. I'm going to say welcome to the node JS tutorial. Okay. I'm going to save this and I'm going to switch back here and you see that the page doesn't make any change. You will have to restart the entire server all over again. So I'm going to do that. Now it says active and I'm just going to go and refresh and then it says welcome to the node.js tutorial. So all the time you make changes to your code, you will have to come back, restart your server and then you'll have to refresh your page. So there's this one NPM library which will help you get rid of this problem and it's called Nodemon. So it's just a tool that helps develop Node.js based application by automatically restarting the node application when file changes in the directory are detected. Okay, so that's the advantage. So we'll just download this library for now and see how it really works. So now node mon has been successfully downloaded into our system. Now what we can do is we can quickly shift back to our code and go to package.json and here in the test we can just make some changes. We can just name this service as start and we can just change this to nodemon index.js okay and just save this. So this will directly call nodemon index.js. You don't have to type nodemon index.js or you don't have to call node index.js all the time and keep restarting the server. You can just directly call this start service. Okay. I'm going to the index.js. Let's just remove this node.js and let's just keep it back to welcome to the tutorial. Save this file. Now shifting back to the command prompt. Let me clear the screen. And as I've already mentioned, I can just call the start service, right? So I'm just going to say npm start and it will start the node index.js for me automatically and it says active on port 3000. So I'm just going to shift on that and I'm just going to refresh the page. Great. So now let's just make the change back to welcome to the node.js tutorial and save the file. And once that is done, you can see that the node mon is restarting due to changes and it's starting node index.js again. So once that is done and I shift back to the page, 
you can see that the changes have been implemented in literally a few seconds. You don't have to restart the server all over again. Nodemon really helps you in saving a lot of time. So that's great. Okay, so now what we'll be doing is we'll be creating a simple crude REST application for library management using Node.js and Express. Now to build this, we'll have to have Node, Express, Nodemon and also Joy. So we have Node, Express and Nodemon. We'll have to install Joy. So for that, I'm just going to go to my command prompt. I'm just going to clear, terminate this. Yes clear the screen and then type npm install joy and then this will automatically download the dependency so once this is done let's just shift to our package and you can see that joy has been automatically added that's great so in the index.js i've already written the piece of code it's pretty long so i didn't want to type the whole thing out i've just written it down anyway so here you can see that we have declared three constants express joy and app we've also used the use function and then we have declared a constant books and given three titles that is harry potter to a light and Lorian legacies with each of these having their separate ids that is one to three so here you can see that there are four different request handlers the first one is read then there's create then there's update and there is delete so here you can see that the read one has get request which provides read only access to a resource on the other hand the create request has post which basically updates an existing resource or creates a new resource and the update one has put which just creates a new resource and the delete one by its name itself you must have figured out it removes a resource we've used the arguments request and response and we have also sent welcome to edureka's rest api with node.js tutorial we also have the handler of api slash books and we also have declared an id to its end so we can find the book based on this line of code so as i've already mentioned in the post it creates a new resource and this is what this part of the code does it creates a new book and then it pushes the book into the memory and it also updates an existing resource so moving on we have the update request handler here it's going to update if any of the ids are to be changed based on the book so all of that changes are based on the update request handler and finally in the delete request handler i'm just going to delete the book so based on the index that i provide i will just delete the book and in the port environment variable, you can see that port 8080 has been passed. So the port variable allows you to pass or set any port that you'd like to based on this variable. But on default, it's on 8080. So let's go ahead and run this file. Okay, that's great. So if you want to see the books, the number of books that are present, we can just type in slash api slash books and this will just give the title and idea of all the three books that we have mentioned so that's great so now what we're going to do is we have to check whether the handlers are working properly or not so for that we're going to use a chrome extension called postman you can just download postman easily on the internet and just click the first link so this is postman you can just sign in given your credentials and just download it easily on your computer okay i've already downloaded postman and this is how it really looks this is the workspace that i've created my first workspace so what we're going to do here is once we've successfully installed it open it and let's start off by testing the get method now in order to do that you need to select get which is already auto selected so I'm just going to type in the URL. It is 8080. So I'm just going to change that. And I'm just going to click and send. And you can see that all the three titles have been mentioned here. Harry Potter, Twilight and Lorian Legacies. Now if your code is working fine, then you will obviously see this list. If you want to delete any particular book, you can just mention the ID of that book by the URL. 
So once that is done, you can just select delete and then you can send. You can see that title to a light ID two has been deleted. If you want to cross check if it's been deleted, you can just switch to get again and then click send. And you can see that there are only two books that are available of ID one and three. That is Harry Potter and Lorien Legacies. So that's how APIs really work. Now talking about the career in web development, a web developer is a programmer who specializes in the development of World Wide Web applications using a client server model. Now they are also responsible for designing coding and modifying websites from layout to function and according to a client specifications. So you can find professionals trained in web development working as computer programmers, software engineers and even web focused graphic designers. Now some of the key job roles are the web developer. So web developers use programming and technology skills to construct the appearance and user experience of a site. And for a web developer, the average salary is around 480,000 per annum. The next role is of a computer programmer. Now a computer programmer develops and adjusts the proper function of software by writing and testing code. The average salary ranges between a 232k to around 1 million. Now the next role is of a web designer. So web designers work on the front end of a site and are concerned with outward appearance and user experience. The average salary for a web designer in India is around 281,000 per annum. And the final role is of a graphic web designer. So a graphic designer works to enhance the user experience or application by creating graphics and other visual media. And the average salary ranges from around 118k to around 619k. So here the basic level project is about a responsive layout. Now one major role of a front end developer is to understand the responsive design principles and how to implement them on the coding side. Now in this project we will create a basic layout of a single responsive page and how it works in web development for building multi-purpose websites. So let's see how our responsive layout looks like. So here is a sample responsive layout page that I have created and it is just a very basic structure to show how a responsive layout actually works. So here you can see that you have different sections of the same page. So first section is a heading which says welcome to Edureka and in the leftmost side you can see different links that I have inserted. Now these links will take you to these particular locations of the Edureka website that is the original website. So for example here I have given links to our data science course cloud computing big data and the full stack course. So as soon as I click these links you will be redirected to the original page and the link that I have inserted here. So now let's see how the code for a responsive layout works. Now to check the code you can go to inspect and here you can find all the elements. Now for each section you will be able to see how we have written the code and how you can build this particular section of your responsive layout page. So this will help you understand that what exactly this particular section of code is doing. So as soon as I go to the div classes, you can see that it shows the div menu, which are these four links that I've inserted here. Now this is one way of understanding the different elements. Now let's get back to the original code that I have written in order to create this responsive layout page and I will explain you step by step on how you can do it. Now the first step is to create the HTML layout and then design the head part of the web page. So this is the HTML code for our responsive layout page here. We have also used a little bit of CSS in order to do the styling. So let's get started here. So the first section is the head section. So this represents the head part of your page. So here what we have done is we have created a head section with a meta name that is the viewport and inside the viewport we have our device width, 
then we have scaled it as 1.0 you can add different scalings and you can make the page look like however you want it to so you can add your width length the way you want to style it now here begins the styling section for the head part so here i have added the box sizing as a border box then I've given the width as 20% the text has been aligned to center You can add different colors different margins different borders to your boxes as per your wish But this is a very basic responsive layout that I have created in order to make you understand that What exactly a responsive layout is and how you can build the structure of it Now the next section is the menu section which is this part where I have given four different links which is kind of a menu where I'm serving different links and that will take you to the original website So here you can see that the first thing I've done is set a background color You can add colors as per your wish and then you just have to do the styling with padding margin top display How you want to show the texts and what color your text should be? So this was the styling for the menu part where I have inserted the four different links and how they are supposed to look The next part is the main section Now the main section is this one where I have just given an introduction or a one-liner for the website So here I just have given a little bit of styling that is the width and the padding Next up is the right section which represents the about part of the website so here I've given a small description about what Edureka actually does and it is just like the about section for Edureka Now for this the styling that I've done is given it a background color the width padding margin top and how I want the text to look like Now here is another important part so for a responsive layout you need to keep in mind that that the page works fine for any device So if you are viewing in a laptop it will look different when you are viewing the same website in a mobile phone It will have different outlook all over So here for the mobile phones I've specified how the menu main and right section will look like I've given the width as 100% so that it covers the entire section while you are viewing this particular Website or the web page in your mobile phone and not in your desktop now next part is getting into the body section. So we have done the styling of all our head sections Now it's time for the body section So inside the body style what we have added is the different background colors and padding and texts that we want to align or What are the colors of the text that you want? Also here we have inserted all our head tags or all the headings that we want to insert in our page so the first one is welcome to Edureka and in the next section we have our division styles So in this part we have the menu So we have created a menu section for our page already now inside this menu I wanted to add different links that will redirect you to the original page of these particular links So what I've done is created links with the help of the a tag and here I have inserted links for each of these courses So I've given a heading which is data science But along with it I have given the original link that is the link to the data science certification courses and to the original website of Edureka So like this I have added around four links here for data science cloud computing big data and full stack So basically this will show you the heading as data science cloud computing big data and full stack but as soon as you click on the name, it will redirect you to this particular link. Now the next class is the main section. So in the main section, what we have done is we have just given a heading as Edureka and just a one liner to describe about Edureka. So here I've written your one stop solution to trending technologies. So this is just any catchy line or just another class that I wanted to add here. So just a one liner description and a small introduction. The next class is the right now here what I have added is an about section for Edureka So I have given the heading as about and then again I have written a one-liner or a description about what Edureka actually does that it provides different technical courses, etc So whatever page you are creating you can build it accordingly. You can style it accordingly It's not necessary that you have to add these particular elements for any page This is just an example of how you can build a responsive layout So what you can do is you can add anything or any sort of description inside these classes 
and finally I've added the background color text alignment padding and all of that now the final section here I have styled the end part of the responsive layout that is this one so here you can see that I've given the copyright at Eureka.co so for this I've just styled with a background color and the text alignment and what should be the text inside this and with this we have completed the HTML code in order to create a responsive layout. So this is a very small code and a very simple code that will help you build the basic responsive layout structure. This is just to show that how you can create a basic structure for a responsive layout web page so that you can use it from your desktop, your mobile phone and access all of it in the same manner. Now this responsive layout is definitely a very important part of web development because you wouldn't want your users to miss out on anything from your website based on the devices they are using. Now finally when we run this code this is exactly what we get to see here. So as soon as you click on these particular links you will be redirected to the original page like how I clicked on data science course and I was redirected to the original course link here. You can also increase the width and make it a full page in your desktop. You can also change it according to your needs. So when you check out this particular page from your mobile phone as I have specified the width to be 100% it will cover your entire screen and you will still be able to see all of these sections together. Now this was the most basic level project for your web development and I hope you understood that how you can create a very simple responsive layout web page that can be accessed from any device and which will show the same output and help you understand all of it better from any device you're accessing it. Let's take a look at the skills that are required to become a web developer. The first thing that we're going to discuss is the front end developer skills. So in this section, we're going to discuss about the top 10 most important technical skills that are required for a front end web developer. The first and foremost is HTML and CSS. HTML stands for hypertext markup language and it is the most basic building block required for developing websites. CSS or cascading style sheets is the language that is used for presenting the document you create with HTML. HTML is used for creating the foundation of your page, whereas CSS is used to create the layout of the page, color, font and styles. Both of these languages are absolutely essential to become a front-end developer. JavaScript along with jQuery. Another important tool for a front-end developer is JavaScript. If you are trying to implement interactive features in your websites such as audio and video, games, scrolling abilities, page animations, etc., JavaScript is the tool you need to know. jQuery is a library of JavaScript which is among the most used libraries across the world. It basically is a collection of plugins and extensions that make it faster and easier to use JavaScript on your website. jQuery takes common tasks that require multiple lines of JavaScript code and compresses them into a format that can be executed with a single line. Frameworks As front-end developers, it is important that you have sound knowledge of frameworks and libraries such as Angular, React, Vue, etc. These are basically frameworks and libraries that are based on JavaScript. JavaScript frameworks are collections of CSS or JavaScript files that perform different tasks by providing common functionality. Instead of starting with an empty text document, you can start with a code file that has lots of JavaScript present already in it. Responsive design. We use different gadgets like computers, phones and tablets to look at web pages. The web pages adjust themselves to the device you're using without any extra effort from your end. This is due to the responsive design feature. It is an intrinsic part of CSS frameworks like the bootstrap. Version control or Git. Version control is the process of tracking and controlling changes to your source code. It is a tool that you can use to track the changes made previously so that you can go back to a previous version of your work and find out what went wrong without tearing the whole thing down. Testing and debugging. A front-end developer must possess the skill and ability to test and debug the code. There are different testing methods for web development. Functional testing looks at a particular piece of functionality on your site and ensures it does everything according to the code. Unit testing is another method that tests the smallest bit of code and examines it individually for correct operation. Testing is a big part of front-end development process and there are a number of frameworks that will help you in this regard. 
Browser Developer Tools Browser Developer Tools usually consist of an inspector and a JavaScript console. The inspector allows you to see what the runtime HTML on your page looks like, what CSS is associated with each element on the page, and also allows you to edit your HTML and CSS and see the changes live as they happen. Web Performance It is important to make sure that your website performs smoothly without any glitch. Web Performance defines the amount of time it takes for your website to load. Programs like Grunt and Gulp can be used to automate image optimization, CSS and JS minifying, and other web performance scores. It helps in making your website more efficient. CSS Processing CSS Processor is an advanced version of CSS. This is used to enhance the primary class of CSS to create better versions of the website. It is not just a language to improve the styling elements, but it helps the developer to skip tasks like writing CSS selectors and color strings frequently. Command line. GUI is an important part of web development and coding as well. But an all-purpose GUI is going to have its limitations for some specific applications. Sometimes you may need to open a terminal on your computer where you can enter typed commands or command lines to get what you need. Although the majority of the work is done through a GUI, you can add serious cred to your front-end skills if you have mastery of the command line. So these were some of the technical skills that are required by front-end developers. Now let's talk about the skills that are required by back-end developers. The back-end developer layer forms a dynamic connection between the front-end and the database. To get this layer working, it's important to know at least one of the programming languages like Python, Java, PHP, Ruby, etc. And the knowledge of server-side frameworks such as Node.js is a must. Python is an open-source object-oriented programming language that was released in 1991 and ever since it has become one of the most favorite languages of software developers and web developers. Java is also an open-source, high-level programming language which was released by Sun Microsystems in 1996. It follows the write once, run anywhere approach that makes it compatible to run on any platform. Another popular web development language is PHP. It is an open-source, server-side scripting language used to develop the back-end logic of an application. It is a powerful tool for making dynamic and interactive websites. Node.js is an open-source JavaScript framework used specifically for creating the backend or the server side of an application. Through Node.js, JavaScript can now finally run on the server side of the web as well. Data and Database The data layer is a massive warehouse of information. It contains a database repository that captures and stores information from the front end through the back end. A prerequisite is to have the knowledge of how data is stored, edited, retrieved, etc. An understanding of databases such as MySQL, MongoDB, etc. is a must. MySQL is basically an open-source relational database management system that provides multi-user access and supports multi-storage engines. MongoDB is known for its ease of use and its quickness in handling a large amount of data. It is an open-source object-oriented NoSQL database which is highly scalable and it's efficient in handling unstructured data. Server Setup to make a website accessible publicly on the internet, it needs to be installed on a server. Once you have your domain name and server space, it's time to set up the site on the server. The first thing is to direct the domain name to the server's unique IP address. Then you need to set up the website files and finally the database and other configurations. Deployment tools. To get files from your own computer up to the server, you need a protocol. This is basically a method of transporting files or other data and to and from a server. The deployment tool stores your FTTP or SFTP settings and when a change is published in Git to the master branch, the tool will transfer the files for you. Therefore, there is no need to remember which file you changed, reducing the number of mistakes you make. The next important skill is the knowledge of JavaScript frameworks and libraries. Some of the most important JavaScript frameworks and libraries are Angular, React, Vue, jQuery, etc. So those were the skills that are required in order to become a backend developer. So talking about full stack web developers. A full stack web developer must know how to create and maintain the front end and the back end of a web application and they also must be proficient with the various languages used to develop a web application. Skills that are required by full stack developers. A full stack developer needs to have an in-depth understanding of the web architecture and communication protocols like HTTP, TCP IP, etc. 
they should be skilled in working with deployment operating systems like Ubuntu, CentOS, Windows, etc. They also should have a sound knowledge of web servers and basic UI UX designing abilities. A full stack developer should be proficient in the front end technologies such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They should be able to design and develop the UI using the web development frameworks and libraries that I've already mentioned earlier. Also, full stack developers are required to have good amount of knowledge of server side programming languages like Java, Python, PHP, Ruby, etc., as well as server side frameworks such as Node.js. They should be well versed in operating and querying relational and NoSQL database management systems such as MongoDB, MySQL, etc. Apart from that, a full stack developer also should know how to operate and manage the version control systems such as Git, Subversion, etc. So that sums up the technical skills that are required by all three that is the front end, back end, and full stack developers. Also, not to forget, the knowledge of DevOps can give you an edge. DevOps is basically a combination of two words that is development and operations. DevOps is a practice that allows a single team to manage the entire application development lifecycle that is development, testing, deployment, and monitoring. The ultimate goal of DevOps is to decrease the duration of systems development lifecycle while delivering features, fixes, and updates frequently in close synchronization with business objectives. Now that you know the technical skills that are required, Let's move on and take a look at the non-technical skills that you need to possess in order to fetch you the best web development job in the market. As a web developer, it is very important that you possess the appropriate technical skills. But at the same time, to make efficient products, it is also important to communicate with the clients and grasp ideas. To do this, you should be well versed with verbal and vocal communication skills. Also, to work with the team, you need to possess the basic lessons of teamwork as well. One thing that all developers must have regardless of the job description or official title is excellent problem solving skills. From figuring out how to best implement a design to fixing bugs that crop up, figuring out how to make the front end code work for the back end code, development is all about creative problem solving skills. To conclude, all I'd like to say is that becoming a web developer requires good amount of effort and dedication. But is it worth all the effort? Yes, it definitely is. Have a look at the different job trends of a web developer and have a look at the number of jobs available across the world. Now here in this particular table you can see the number of jobs available in different locations in the US. Now we have collected this data based on indeed.com. So you can see that in New York you have around 1426 jobs for a web developer. Whereas in San Francisco, you have 1036 and Seattle 988, Washington DC, you have 742 and in Chicago, you have around 728 jobs available for a web developer. Now, these are all estimated numbers that keeps changing, but this gives you an idea about the number of jobs that are available if you are looking for a web developer job. Now, according to US Bureau of Labor Statistics, Employment of web developers is projected to grow 15% from 2016 to 2026, much faster than the average for all other occupations. Also, an increase in the use of mobile devices to search the web will lead to increased demand for web developers. Now, next, let's have a look at the number of jobs that are available in different locations in India. So you can see that Bangalore has the highest number of jobs available for a web developer that is 6,318. Next is Pune where you have 2,700 jobs and then Hyderabad with 2,500, Chennai and Mumbai followed by 2,300 and 1,900 jobs. Now these were some of the estimated numbers for the number of jobs available for a web developer in the US and India. Now let's move ahead and have a look at the different salary trends of a web developer. Now according to the sources from Payscale, you can see that the average web developer salary in India is around 308656 So you can see that the average salary revolves around 3 lakhs per annum. And talking about US, the average salary of a web developer is around $59,000. 
Now Glassdoor rates the average base pay for web developers at around $93,000 per year. That's a much higher rate than Payscale and Salary.com which claims a median of $60,000. But that's the overall range of how much a web developer actually earns in the US. Now these were some of the average or the estimated values of how much a web developer earns. Let's get into the specific zone and see how much the web developer earns according to the states. Now here you can see there is a list of web developer salaries for different states in the US with tech hubs or a high ratio of web development job openings. So in San Francisco the average salary ranges within $80,000 whereas in Seattle it goes down to $70,000. For New York your average salary ranges around $68,000 and for Los Angeles and Chicago it's around $65 and $64,000. Now talking about the average earning of web developers for different states in India for Bangalore we have the average salary around 373000 per annum whereas for Hyderabad we have 341000 and for Mumbai it goes down to 337000 and for Pune and Chennai it's 324000 and 313000 respectively per annum so these are some of the average earnings of the web developers in the US and also in India and how the salary varies from state to state. So now that we have seen how the state factor varies the average salary of a web developer. Let's move on and see how the companies pay a web developer. So we will have a look at the company based salary now. So there is a huge growth in the employment percentage of web developers for multinational companies. So let's have a look at some of the top companies and their average salary for the role of a web developer. So you can see that Accenture pays around 350,000 per annum for a web developer. Whereas Tata Consultancy Services pays around 420,000 and when it comes to Cognizant it pays around 384,000. But when it comes to the Technology Solutions Corporation, the salary goes higher, such as 5,27,000 per annum. Similarly, for Infosys, Infotech, Amazon, we have the salary ranges around 4,17,000, or it can go down to 2,92,000 as well. But at the same time, for companies like Amazon.com, it can also go up to 10 lakhs per annum. Now, let's move on and have a look at the different skills for a web developer and the salary that you get paid for the skills that you acquire. Now the skills in JavaScript and web development are correlated and it pays more than average. Some of the skills that pay less than the market rate include the CSS, PHP and HTML5. So here you can see that if you are well versed with JavaScript or HTML, the salary is around 3,35,000 or 3,6,000. But for PHP and CSS, it goes down to 2,58,000 or 2,97,000 per annum. Also, if you are well versed with web development or the complete web, your salary can go up to 3,22,000 per annum as well. Now, let's talk about a web developer's salary based on their experience. Now, there are four different levels of experience based on which your average salary also differs. So talking about the different levels first one is the entry level front end developer that is where you have less than one year of experience. So for that your average salary can be around 2,24,000 per annum. Now if you are in your early career front end developer level that is where you have experience between one to four years your average salary can come up to around 3 lakhs per annum. Next level is the mid career front end developer which ranges from five to nine years of experience and the average salary comes up to around six lakhs per annum. And finally, the last level is the experienced front end developer. And for that, you need to have an experience of 10 to 19 years and then you can earn almost around 10 lakhs per annum. So these were some of the estimated numbers collected from different sources to give you an idea of a web developer's salary and how it can differ based on different factors such as state, your skills, your experience, etc. Now if you are someone looking to get into an interesting career, 
Now would be the right time to upskill and take advantage of the web development career opportunities that come your way. Now let's move on and talk about the job description of a web developer or what is their actual role. Now the first step in crafting a resume is by looking at the job description. So let's have a look at a sample job description based on the details provided by different companies in Glassdoor. So here is a sample job description that tells you what are the things that you must be aware of or what are the skills that you must have in order to become a web developer. Now first of all you need programming skills and in-depth knowledge of modern HTML or CSS. Also you need to be familiar with at least one of the languages such as PHP, ASP.NET, JavaScript or Ruby on Rails. Not just that you must have a solid understanding of how web applications work including the security, session management and best development practices. Apart from that you also need to have an adequate knowledge of relational database systems object oriented programming and web application development. Along with that you need some hands on experience with network diagnostics network analytics tools. Also you need to have some basic knowledge of search engine optimization process and some problem solving skills definitely. Apart from all of these you need a strong organizational skill to handle multiple tasks within the constraints of timelines and budgets. And finally, you must have the ability to work and thrive in a fast paced environment, learn rapidly and master diverse web technologies and techniques. Now these are some of the common things that you must have if you are looking for a web developer job role. So these descriptions are collected based on the different sources from different companies who are looking for web developers. So before you send out your resume make sure that you have all of these skills. Now let's move on and talk about some of the roles and responsibilities of a web developer. So a web developer must have experience in the planning and the delivery of web applications across multiple platforms and talking about some of the common roles and responsibilities. You must be efficient in writing a code and creating websites using standard HTML, CSS, JavaScript, jQuery and APIs practices. Not just that, you also need to work closely with web designers and programmers to produce the website. You also need to have a constant communication with other colleagues in the business to develop and deploy their content. Also, ensure that there is a clear establishment of what can be created within what time frame. Apart from that you need to do a lot of research about software programs maintaining software documentation then implement the contingency plans in case of website breakdown and also you need to maintain expand and enhance the website once it is complete. Finally you must know how to manage a team and work together. So these are some of the common roles and responsibilities of a web developer. And these are the things that you must keep in mind while applying for a web developers job role. Now these were some of the descriptions or roles and responsibilities. But there are certain skill sets that are very important for your resume. And these are the skills that are a must for you to become a web developer. Now there are technologies and knowledge that are common to all web developers. First let's talk about some of the front end skills. So for that we have HTML which is the foundation of all websites. Then we have CSS which is used for styling the HTML elements and then JavaScript which allows you to interact with elements on the website and to manipulate them. Next up is the responsive design. Now one major role of a front end developer is to understand the responsive design principles and how to implement them on the coding side. It is an intrinsic part of CSS frameworks like the bootstrap. The next skill that you must be well versed with is the building tools. Now the modern web browsers come equipped with developer tools for testing and debugging. These tools allow you to test the web pages in the browser itself and finds out how the page is interpreting the code. Now the browser developer tools usually consist of an inspector and a JavaScript console. Next you have the version control or git. 
Now version control is the process of tracking and controlling changes to your source code so that you don't have to start from the beginning if anything goes wrong. And finally you have the CSS and JavaScript frameworks which are collections of CSS or JS files that perform different tasks by providing common functionality. So some of the popular frameworks are the jQuery, Angular, React and Vue. Now let's talk about some of the backend skills that you need to have to become a web developer. So first is Python. Now this is an open source object oriented programming language and it is definitely one of the favorite languages of most software and web developers. The next up you have Java and PHP. Now Java is a high level programming language and it makes it compatible to run on any platform. And for PHP, it is a server side scripting language that is used to develop the backend logic of any application. And finally, you have the Node.js. Now, this is an open source JavaScript framework which is used specifically for creating the backend or the server side of an application. Through Node.js, JavaScript can now finally run on the server side of the web. So these were the different skills that you need to acquire in order to become a successful web developer. Now let's move on and see how to build a resume. So for building a resume you can either have it in a chronological order or in a functional order. So for a chronological order you need to mention your experience in the same manner that it took place. Whereas for a functional order you need to mention your most relevant experience based on the job role. Not just that you need to keep a few points in your mind. For example, your resume must be concise and clear in terms of formatting. You also need to keep your resume updated. Now for experience less than eight years, it should be a page and functional resume for an experienced of two plus years. Also, you need to prioritize these skills according to your job role. Don't forget to mention your activities that you were a part of and finally, do write about the achievements and hobbies, but keep it simple. Now let's have a look at a sample resume. So here you can see a sample resume that will give you an idea about how you can build your resume for your web developers job role. Now there are certain things that you should keep in check when drafting a resume. So the introduction should be very simple and should be up to point. Your education details should have details until your latest degree. And the next thing that you need to specify is your experience. So it can be a project work, internships or prior job experience. Now if you are a fresher, you can mention the projects that you have worked on and justify your role in it. But if you are experienced, mention your latest job role and the projects that you have worked on and your achievements in the previous organization. Also, don't forget to mention your technical skills to specify different technologies that you are good at because that's definitely one of the most important factors. Last but not the least, mention your achievements and hobbies. Try not to stretch it much because it might distract the interviewer. So keep it simple. Now, let's jump into the beginner level web developer interview questions. And the first question is, what are the key skills needed for a great web developer? To be a skilled web developer, you need to have the following skills. Proficiency in HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And then the knowledge of responsive designs and framework example bootstrap. Also, understanding of version control systems like Git and the ability to work with front-end libraries of framework example React or Angular. Along with the back-end development skills, Example Node.js and Express.js. Data management skills such as SQL or NoSQL. Now, moving on to the next question What advantages does HTTP 2.0 offer in comparison to HTTP 1.1? Firstly, we have multiplexing, handles multiple requests on a single connection, improving efficiency. Next, header compression, reduces overhead and enhances speed. Third, we have server push, allows server to send multiple responses without waiting for requests, improving page load times. Fourth, we have binary protocol, enhances parsing, efficiency and reduces errors. Fifth, we have stream prioritization, enables request prioritization, improving user experience. Moving on to the third question. In JavaScript, how would you go about selecting every element 
that has a specific class. In JavaScript, to select all elements with a specific class, you can use document.querySelectAll along with the class selector. For example, to select all elements with a class, example class, constant element equal to document.querySelectAll in the bracket dot example class. This returns a node list containing all elements with a specified class, allowing you to manipulate or perform actions on these elements. Moving on to the fourth question, what makes ID and class in HTML CSS differ from one another? The key differences between ID and class in HTML CSS are, an ID is a unique identifier assigned to a specific HTML element ensuring its singular presence within a document. In contrast, a class serves as a categorization tool allowing multiple HTML elements to share the same class designation. Each ID can be used only once per HTML document, preventing duplication and ensuring a distinct identifier for each element. Classes, on the other hand, are designed to be reusable and can be applied to multiple elements throughout a single HTML document. IDs are commonly used for targeted styling or manipulating of individual elements using CSS or JavaScript. Classes, being more versatile, enable the application of shared styles or behaviors to multiple elements within the same class designation. The HTML syntax for applying an ID is through the ID equal to unique ID attribute. To apply a class, the HTML attribute used in class equal to class name. In CSS, an ID is accessed using hashtag unique ID. Conversely, in CSS, a class is accessed using dot class name selector. Moving on to the fifth question, why is a namespace used in web development? Namespaces are used to avoid naming conflicts between various parts of code or libraries. They ensure that variables, functions, or elements with similar names don't conflict or interfere with one another. Moving on to the sixth question, describe Webpack. The most widely used module bundler in modern web development is known as Webpack. It gathers various resources including images, CSS files and JavaScript files and builds a dependency graph out of them so that they can be used together in the web application. Moving on to the seventh question, describe the CSS box model. The CSS box model is a fundamental concept that defines the structure and layout of elements on a web page. It comprises of four components such as, first we have content, the element's actual content including any text, photos or other media is referred to as content. The padding, border and margin encloses it. Second we have padding, the distance from element's border to its content. In CSS, padding is used to specify internal space that an element can have. Third, we have border. It surrounds the content area and padding. Border styles, colors, and widths are all customizable with CSS border properties. Fourth, we have margin, the area outside the border that separates this element from its surrounding. Now, let's move to the eighth question. Explain about significance of CORS, cross-origin resource sharing. A security feature called cross-origin resource sharing is applied by web browsers to control access to resources on a web page from various origins, also called as domains. The importance, of course, is found in its ability to allow or deny cross-origin requests, which are requests for resources such as scripts, data, or fonts from a domain other than one currently hosting the web page. Moving on to the ninth question, explain HTML5 web storage. HTML5 web storage allows browsers to store data locally within a user's browser in a key-value pair. It has two types, session storage and local storage. This feature is useful for catching, storing user preferences and enabling offline capabilities. However, it has size limit and isn't suitable for sensitive data due to its client-side nature. Moving on to the 10th question, what is selector used in CSS? A selector in CSS is a pattern or expression that targets specific HTML elements to apply styling rules. It defines which element in an HTML document the CSS rules should be applied to. To put it shortly, selectors plays a crucial role in applying styles to elements, allowing developers to precisely target and style HTML elements according to the various criteria or conditions. Now, moving on to the 11th question, 
explain the difference between inline and block elements in CSS. Block elements start to a new line and stretch to use all the available horizontal space. And they stack on the top of each other vertically and can contain both block and inline elements, creating separate blocks on a web page. Example, include paragraphs, headings, and divisions. Inline elements, however, don't start on a new line. They only take up as much width as necessary and flow within the content, allowing other elements to sit beside them on the same line. They cannot contain block level elements and are often used for small parts of content within a line, like emphasizing text, hyperlink, or spans. Moving on to the 12th question, explain the difference between the HTML5 span and div tags. Span is an inline element mainly used for styling small content within a line while div is a block level element used for creating larger divisions in a document. Organizing content into separate blocks for containers, span does not create new lines and it's suitable for inline style elements, whereas div creates new lines by default and is employed for structuring larger sections of content. Now, moving on to the 13th question, what is HTML canvas purpose? The HTML canvas element is used to create graphics animations and interactive visualizations directly within a web page using JavaScript. Its main purpose is to provide a drawing surface on which developers can dynamically generate and manipulate graphics, shapes, images, animations, and more. Moving on to the 14th question, explain DOM, document object model. A programming interface of web document is called document object model or DOM. It represents HTML and XML documents share as a tree-like model with each node representing an element, attribute, or text segments of the document. Now, as we move to advanced web developer interview questions, get ready for deeper technical exploration covering both front-end and back-end expertise. Now, the first question is, state difference between SVG, scalable vector graphics, and canvas. SVG uses XML-based tags to define shapes and is scalable without quality loss. Elements are the part of the DOM allowing easy manipulation, styling, and animation using CSS or JavaScript. Retains objects as individual elements enabling dynamic modification and interaction. Canvas provides a drawing context through JavaScript for immediate mode bitmap graphics. Render graphics directly onto the canvas without retaining objects making post-rendering manipulation difficult. Not inherently scalable without loss of quality due to its pixel-based nature. Moving on to the second question, define the World Wide Consortium, W3C. The World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, is an international community that creates guidelines and standards to guarantee the World Wide Web's continual growth and accessibility. The web's creator, Tim Berners-Lee, started it in 1994 by creating standards and guidelines that make the web more inclusive, accessible, and interoperable for all users. W3C plays a crucial role in influencing the direction of the web. Moving on to the third question, why are pseudo-classes used in CSS? In CSS, pseudo-classes are used to specify the unique states of elements that are not selectable and standard selectors. Without the need for extra classes or JavaScript, they enable styling elements based on user's interaction, position within the document, or specific conditions. The syntax is select a pseudo class in the bracket CSS properties. Now, moving on to the fourth question describe the variations between NoSQL and SQL databases. SQL databases are relational and uses a structured schema that defines the tables, their columns, and relationship between tables, whereas NoSQL databases are non-relational, allowing flexible schemas and handling unstructured or semi-structured data. SQL databases follows the ACID properties, which stands for Atomicity, Consistency, Isolation, Durability, ensuring strong consistency and reliability. Coming to NoSQL, it emphasizes flexibility and can follow base, basically available software eventually consistent properties, prioritizing availability and partition tolerance over strong consistency. SQL Databases uses SQL, Structured Query Language, for defining and manipulating data. 
SQL is standardized and widely used for querying. Coming to NoSQL databases, it does not exclusively rely on SQL and might have its own query language or APIs. Some NoSQL databases support SQL-like querying, but it's not universal. In SQL databases, scaling vertically can be limited due to hardware constraints. Here, scaling vertically means adding more power to a single server. Whereas, in the case of NoSQL databases, it is generally more scalable horizontally due to their distributed nature allowing them to handle large volume of data and traffic. Here, scalable horizontally means adding more servers. Moving on to the fifth question, what is peer programming? Two programmers collaborate at a single workstation using the agile software development technique known as peer programming. The driver who writes the code and the observer or navigator is the person who reviews each line of the code as it is typed offering quick feedback, making suggestions for enhancement, and talking about design choices. Moving on to the sixth question, how do CSS selectors work? List a few. CSS selectors are patterns used to select and style HTML elements based on the attributes, types, positions, and more. Here are a few common CSS selectors. Element selector targets elements based on their type. Class selector selects elements with a specific class attribute. ID selector targets a specific element with unique ID attribute. Attribute selector targets elements based on their attribute values. Pseudo classes select elements based on their state or position. Moving on to the seventh question. Describe what a JavaScript scope is and list its various forms. Scope in JavaScript describes how variables and functions are visible and accessible inside the code. It establishes the locations at which these variables and functions can be used as well as how they interact with other code segments. There are mainly three types of scope in JavaScript. Global scope, function scope, and block scope. Coming to global scope, global variables are those that are declared outside of any block or function. They can be accessed from any place in the code, even from functions. If you check this piece of code, you can check this piece of code. The global variable has been declared outside the function, but it is accessible within the function as well as it is accessible from outside the function. Moving on to the function scope, a function's declared variables are covered by its scope. They are not visible outside of that function and can be only accessed within it. If you check this piece of code, the local variable has been declared inside my function and it is accessible only from inside the function. If you try to access it from outside the function, it will show you an error. Coming to the block scope, variables declared with keyword const and let have block scope. This indicates that they are restricted to the block, such as if statement or loops, in which they are defined typically inside curly braces. You can check this particular piece of code where you can see that the block variable is declared inside the if block. You can access the block variable from inside the block but if you try to access this block variable from outside the block, you can see an error over here. Moving on to our eighth question, state the difference between local storage and cookies. Cookies have a limited storage capacity, about 4 KB per cookie, and are sent with every HTTP request, making them accessible from both the server and the client side. They can have an expiration date and are commonly used for session management and user authentication and are vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. Local storage, on the other hand, has a larger capacity, approximately 5 MB per domain, and is only accessible through the client. It remains active until explicitly cleared, making it appropriate for larger data set, application state, and user preferences. While local storage is more secure than cookies, it is still vulnerable to XSS attacks, and if not handled properly, it cannot be accessed by the server unless explicitly sent. Moving on to our ninth question, how to handle type conversion in JavaScript? JavaScript's handling of type conversion is essential for data manipulation and ensuring that various data types operate properly. JavaScript offers a number of methods for handling type conversion. The first one is implicit type conversion. It happens automatically when different types are used together in the operation. In this example, the x is declared as a number and y equal to 60 has been declared as a string. 
if we put a sum equal to x plus y, the JavaScript converts the x to a string and performs string concatenation. The console.log sum will give you an output of 5060 as a string. Coming to explicit type conversion, we have string conversion. In string conversions, we use string function or two string function to convert to strings. In example, here let n equal to 1 to 3 is been declared as a number. String n function converts the integer n into a string n. If we use console.log type of string, then as an output, we get a string. In the second one, let boolean value equal to true. Now, boolean value to string will convert this true value into a string value. Next, we have number conversion. Using number function, parse int function or parse float function for numbers. In this example, string n equal to 456. Here, 456 is declared as a string. Let n val equal to number of string n converts the string n into a number. If we use console.log type of n value, then the output will be a number. Similarly, pass int converts 10.5, a string value, into an integer value. And pass float converts string 10.5 into a float value 10.5. Moving on to Boolean conversion, we use Boolean function to convert to Booleans. Let value equal to 0. Now, Boolean value will convert the type of value into a boolean value. The console.log bool value will give you an output as false. Now, if we had a value equal to 1, then console.log bool value would have returned you a true value. Coming to unary operators, unary plus, unary minus and logical not can perform implicit type conversion in specific context. You can see the code. Let string number equal to 1, 2, 3. Here, 1, 2, 3 is a string. Let converted num equal to plus str number. Here, the unary plus for converting to number. Console.log type of converted num would have given you an output number. Moving on to our 10th question, how can different style sheets be integrated into a website the best way? The best way to integrate different style sheets into a website is by using external style sheets .css files linked in the HTML head section. This ensures organized, modular, and maintainable code along with responsiveness achieved through media queries and support for legacy browsers using conditional comments when necessary. Moving on to our 11th question, what are CSS transitions? What are their properties? With CSS transitions, elements can smoothly switch between styles in a specific duration of time by offering smooth animation or changes to attributes like color, size, Position or opacity, they improve the user experience. Properties of CSS transition. Transition property specifies the CSS property to which the transition will be applied. Example color with opacity. Transition duration defines the duration of the transition effect in seconds or milliseconds. Transition timing function determines the pace of the transition, controlling the acceleration or deacceleration. Transition delay is an optional property that sets a delay before the transition starts. Moving on to the 12th question, why are closures used in JavaScript? JavaScript closures are useful because even after the outer function has completed running, they let their functions inside keep access to variables from their containing scope. They close over the variables, establishing a scope chain that allows inner function to access the parameter and variables of outer function. You can see the closures are used in this example to nest one function, inner function, inside another function, outer function. Even after the outer function has finished executing, the inner function continues to have access to its variable. This allows for a creation of a closure that remembers the value of x. When the closure is later called with the argument y, it has access to both x and y, allowing the output of the combination x plus y to be logged. Closures are useful for encapsulating and preserving variable state. Now, moving on to the 13th question, explain long pooling. In web development, long pooling is a method used to establish real-time communication between a server and a client, usually a web browser. With this technique, real-time updates can be created without the constant pooling that characterizes conventional methods as the server can send updates to the client as soon as the new data becomes available. 
Moving on to our 14th question. What are the new form elements introduced in HTML5? In order to improve user input handling and user interaction, HTML5 introduced a number of new form elements. Some of these new form elements are input types. Input type email for email addresses. Input type URL for web addresses. Input type number for numeric input. Input type date for date input. Input type time for time input. Input type search for search queries. Data list provides a predefined list of options for input elements. Output displays the result of calculations or user actions. Progress and meter. Progress represents task completion progress. Meter displays measurements within the range. Text area attributes. We have max length that limits the number of characters in a text area and wrap that refines a wrapping behavior in a text area. Moving on to the 15th question. Why is grouping used in CSS3? Grouping in CSS3 is used to streamline and simplify the styling process by applying the same set of styles to multiple selectors at once. It allows you to define styles or different elements that share common styling attributes without repeating the same declaration for each individual selector. Over here, you can see this example in the following code. With this, we have come to the end of this session. I hope you have enjoyed the video and if you did, make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and keep learning. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!